he has uh, extensively worked he has extensively work on mapping uh, bio resource of the western ghats conservation of uh, medicinally important plant uh, resources livelihood improvement through conservation and genetic improvement and domestication of forest tree species he has uh, uh, over 90 research publication in his credit and he has organized three national level of uh, symposium and uh, in european union and us uh, us he is having a us patent on uh, novel on novel uh, biomolecule for uh, cancer treatment he is a member of a special task force on western ghats by government of uh, karnataka he is expert appraisal come in the expert appraisal committee river valley project uh, globally he has a study global study on uh, team on uh, community biodiversity management that undertook studies in the brazil and nepal and uh, he was awarded with the best teacher award us dharwad insa teacher award 2018 and uh, that was constituted by the indian national science academy uh, with the brief uh, introduction i would like to request to vasudeva sir to deliver a talk on geospatial technologies for genetic resource conservation in horticulture crops sir please thank you thank you so much uh, for that quite a uh, you know a nice introduction i first of all would like to express my great uh, great uh, gratitude to dr rajesh shekaran and the whole of the team at ihr for this uh, wonderful opportunity to interact with uh, the professionals uh, engaged in horticulture uh, let me share are you able to see my screen Put it in the presentation mode. Yeah. Okay. 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 Not come in the presentation mode, uh, professor. Uh, is it uh, not coming there? Yeah. Not coming. Not coming. Okay. Hold on. So do minute. one thing. Uh, stop sharing again. Uh, share the share the screen rather than the share sharing the PPT. Okay. Yes. Yes, now it has come. You can go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, I will be speaking to you on the geospatial techniques. Specifically, I will be speaking on mapping, quantification, valuation, and conservation of horticultural resources. Uh, I work in the Department of Forest Biology, College of Forestry, Sirsi. I am here from the past twenty-seven years as a professor of forest biology. My interest has been in the mapping of uh, genetic resources of the Western Ghats, and then uh, you know coming out with how a policymaker can take a decision based on uh, the techniques that we have or the information that we have generated. Uh, for those of you who have just uh, not know where where is Sirsi. Uh, this is Sirsi College of Forestry. Sirsi is very near to Goa, as you can see here. That's uh, India, Karnataka, and Uttar Kannada district is here. is also called as Karwar district, and our college is uh, one of the premier institute of forestry institu uh, education and research in India. Incidentally, we have been awarded the ICFRA Excellence for in Forestry Award in 2019. This is one of the coveted award um, obtained by the college. for the contribution towards the uh, understanding of the resources of the western ghats uh, talking to, to about the western ghats as you know western ghat is one of the four of the um, uh, 34 hotspots of biological diversity in the world we have uh, one of the in india we have four hotspots 
One of them is actually the Western Ghats. It's also the uh, natural heritage site recognized by UNESCO. And it's indeed one of the hottest hotspots of biological diversity in the sense that it has both the diversity, endemicity, as well as the threat that associated with this uh, diversity. Uh, and this particular region has been uh, uh, very well known for its outstanding universal value. Uh, indeed, it is older than the Himalayan mountain. And then we have more than 5,000 species of flowering plants, 139 species of mammals, and so on and so forth. It's quite rich in terms of its uh, composition. And 33% of all the amphibians found in the Western Ghats are only found here, nowhere in the world. So that makes it extremely unique um, ecoregion of this. And most importantly, as an articulturist, one should appreciate that uh, Western Ghat is regarded as the world's best pharmacy. And in fact, it's hotspot for sacred groups. It has a fantastic tradition, uh, which is responsible for the preservation of pockets of biological diversity in the form of the Devar Kadus and sacred groups. A tiny district of Kodagu has more than 1,200 sacred groups to that extent it's also called as the world's hotspot of sacred groups. And uh, if you skim through the uh, rich diversity of uh, fruit crops that are interesting to a horticulturist, there are more than 230 tropical edible fruit species that are widely available in the entire Western Ghats makes it one of perhaps the, when it comes to the horticulturally important diversity, in fact, Western Ghats perhaps tops all the hotspots of biological diversity in the world. So to that extent, this is one of the greatest resources. So, <clears throat> today, we know that the biological diversity is called the resource capital of a country. Like, you know, just like we had the petroleum diversity or uh, resource <clears throat> or the diamond resources, and today, this uh, biological diversity is also called as the resource capital. If you want to convert this uh, biological diversity into a biological resource, one should know how to use it as well as to conserve it. So only when we have uh, specific protocols, specific uh, methods and specific mechanism to conserve and utilize this biological diversity in place, uh, we, can, uh, we can convert this uh, vast range of biological diversity into biological resource. But having said that, if you want to convert a biological diversity into a resource, we need to ask some extremely important questions, like the prerequisite for any utilization and any conservation of these resources. Uh, we should first of all know uh, where are these resources. Like, you know, firstly, we should know what are the resources and then the where are the resources and how are they spatially distributed. For instance, if Dr. Rajshikaran wants to know about the uh, uh, most endangered species of uh, insignia, uh, you would like to know maybe it, it's found only in four pockets. Are there any other pockets where it is found? Such a kind of data is absolutely essential. And how to quantify these resources? If a policymaker wants to harvest, let's say, uh, 1,000 tons of Sarakashoka bark, where can we harvest from which population without actually dwindling the resource as such? Can we quantify such quantification? Can, we, can it be done? And which are the resources that are actually dwindling, which are at their very high risk? Uh, are we harvest, over harvesting some of these? For instance, Garcinias may be really over, over harvested in some parts of Maharashtra and Karnataka. So, and finally, how exactly we can utilize and how exactly we can conserve and what should be and where exactly we should invest our uh, conservation aspects of it. So, uh, in fact, these are the very prerequisite questions that we need to ask before we actually go. But answering these questions, um, it, it will actually turn out to some kind of a challenge. For an effective utilization, uh, uh, we now, uh, these particular questions can be now converted into challenges like it is uh, 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 said that you have a linear challenge to identify which are the resources you have the Valencian challenge of identifying where exactly it is distributed. And then uh, Hutchinsonian uh, challenge, like how are they influenced by the human societies? So uh, in order to overcome these challenges, we should build a very good understanding of uh, the system, like which are all the different kinds of resources that we have. And we should have a very clear understanding of the spatial distribution pattern of these resources 
and then we should have a very clear protocol for sustainable utilization. Answering these questions and the challenges at the level of an ecoregion like or a hotspot like the Western Ghats is a very, very daunting task, basically because um, the Western Ghats is a very vast area. It's a um, uh, incredibly vast, more than 1.22 square kilometers uh, running from almost Surat to Kanyakumari with a gap of Palghat. It covers 50 districts, 208 talukas, six states, and one union territory. And even if you consider one smallest part of the resource, like the medicinal plant resource, we may have the codified systems of the medicine may use more than 2,000 of them, or roughly around 45% of them are rare and endangered and threatened. As an articulturist, you should be now worried about it. Like, suppose we do not even know what are the resources that are being actually wasted, not being utilized without being known. They have, they, have been, they have been in the brink of uh, extinction. So that's the kind of uh, situation that we have. Realizing this importance, uh, Department of Biotechnology, way back almost in uh, 2015, was we, we got an award of a uh, project under the able uh, leadership of Dr. K. N. Ganesha of uh, GKVK US Bangalore of uh, mapping and quantitative assessment of the plant resource of the Western Guards. So idea is to now look at uh, where are these resources and how to quantify them? Can we assess even the threats of it? And we can we develop at the end of the day a kind of an ecoregion specific database so that people sent us uh, like uh, Dr. Rajeshikan can actually utilize it or anybody from IHR, the whole of the uh, horticulture fraternity can actually start using it. So this was our uh, uh, introduction. Like we wanted to have a very good sampling strategy like uh, most of the earlier efforts of identifying the resources, like there may be uh, independent surveys done for exploration done by horticulturists, botanists, etc., but they did not have a uniform protocol. In the absence of a uniform protocol, you will not you may not be able to actually quantify the resources. So we wanted to have a very uniform protocol. At the same time, we should be able to uh, balance between the precision and the cost. A particular a uh, sampling strategy may be extremely good, but if it takes 100 years to complete, it is absolutely useless. So it has to be completed within short period of time. It should give us a quantitative data and it should be statistically robust to identify certain, uh, uh, you know, um, come out with some predictions. So what we did was we divided the entire Western Ghats into smaller grids called a small grid, like, you know, this is a checkerboard that you're seeing. One small checkerboard like this is of the of the area of 6.25 kilometers into 6.25 kilometers and which in within each grid uh, so these are the uh, grid generation that we did using that and we also used a range of uh, techniques like you know we do the fcc classification we used an ndv uh, uh, ndri uh, uh, ndvi classification etc to identify the uh, in heterogeneity and then we generated more than 3,300 grids. And in each of these grid, uh, one team would go, like, you know, uh, for instance, Central Western Guards was uh, addressed by College of Forestry, Sirsi. Northern Central uh, was addressed by Kolapur University, so on and so forth. So uh, we had a multi-institutional project um, catering to different uh, regions of the Western Guards, like uh, PG, uh, KFRI, and a tree concentrated on Southern Western Guards, whereas the Central Western Guards was uh, identified and then studied by the College of Forestry, CC. So is the Northern Western Guards by Shivaji University, so on and so forth. So we uh, went and what we did was in each of this grid, we walked one kilometer by, uh, you know, uh, taking a, a random point and then all the trees and uh, shrubs were enumerated, some data was taken, identified to the species level, and the uh, geospatial data was actually uh, looked into. So we actually had diverse ecosystems of the uh, Western Ghats were sampled. Uh, we have like Shola forest, grassland, man mangroves, sacred grove, tea coffee plantations, so on and so forth. It was actually a grueling uh, field work. In fact, Reaching the sampling point was much tougher than actually running the prior, you know, most of the times running the transit. So in any case, we completed the entire thing in about six years time. And then 
the whole data today exists in the form of a database. It's uh, called the Indian Biodiversity uh, Information Network called IBIN. And uh, this is perhaps the biggest and the most robust data, which has been developed based on some uniform sampling uh, done to quantify the valuable uh, resources of the any hotspot of biological diversity in the world. So I'm 100% sure that none of the uh, hotspots have such a beautiful resolution data than ours. So this gave us an idea that we can quantify that. We can identify threats. We can identify where is the regeneration more, where is the regeneration less, etc. So for the first time, the primary data on valuable resources has come. Uh, and then uh, this has been put to use uh, for public as well as for, especially for the um, um, scientists like you, uh, you can utilize this. Just to give you some of the very interesting data that we have got, uh, if you consider top 20 species of the Western Ghats in terms of their number of uh, stems that are found, the top rank goes to Tectona grandis. To our uh, very surprise, we got some species like uh, uh, jamun, mango, cashew, Arecanut, coconut, coffee tea, and also many other horticulturally important species that have already occupied the Western Ghats uh, face of the earth. That means the Western Ghats is now more of a uh, garden than actually a natural, or it is as good as a garden than the as good as it is a natural forest. So that, that to that extent, every horticulturist now see that Western Ghat resources should be the uh, it's like a raw material from which you can draw a whole of uh, material for your breeding and selection and so on and so forth. So this is uh, uh, one data that we have got. Some of the uh, illustration that we would like to make is, for instance, suppose uh, some of you are interested in looking at the Garcinia, where to collect. For instance, most of you go for an exploration and most of the explorations are today done based on our own expertise and down our, our own interest. It's not actually based on uh, like data, something like this. For instance, if you want to look at uh, uh, like, you know, uh, one species, Sir, you are not audible, sir. Uh, Dr. Vasudeva, I checked your uh, audio. We are not able to. Sir, kindly mute yourself. Uh, now I, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So from when it was not audible? Just a minute before. And then, no, 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 okay. no damage has done. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So here, what happens is that uh, I would like to dis I would like to uh, now demonstrate to you the power of this particular database. Like you know, if you are interested in any Garcinia species, like the Garcinia, uh, which is uh, let us say Garcinia rubro echinata, which is found only in the small districts of uh, Tamil Nadu down south here, and then Garcinia indica is mostly is distributed here. And if you look at Talbotis found in Kolapur and other area. Like, you know, most of you do actually some kind of an exploration, but it is based on your own experience and uh, uh, experience based on the kind of, uh, uh, you know, connectivity that you have. But most of the explorations in order to harness the wild resources of the Western Guards has to be based on a very sound database like this. Like uh, every dot here represent one particular area where you will get definitely get uh, a beautiful, population of either Garcinia indica, Talboti, etc. So for perhaps this has eased out or this has been a boon for most of the scientists and the researchers to work on, to carry on. So you may be working on a medicinal plant, you may be working on a horticultural important fruit species, so on and so forth. I will now, uh, from now onwards, demonstrate to you the strength of such a, a beautiful strength of the geospatial data on how one can actually utilize it. So very quickly, I'll go. So this is a uh, uh, distribution of Garcinia species, as I said. And this is the uh, species of uh, Garcinia uh, gummigata. You can also look at the regeneration data where you have age structure, et cetera. This is Garcinia indica again. And uh, using the such a geospatial uh, spatial data, we could also identify nutraceutically better uh, genotypes. 
like you know you have uh, uh, excellent uh, uh, data on this we know that the garcinia indica fruit rind has a beautiful uh, content called the hydroxy citric acid which makes you thinner and if you start eating the seed it you will have uh, it's an edible butter you will gain it so within one uh, fruit you have a, um, a two ingredients one makes you thinner one makes you fattier so both the nutra gain and nutra loss is there in this so we actually identified more than six ecotypes um, of this particular kokum and uh, though it is very popular the it is nutraceutically not very well understood so we have identified some of the morphs like red morphs green morphs orange and yellow some of these have 15 times higher vitamin c than the oranges so look at the irony like so we promote oranges to be grown now uh, for vitamin c you know uh, nutrition security suppose you put five or six uh, trees of uh, garcinia indica which are very edible for the children in every primary school of the western ghats perhaps they eat it and then they can actually overcome the vitamin c deficiency so we also look at uh, other uh, in in case of uh, notopoditis pneumonia which is called the mapia fortida which is again a million dollar baby here which which commands almost 1 billion dollar uh, pharmaceutical industry in terms of the anti cancer uh, element and with this particular data we now uh, uh, you know went to different um, uh, you know different kinds of uh, regions here and then identified different ecotypes and then uh, and identified that some of the species may have extremely high cpt content which is uh, extremely important in terms of bio prospecting so that means one uh, one solid step of having a spatially explicit data can actually help uh, many students uh, another most interesting uh, uh, evidence of using this particular data is with respect to the identification of new populations of uh, rt species when it comes to uh, coccinium fenestratum which is called as daru haridra of the southern region Uh, which is uh, extremely rich in berberine my my phd student is actually wanted to work on it when we started we were stuck with um, one of the uh, identifying natural populations of uh, 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 coccinium fenestratum in the central western ghats we could not get more than two or three but what we did was uh, we used this ibin data and we also developed a niche modeling kind of a thing and then we used this uh, predictive tool called niche modeling ecological niche modeling and then came out with uh, this particular distribution data right from hosnagar to super dam and then we did develop uh, identify seven more populations which were not known to us earlier using this data so let me elaborate in one minute about what exactly is this uh, ecological niche modeling see uh, we know that ecological niche is a place like you know every crop every plant every animal occupies a certain space in the either western ghats or in anywhere in india based on the resources that it has and the interactions it has okay this is called as a niche so basically it has a niche the ecological niche modeling what happens what it does is it identifies based on the environmental parameters what exactly or where exactly it can Uh, identify it can uh, potentially found that means it is a predictive tool uh, where you can actually guess make a very educated guesses of where exactly it can appear for instance let us say from the geospatial geospatial data that we have let us say one particular uh, wild plant occurs in these locations and then when you seek the uh, predictions from the ecological niche, niche modeling it uses about 23 24 environmental parameters of all these individual points and generates uh, another data that it can be it may be found in this particular area so uh, based on the data that you provide the ecological niche modeling provides you additional uh, you know data or additional uh, locations where you can actually use this in fact using this one can Uh, use an excellent one this is a very simple software one need not be computer savvy to use this or you can take the help of a, uh, a very good com computer man to do this maxent is the one which can be used very easily that can be used 
and uh, say spatial distribution data to start with, you can use it either from IBIN data or your own data. And then we can now start uh, using this particular thing. So uh, applications is that one can uh, characterize the distributional area of a wild species, rare species, medicinally important species, so on and so forth. One can also look at the anticipated risk areas of changing climates. Like, you know, it can also find like, you know, uh, suppose somebody is growing uh, turmeric in, let's say, southern India, uh, because of the changed environment, can turmeric be grown in Maharashtra and let us say Gujarat, can it be done? That can be potentially identified. We can also anticipate potential pest and disease outbreak, identify potential area for cultivation and hot spots for that. So in fact, we did predict uh, uh, using the ecological niche modeling, uh, what would be the best suitable sites for cultivation of two important medicinal lianas. One is uh, Cosinium penistratum and another is uh, Embellia ribes. And we came out with the prediction of that, like, you know, and this is for the Cosinium and Embellia ribes can also be grown in certain areas of Bhutan and few other kind of thing. Okay. And invasive species can be now very easily identified potential risk of an invasive species like African chain snail, which is horticulturally most important species pest. And then one can use this. Uh, my friend in uh, Atri, Dr. Arvind Madhyasta is an excellent, uh, he is the expert in this uh, kind of ecological niche modeling and you can invite him for talk sometime actually. So we can also look at uh, uh, generated uh, value computation using this geospatial data. This is the last uh, few slides for me. And then what we did was we took uh, one area called Chandoli uh, Life Wildlife Sanctuary in Maharashtra, and then using our data on how many uh, Mapia Fortida plants are available, my friend in uh, Pune calculated that the potential of one wildlife sanctuaries can run up to something like around 28 million US dollars. This could be the basis for which we can also conserve horticulturally important uh, resources for that. So this is the uh, team uh, with the Western Guards we did. Uh, uh, Professor Ken Ganesha is there and all the uh, members of the team, uh, Professor Kushalappa, myself, Dr. Ankur Patavardhan, and Dr. Menon, Dr. Ganeshan, and this is our uh, entire team. So thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity to share some of my thoughts. Thank you, sir, for your uh, comprehensive uh, information on geospatial technologies for uh, genetic resource conservation in horticulture crops. You have, sir, rightly highlighted uh, the Western Guard biological diversity as the world best pharmacy and sacred groups of uh, 230 tropical edible fruit crops. And uh, prerequisite for the effective conservation and utilization of these resources, the challenges uh, for the sustainable conservation resources and uh, the better uh, suitable sampling strategy and the uh, distribution of Garcinia species in different areas, along with the nutri uh, nutraceutical better genotypes with the geospatial data. And uh, you have clearly mentioned the identification of new species in a ecological niche modeling. And the software you have uh, described how it can be enter the information into that and some important uh, invasive species. Thank you so much, sir, for your uh, sparing valuable time for this uh, five days training program. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So there is sir, one question there... from, uh, yeah, Dr. Ajit. Uh, yeah, we Ajit. are working on endemic species from Andaman Islands. Uh, uh, one such species, say only six individuals could be spotted in wildlife. Uh, for so far, uh, all those individuals are located in single island. Is it possible to use? Definitely, uh, definitely. Actually, you can use Dr. Ajit. So you can now contact uh, uh, Dr. Arvind Madhyasta or Bipin uh, from Atri. Uh, they should be able to help you out. Basically, because they already have certain data on the Andaman uh, resources. Uh, you can also contact Professor K N Ganeshaya of uh, US Bangalore. Sir, one more question from Dr. R. Chitra. Uh, she asked, apart from apart for ENM, whether any other modeling is used for mapping. Yeah, ecological niche modeling is actually a generic term used. Uh, 
for uh, modeling of uh, many things. So one of them is Maxtent, another is uh, Ziva GIS. So these are all the softwares that actually have predictive value. So based on the our own experience, we can now recommend that Maxent is the best among the available. Basically, it considers even a smaller resolution. One caveat to this uh, ecological niche modeling technique is that uh, as of today, we don't have the data of the uh, the the soil data that can be adapted. Like you know, uh, it only uses the environmental parameters. Uh, let us say you have a big boulder of uh, rock in in the middle of a uh, evergreen forest. Uh, let us say uh, it also predicts that the orchid is found on that particular boulder. It does not consider that it is a rock. Okay, uh, of course I am not aware of whether that uh, improvement has been done. So essentially, you can use uh, Maxent. Uh, it's an extremely simple. You have YouTube's that are available. You can study them. Yeah. Sir, one more uh, question from Dr. J. 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 Ram. Uh, uh, okay. okay. Sir, any hot spot area for biodiversity heritage in Ginkgo biloba? Oh, I have Texas. not worked on the Texas Bacata. So uh, or Ginkgo biloba. Uh, I think. Suppose you, uh, another way of uh, doing a very easy research is that, suppose you have access to some of the uh, earlier data, either from the uh, Botanical Survey of India data or from uh, flora data that are already published by the botanists. Suppose you locate an exact location of this uh, Ginkgo biloba and Taxus Baketa, uh, of at least about 20 to 50 different locations if you have, uh, it can actually now, uh, use this particular one and then start uh, uh, analyzing it. So even if you don't have anything at all, uh, just by the secondary data, you can have some predictive uh, estimations done of this. Uh, as of now, I do not have any idea about this uh, taxes and ginkgo. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for yeah, uh, answering the queries. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So those of you who would like to have questions can actually email me. I can answer it, answer them uh, privately. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor. We will be in touch yeah. with you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have another speaker, Dr. Uh, Sunil Archak. Uh, sir is a principal scientist and ICR uh, National Fellow at ICR NBPGR. And Sir is having uh, 24 years of uh, experience. He has established a molecular genetic laboratory in horticulture crops, National Genomic Resource Repository, PGR Informatic Facility at uh, ICR and BPGR. He has organized two national and uh, two international symposia conferences. He is a member of uh, many task force uh, advisory committee of DBT and PPVFRA. Sir is uh, editor in chief of Indigen Law Plant Genetic Resources. And he represents India in uh, negotiation of international treaty on plant genetic resources. Uh, dual faculty, he is having a dual faculty at uh, IERI New Delhi in the faculties of plant genetic resources and bioinformatic teaching and guiding. He has uh, published uh, research papers in areas of genetics and genomics of PGR, bioinformatic and PGR informatic, PGR and IPR uh, policies with uh, more than uh, 1000 citations. Sir, uh, with the brief uh, introduction, I would like to invite you to deliver a lecture on bioinformatic and database in horticulture genetic resource management. Uh, Archek, sir. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, let me share my slides. If you stop sharing your slides. <clears throat> yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'll be speaking on uh, PGR informatics, not exactly bioinformatics, because once uh, uh, it goes to bioinformatics, then there is no difference between plants, animals, microbes, or any other things. The most sorry, important aspect. Sir, in, uh, sir yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Sir, put it on uh, this presentation mode, sir. It is on the presentation mode. Oh, but, uh, sir, it seems like uh, visible like that. So I think. Uh, Let's see. Not, it may yeah. take some time. Stop sharing and uh, stay, uh, I'll do that. Yeah. yeah, I'll do that. Now it is not in the presentation mode. 
no sir right? still in slide mode sir yeah no, that's right now i am putting in this yeah true true right it's okay now uh, not yet sir let's see share the screen yeah i have done that but still it has not come here like right? Not it. Not it. <laughs> okay, let me start it. Perhaps take uh, time to um, come into yeah, the full yeah. screen. Uh, let's not waste time. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to speak on uh, plant genetic resources informatics, which is uh, extremely relevant to the ongoing training program in horticultural genetic resources. I was hearing at uh, the end part of uh, Professor Vasudev when he was speaking, uh, which are all relevant. And uh, you would realize that uh, how such a number of studies all over India taking place at specific areas would uh, ultimately join and then give us a total picture. And the similar thing if we can do in a large scale in an entire gene bank together, and how does it matter, how it helps in making decisions. So I'm going to present that one. Uh, first of all, before all those things, thank you for uh, organizing this training program, very relevant, very timely, and then also inviting me. I come from, for all the uh, trainees. I come from uh, this particular institute, uh, national where uh, India's National Gene Bank is housed, and it is one of the top three national gene banks in the world. And it can become the top gene bank in the world, provided all the horticultural genetic resources are documented and then added to the data. We are ready, but uh, you are not ready. <laughs> <laughs> you agree, I think. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. What it does, the uh, informatics does is this one. So I just want to show this one before I start telling anything about informatics is, look at the picture on the left side. So if- uh, The this slides is how... are not moving, sir. Okay. One second, I'll just- um... I'll open uh, again. Now my slides are visible in the presentation mode or? Not it? So not in uh, presentation mode. All but you the, can see this. Uh, yeah, all slides, slides are moving. Yeah, all are slides, moving? Uh, no. Okay. I don't know because our bandwidth is fine. I just checked it now. It's one GBPS here. Sir, if you will keep it on uh, desktop and keep it open, this then you try to share. It will take, sir. It is on the desktop. This is uh, every day we do it twice or thrice. Yeah, this yeah, kind yeah. Of thing. I do agree, sir. If it is uh, open, let's sir. See. Let's see. What I'll do is I'll increase the slides of this size of this one and uh, close this. Sir, in Windows, sir, uh, maximize button, sir. You just see on the I, right. That's right. What I'm trying. Uh, I, I know I'm doing that one, but I want to hide this um, uh, top ma menu so that it will, it will be a, it will appear in the whole. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, right top, sir, second one, sir, which is uh, to be maximized. Then it may little increase the screen. Yeah, this yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. No, no, sir. Okay, yes, it is coming now. This is fine, right? Yeah. Although it is not in the presentation mode. Yeah, 
Yeah. So now it is moving. Slides are moving. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. So I'll thank again all of you for this patience. Uh, I come from this institute, uh, National Gene Bank, which is the third largest gene bank. So while I'm showing showing this slide, I invite all the participants. If you have not visited yet, please come to the gene bank once. Yeah. <clears throat> Imagine if we have collected a lot of information. Um, about many things, lots of very, very important information that present in the form which is there on the left side here. And then it becomes very difficult to sift through the data, uh, understand and explore, identify, do anything. We can't do anything. We can't even search the individual files. The moment you convert it, you transform that one into a digitized format, then everything becomes easy. So we take this part as granted. You are you were hearing uh, Dr. Vasudeva's lecture. So all those things are, don't take them these granted because digitization is a huge step. So the moment you have digitized data, your power increases. So this is what I want to send out the message. Uh, however, what is very important to understand is the major objective of uh, informatics, any informatics is not uh, making the life easy by just clicking and getting information. No, the major objective of informatics, uh, the endeavor is to generate a system which provides fair and just opportunity for everybody to access. Whether somebody is in the city or in the village or having a great bandwidth or a minor bandwidth, it's up to us to develop systems where you make these things available to everybody for use. So what do we do in PGR informatics? Plant genetic resources informatics is to manage and analyze these huge amount of data so that diverse information can be understood discussed and based on the information take intelligent conclusions so we have a huge number of applications databases that are available which you can see on the left side i'll give a quick um, let's say principal kind of presentation in the beginning and the main objective of today's presentation for me is to let's say demonstrate a few of them to 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 uh, encourage you to use them and then uh, uh, make use of these things in your research Okay, in uh, National Gene Bank, we have to, to start with what is the size of our National Gene Bank? We have four and a half lakh, 450,000 accessions of germplasm, more than these. Okay, this includes uh, a lots of vegetables, means all those which we can keep in the form of seeds in tissue culture and in cryopreservation. But these count, this count does not include all those which are in the field gene bank. So they all have to be added so it automatically increases. So what do we do? We have to document all the activities that are taking place in the form of acquisition, whether people are going around doing exploration, doing collection, doing eco-geographical studies, having lots of data, the, uh, uh, the um, traditional knowledge information. So all those things have to be documented and they have to be documented along with the characterization that we carry out here in NBPGR. They have to be connected to the trait specific evaluation that we carry out along with the crop specific institutes where the expertise lies and join that one with the conservation and make it available to the people who can choose the germplasm. These, these uh, activities are also attached with many other specific activities that we carry out such as quarantine activity so that you know exactly the seed health uh, status when it was uh, augmented the herbarium that we have, online herbarium, the DNA fingerprinting that is carried out, the genomic resources that are conserved, the biosystematics work that is being carried out, and all those entities that are attached layer by layer with respect to climate change, and if there are any intellectual properties that are available. So basically, um, Information is made available the moment you digitize and then it is available in the form of an informatic system that you use multiple layers to make decision. That means from the soil, the year, that means which period it was collected, the same place you can collect in 1950s and then in 2000s, uh, you will have different kinds of allele frequencies that you will get. And what are the different uh, the data, scientific data that you have generated? Put them all layer by layer so that you can choose things better. <clears throat> okay, as I mentioned, the purpose of my presentation or participation in this training program is not to teach you anything very specific. I'm not going to present all the specific research things that we are carrying out, but to convince you and encourage you 
including uh, all my colleagues in IHR and the participants here to become our partners in PGR Informatics and Digger. So I'll quickly tell you about the PGR Informatics, few things about that, and I want to show you about applications, okay? <clears throat> we started in 1997. So this slide is to tell you the, the, the amount of, uh, let's say, efforts that are required to bring it to a stage where people can easily use them, click and use them, such as, uh, let's say, IRCTC for reservation, for doing many other things, for click info, looking at the scores, for, for many other apps. So to reach that stage, you have to do a lots of background work and it takes a lot of time because you have to do that, uh, evaluate that, correct that, okay? Validate the data and then do the software uh, debugging. Once you do that, then we reach a place where we have useful, people can use these. So this has started in 1997 and we have reached uh, uh, this year where a number of applications we have uh, uh, provided. They are available in the public domain. The, the most important one, the, the flagship application of NBPGR or the India's informatic system is PGR portal, which I'll show a little later. And then after that, we have many applications. All these applications are available. You can use each one of them using any browser, any system, mobile, any kind of thing. So they are, they are compatible with any of these systems. And we have, we have optimized them to use as little bandwidth, as little internet capability as possible. And the work is going on. Okay, you can see on the left, it is PGR portal. Okay, uh, just Google PGR portal and you will reach our PGR portal. And this PGR portal is used all over the world. Uh, very, uh, very, let's say, extensively. People are using everywhere in India, people are using. Uh, I'll show a little bit about that later. And on the right, you can see a number of apps that are being developed, that are available, that are all of them. These are released officially, they're available. The one which is various gene bank apps, that means conservation apps, including Field Gene Bank. We have an e-herbarium, we have a PGR map. I'll show you that one. We have a gene bank to gen bank that connects the, the information or the accessions that are conserved in all gene banks in the world with the gen bank data. That means uh, protein, nucleotide, and the other data that, that is present in the gen bank, gen bank or DDBG, all this. And PGR CLIM, uh, similar one which is which was being mentioned by Professor Vasco. Okay, now some uh, quick questions to ourselves. Let's say if we have total collections of around um, 53,000, okay, uh, 535,000, that is 5 lakhs, we have vegetables of around 58,000. And from a place where IHR is located, we have only 1,700 accessions. And uh, this is collection part. And the total conservation, so out of uh, uh, 32 lakhs, uh, 3 lakhs, 3.2 lakhs, we have vegetables only 21,785. And, and from Karnataka, we have only 594. So this does not represent the actual uh, occurrence of the genetic resources in these places, as well as the actual work being done. Not that uh, uh, only this much is there. That means a lot of work is, a lot of things have to be done together by both of us. Uh, I'll skip some of these to save some time. Okay. Now the second point where uh, some of us have to, let's say, just uh, raise this question and understand it. We have a look at this, uh, the present status of our in vitro gene bank and cryo gene bank. These are the accessions that we have, number of accessions. And we always have been thinking that cryo gene banks are only backup to the seed gene banks. So mm, mm, all of you young people who are attending this one should start thinking otherwise now. Why can't we have cryogene banks at multiple places as a primary mode of conservation in various forms, different uh, um, conservation behavior, uh, material of different conservation behavior. And then it becomes easier for conserving and then mentioning, maintaining the material as well as the uh, information. Similarly, food germplasm. Look at the food germplasm, what is happening? Okay, uh, the information that I am showing these, these graphs are possible because we have a PGR informatic system. If I ask somebody else to give me an authentic data on the fruit germplasm that has been introduced in India or that has been collected in India, you would not be getting any authentic information. 
the authentic information can be accessed from our uh, PGR portal, our resources, because these are based on all the national information that has come into one place. So this is one of the important uses of an informatic system where you can look at the timeline, you can, uh, uh, let's say, analysis, assess the things, and then for funding, for making decisions, for creating the priority, for generating priority, et cetera, et cetera. So look at this, for example, one example this is. What is the uh, nature of introduction or collection of uh, food germplasm? From the beginning, it was pretty low. And after that, in uh, the decade of 2001 to 2010, the high collection is there because of the effect of the NATP that has happened in the later. And then again, it has collapsed. So what does it say? It says that the primary driver of any of these activities is a dedicated funding, in addition to the availability of trained manpower and institutional support. And how do we know the priorities? Let's say if I want to know what are the priorities in the past different years or by the institutions or area wise, etc. Okay, decade wise, what are the priorities of the people in collections or conservation or using? Okay, so collection is based on uh, usually ideally should have been based on the in indigeneity, endemism, etc. But the collection in case of specifically fruit germplasm has been because of economic importance and the demand. Okay, so this is how we get the information. So these are all the use of having information system. But the question is, where are these now? These indigenous collections have been take, have been done, people have worked hard, they have collected, they have established, done many things. But where are they exactly? Where are all these excellent uh, collections of fruit germplasm, where are they located? If you do not have an excellent information system, whether they are documented properly, where are they located, what are their traits, people are using them or not, what are the difficulties. If you do not bring them under the one ambit of a central information system, it becomes very difficult. Okay. Uh, same thing happens with the import of fruit germplasm. Look at the indigenous collection of the germplasm, you can see mango, cashew, all these are there. The moment it, becomes, uh, it comes to, uh, to the import, you will see that grapes, olive, all these are there. So you will know quickly which are all those uh, plants that are people are giving priority for augmentation within the country or from outside the country. And who are all doing this one? Look here, more than 60% is because of the private people who are in, involved in this. That means either we work with them, we partner with them in doing few things, or we compete with them in specific areas, or you take leadership in some of these species. So these kinds of decisions can be made only if you have an authentic uh, data of a uh, full-fledged nature, a uh, comprehensive data, okay? Similarly, vegetable germplasm. I will not uh, go in detail about this one. Okay, now I'm showing this state, Karnataka, because uh, I'm presenting to an institute which is located in Bangalore. And it's an, a, a leading institute, uh, a frontline institute, uh, horticulture institute, not only in India, globally. Now, but look what we have, uh, indigenous collection of fruit germplasm for Karnataka, from Karnataka. Um, you can see that uh, either very little is documented or whatever is documented, very little is available or whatever has been done are not no more maintained properly. So there must be some gaps. So if you do not fill these gaps documentation wise, we will not be able to take up new programs. Okay. And then funding will be very difficult to get. Everybody asks this one. These have happened lo uh, in long ago. Why, are, why do you want to do this again? So unless you have these kinds of data with you, it becomes very difficult. Okay. I'm skipping this through little fast because I am more interested to demonstrate some of the applications and then attract you towards these using them. Okay. Um, there has been difficulties all along. And there are some specific difficulties with respect to um, horticultural germplasm, particularly perennial crops. Number one is about the data quality and completeness. Um, we have had a um, research advisory committee meeting recently. And one of the recommendations for us was that you huge amount of data lies with other institutes, of course, all crop specific institutes. Let's say in this case, horticulture institutes, lots of data are there. Why don't you gather all the data and put it here in one place? Now we have two challenges in such things. We have been doing that one, not that we are not doing that, 
Number one is about the data quality. Now, who will vouch for that data? So if I ask somebody, some scientist in IHR who is right now a senior scientist taking care of one crop, that you give me all the legacy data, that all the data that you have been passed on to. If the person gives me that one, and if I ask him whether these all these things are correct, whatever the numbers are there, all the, these things are correct, the person may not be able to tell that one. Because either those were not published or, or the peer reviewed, or they were not uh, um, having various difficult things, are, different things are there. That is one part. The other half is about the completeness, whether our data are complete or not. Let's say you have 10 minimum fields that are required to be make it meaningful. And you have data of the past years where two, fil two uh, fields are filled, another two fields are filled. So there are gaps in either. So if they are not complete, for namesake, you have 1,000 data, the data on 1,000 accessions. But for utility um, point of view, they are useless. So the data quality and completeness is a greatest challenge. Because whatever we do from today onwards, we can take care of this one. Whatever, whatever has happened in the past. So we have to work a little hard to find out those old catalogs and old publications of people themselves and then do these things, which we are doing in some crops. The second challenge, which is uh, unique to India, is about vernacular names. We have multiple languages. And within the same language, in different areas, we may call different things differently. Different names are there for the uh, same name is used for entirely different genotypes genetically different entities, let's say in fruits, in different areas. So when these things happen, even if the uh, very meticulously documented data become mm, mm, conflicting when we put it in database, uh, we have to create, develop these for, uh, let's say, right now we have all the, our applications only in English. So they become mm, less useful the moment local people have to access that one or the information has to be used uh, maintained in a local language because the names are half uh, uh, let's say evaluation data that means they tell you what exactly the material is what is the information about that so we have to maintain in local language with the phonetics so that is a greatest challenge for us so the third one is about field gene bank data that i already mentioned uh, we are trying to do that one but it's a challenge mm, it's not a uh, one way process everybody has to come together all the young people who have joined in different places are manning the field gene bank thinking that this is a donkey's work that has been thrust upon them no it's a very very important activity and how you can convert that into a research oriented activity everything can be discussed we have to all of us have to meet specifically only on maintenance of the gene bank field gene banks and their documentation that's a challenge right now the moment we overtake this challenge and we will achieve a huge amount of things in terms of maintenance as well as utilization uh, as well as now on farm in situ huge many number of farmers are custodian farmers are there here and there but these studies become standalone studies that means we have a funding for five years we go and do some studies we have identified some farmers we have documented and what happens after that it becomes very difficult so how do we maintain continuity of data flow whether the next generation of farmers are actually doing on farm, how do we work with other agencies on in situ? We have started working with some forest agencies on in situ conservation. So they're all little challenges, but they all can be overcome with the informatics because every department in government of India are working with informatics. We have GIS. So everybody is working with lat long minimum. So the moment everybody starts with lat long, that means latitude, long, longitude data, location data, we can overlap the things. The moment we do that, uh, one bit of information becomes exponentially higher amount of information. Now, the next one is want of partnerships. We have to have partners in all areas, not among ourselves. We also have to partner with farmers. We have to, we have to partner with private people. Private people have imported a huge amount of particularly fruit germplasm, vegetable germplasm. You would like to know what are the traits they have. You never know when an emergency arrives like COVID. So at that time, there is a the difference, in, difference between public and private goes off because uh, there is an emergency. So at least information must be available what they have, whether they, it will be useful. There is a huge disease like coming on uh, India and then a, a particular crop is going to be devastated. Now, yes, emergency measures have to be taken. They can be taken only when we have information. 
then institutional mechanism for sustainability all the institutions have to support these standalone programs and then look how they can continue <clears throat> okay i'll just um, this is one example for example a field gene bank which has been otherwise maintained for a very long time and then you will see that there are gaps now now these gaps will not reach the information system we have an information system thinking that okay there are 400 where there are only 200 there now what happens so we should have a data which is updated how can how can we help with the modern tools and technologies people who are actually maintaining the field gene bank so this work is also going on in a in a rudimentary mode right now with uh, IHR and BPGR, we will see how it works out. Okay, if uh, all of us think about um, only ex situ conservation, so we have something in a very specific area, oh, there we are not able to maintain, so we will take all of them in a centrally manned area. We have a chattali for citrus, we have something else for something, for crop based, we will maintain all of them, then we will lose some amount of information. Something which is below the soil, along with the plant genetic resource, is extremely valuable. Then how do we work with other specialists to document that part and ensure that we have all these things together? For example, a microbial flora, which is available along with the specific species, which otherwise we will not be able to establish somewhere else, or it will not thrive somewhere else. So how do we work with, let's say, National Bureau of uh, uh, Microbially Important mi uh, Organisms, Agriculturally Important Microorganisms? How do we work with other people? So these are all are possible only when their documentation and our documentation are mapped together. So which is why informatics becomes very, very important for all your basic research. Okay, uh, this um, I not. This I had put only to encourage people that please go for field gene banking, work on field gene banking, don't shirk away from uh, field gene banking because we can work on uh, lots of practical issues which are very highly researchable and they all get published in high impact journals such as rootstock research, such as grave banking, creep gene, bank, gene banking re, uh, relation, such as work on climate change, uh, how things are moving on different uh, elevation in the areas, clonal deposits, et cetera. Okay, I'll not, uh, let me, uh, one more part, leave this. Uh, if uh, you people uh, allow me to close this by thanking and then share my applications so that I have, uh, actual demonstration of what are available on the plate. Hmm? Uh, by, while thanking after my presentation, I have to mention here that uh, uh, any work on plant genetic resources is not an individual or a small team's work. It is a big team and it is over a period of time work. And it also requires a lot of funding. So I thank all the teammates who are present with me and all those people who have worked in the past in NVPGR in all other institutes and all other funding agencies. Okay. Uh, Okay, can you see this particular page now? The website which I have opened. Hello, Dr. Shekhar. Is this visible? Yes, sir, it is visible, sir. Okay, thank you, boss. Okay, now this is pgrinformatics.nbpgr.arnet.in. pgrinformatics.nbpgr.arnet.in. If you go here and then click on web apps, so you will have a number of web apps that are available. All these are open access. All these are open access. You do not need any user ID password unless there is a link for data entry or link for data modification. Okay. But whatever is available is available free to everybody. This is also visible now, PGR portal. Yes. PGR portal. Yeah. So this is a PGR portal. We have a passport, simple passport, free text characterization, core collection on the left, on the left here. So here all these things. So you click on the passport, free text, and then you mention some particular crop. Then you will say, let's say, yeah, yeah banana. I'll click on banana and then say that give me, uh, okay, sorry. I will have to do something else here. Okay. Um, please remember, 
in the pgr portal we are giving information on only those crop accessions that are uh, for which we have verified all the data and those that are for which we have conservation data also available actual location is available so if i click banana i'll not get uh, i'll not get everything on the pgr portal uh, i have to click on some uh, let's say seed uh, which is uh, a vegetable let's say so i can show you like this brinjal so you'll have a number of accessions as per selection 3793 and then you have all the details so before you start your research uh, all the participants and my colleagues from whoever is listening uh, today please remember before starting any research in any specific crop please come to this pgr portal or if it is not there please contact us to get the correct passport data if you are working on germplasm get the correct passport data sometimes what happens the number on the left side you have accession number ic or ec number is not nbpgr number it is india's identity national identity number so in your publications everywhere these identities must be available what will happen if somebody else does something else somebody uses this one in the other other country you will not be able to do anything unless we support saying that yes this is your I, our ic number so ensure that ic numbers are there in your publications and before you start your actual work see that your uh, uh, data and your accessions that you have seeds that you have match and take information from here and then you get information like this okay okay um pgr informatics one thing quickly i would like to show is about pgr map pgr map is something which you can open on your mobile also this is a app is there in android phones we also had app in uh, iphone uh, but they are asking a little too much of license fee so i am not paying right now but it is available on android right now you just <clears throat> put pgr map gene bank as well as pgr map uh, as apps are available right now you have three things which you can do quickly here number one you take your mobile phone to any place in india this is for india ic numbers that means only indigenous collections any place in india switch on the internet switch on the location so it will take you to that location for example you can see here right now i am in delhi so it is taking me here okay and then you click on that one you will get details let us say i know i don't know to do that i am sitting in bangalore i am sitting in uh, jaipur or some other place i want to know information on some other location so you look here on the left side search the map search the map option is there so what i'll do is i'm sitting here in uh, here so i'll click somewhere here in orissa and then search here so it will show me all these that have been explored and documented please remember in pgr map i am not trying to show something which is conserved i am trying to show you these things that have been explored and documented that yes these have been recorded there that means people either collected or collected or documented whatever with details hmm? you will get all the information on this including any crop groups for example if i select on fruits and nuts i'll get custard apple and mango and then click on custard apple or mango then i'll get information of that one so don't worry about this uh, right side uh, thumbs down because it is not in our seed gene bank the moment we add field gene bank data they will all become thumbs up along with the information so what do you get in this uh, application is the actual ic number when it was collected for example look here 1999 some of you were not born perhaps uh, and then uh, cultivar name and then lo exact location so you will get all this information so any any place you can go to any remote place and then search here so you will get all for example edible tubers so great area yeah. so this information is there it is not that uh, it is present somewhere here only i uh, let's go to andaman nicobar so you can see here cereals let us say cereals fruits and nuts for today's uh, which one banana we we'll go to banana yeah you can see here so you will also have a wild species or different species and exact location hmm? so like this 
okay so this is the second part now the third one which is also very interesting for people who want to do further research is search for species so you just have to type a species name here in the box and then select the species and then you will get the map uh, any specific species uh, somebody can suggest genus let me give me genus not species at least anyone Sapota. No? Sapota. No, you give me a genus name. Okay, sorry. Sapota is what? The Garcinia. Okay. Garci. So the Mara have... species. Yeah, yeah, Mara... I'll one by one. yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Garcinia, you can see here, Garcinia. The moment you put G-A-R-C-I, you will get all the species uh, in the uh, drop down menu. So you select any one of them and then or you can select all of them also only put garcinia also you'll get everything so if i say garcinia cambogia okay so we'll get here details and then uh, click on these uh, bindis the dots and click on passport details you'll get passport details okay these are from chikmagalore karnataka Uh, so if I want some other species, then you will, I'll get some other please, species. Please. But if sir, I want put Morris, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do one second. I'll come to Morris. So if I just put Garcinia, then I'll say only Garcinia. You will get all Garcinia. Okay. Okay. And then click on uh, whoever has suggested uh, Garcinia. Click on each bindi, then you will get the ones which are uh, the details of that. So sir, somebody wants sir, about check. Morris. Dr. Yes. Archik, uh, yes. The paucity of time. You know, the next speaker is in waiting. Anyway, okay. Sorry. Yeah. No problem. No. Yeah. Uh, uh, all of you, whoever is uh, showing this interest to search these things, I request to please open this PGR map and then do searching, and then uh, please uh, give me a feedback on these. Okay. The sir, one which Archik, is. Sir. Archik, sir. Yeah. Sir, can yeah. we get the collected details also from that uh, IC yes, number? Yes, you saw that one. Yeah, no, no, it was there in the in front of that. It was there in front of that. Okay. Uh, there is one access, one uh, um, last one minute I'll take. There is one this um, useful uh, application where let us say I see details. If you have an IC number, you just put IC number here and then say search so you will get all the details okay so for example see here i'll click search you will get all the details with just now somebody asked this question i don't know rohini somebody asked this question uh this one similarly ec details if you have ec but you want to know the details okay now you want to match accession that means you have an accession list of let's say 200 and you want to make sure that whether this is correct or not download this excel format put your IC number or whatever number list, upload, then you will get the details of all the 100, 200, 1000, whatever number of them are there. Okay. You want to match accession by that. And you want to see your accession on the map, you upload the accession list, you will get a map of the dots. Okay. Similarly, all these things. You want to search by collector name. For example, nowadays, uh, people are applying for director's post, various posts or your, your promotion, and you have done some work in collecting. So you put your name here, collector's name, you will get a complete list of what all you have collected and provided here. So that is an authentic source of what work you have done. So similarly, there are many other applications. Okay. Uh, so Dr. Ashikaran has uh, warned me that I have already. Uh, please visit all these. You have a field gene bank information also. You have all other gene bank information that are available here. Okay. In vitro. Hmm? from which place, what different, different applications are there. Uh, I'll start, stop sharing. We have, uh, where it is, NHCP, that is herbarium also, e-herbarium also, okay. E-herbarium also. Okay. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, Dr. Ashekar and all other participants, my colleagues here, that the objective is to, I'm not showing you exactly what work we have done using these applications. I, I invite all of you to make use of these and then uh, publish, make use of them freely. It's available and useful for all of you. Just try once. Thank you very much. Thank you, Archik, sir. Sir, uh, in your presentation, uh, you have highlighted the PGR informatics and its application and demonstrated uh, about the PGR portal, how it can be used. And uh, you have uh, given a complete picture of this uh, total germ plus conserved at National Gene Bank in fruit crops, vegetable crops, and what are the challenges uh, in horticulture genetic resource management and niche areas of uh, conservation, field gene banking of the fruit crops, and uh, means a beautiful demonstration of web apps, open access, and PGR maps and uh, its application, along with the e herbarium of the cultivated plants. So uh, with this information, sir, uh, especially those uh, working in the germ plasma collection, uh, evaluation, and uh, conservation, the breeders, uh, along with the breeder, they can uh, use this information for their uh, breeding program and uh, exactly locate uh, the germ plus where it uh, presently available. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for sparing your valuable time for our trainees. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, pleasure is mine. And before I leave, I just want to say uh, thank you to Dr. Ashekar and say hello to Venugopal also. Yeah, I was about to tell Sunil, thank you after seeing you after a long, long time. <laughs> Bye. My Nam batchmate, thank you very much. Uh, dear trainees, uh, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Venugopalan. He's uh, basically, he's a principal scientist in uh, ICR, IHR, basically a statistician. And uh, he has involved in uh, research, involved in the research activity pertaining to crop modeling, biometrical genetics, and big data analysis in horticulture crops. Recently, he has uh, suggested non-parametric methodology for crop varietal release based on stability of uh, multiple traits simultaneously based on data mining. He has published uh, about uh, 146 article in the national and international journal. He's, he was also involved in the release of three flower varieties. And uh, he's uh, actively involved in the teaching. He is involved in the education activity with recognition as a guide uh, with IERI, UHS Bagalkot, US Bangalore, YSR Horticulture, and Jain University. Uh, he is uh, recognized uh, with the recognition of IHR of campus IERI. He has implemented education activity till March 2017. Uh, as an organizing secretary, he conducted first ever horticulture education conference at IHR. He has guided four MSc student and 142 MSc PhD student of uh, different universities. And uh, he's recognized as a RAC member in HRDF since 2016 and uh, doctoral committee board of uh, NIMHANS for PhD. He has served as editor of the Journal of Horticulture Sciences. Uh, sir, I request you to have a talk on a st statistical tool and methods in horticulture genetic resource management. Vinay sir. Yeah, uh, thank you, Rajiv. Uh, good morning, everyone. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to speak about this uh, topic. As I uh, understand that uh, there are uh, 21 discipline ARS discipline scientists starting from students to professors. So I will be addressing uh, one or the other topic which is useful to all of you in your research. So this is the overview of my lecture. So first uh, few slides I will be telling about why do we actually uh, need to analyze the data statistically. So what is the significance it is going to give? Then, uh, as you know, at different stages of biological research, we need the statistical uh, interface. So what is the necessity of that? Then coming to this uh, spe uh, specific topic, statistical methods and its application in uh, horticultural genetic resource management. Uh, initially, I will be discussing about some of the basic tools which are being used. Then as it progresses, I will be talking about some of the advanced tools which may be presently in use or it can be used in future. 
so which uh, covers uh, different measures of genetic diversity then designs then nonlinear growth models which are uh, specifically helpful for uh, uh, pathologists and entomologists who are also part of this uh, audience and then uh, non parametric stability approach for crop varietal release which is uh, very much helpful for breeders uh, then uh, i will be dealing with big data analysis and machine learning approaches which are useful for uh, entire fertility of horticulture coming to data reduction methods and then finally the best linear and based prediction models which are useful in uh, breeding procedures i will end the talk by expressing about the softwares which are available for data analysis their pros and cons with respect to your research demand so coming to the necessity of uh, uh, doing statistical uh, analysis in our research so as all of you know it serves as a base for scientific validity of any experimental research and i put it across in three uh, requirement uh, whenever we do an experiment we always uh, take up a sample of data and we try to generalize about the entire population suppose if we say that a particular growth laboratory is uh, capable of influencing flowering uh, to maximum extent then we will take only a sample of data then finally what we are going to take the inference is for the entire variety for the entire population we are going to generalize the result is it possible for us to generalize the research based on a sample of data observed if yes means we need to uh, perform systematic some statistical analysis that's why i have put it across that line holistic decision about the population then comes uh, we are uh, doing analysis uh, by based on a particular location or a particular research institute can it be possible for us to reproduce the same inference whatever we are drawing to different location and also in some other period some other years if yes we need to follow some systematic procedure then most important the last one is what is the level of confidence or probability with which we recommend our conclusion that is whatever the inference whatever we are taking so what is the level of probability we recommend this conclusion for the users so of course the last one is we need to remove any bias because we all are scientific fraternity on the part of experimenters towards any conclusion so what is the necessity of statistical uh, analysis at different stages of i i won't say analysis also statistical uh, interpretation in different stages of research so broadly i have classified into uh, three stages that is planning stage execution stage and analysis stage so during the planning stage someone may be interested to know which type of design i want to use whether it is experimental design so whether it is a uh, rbd design or factorial rbd or strip plot strip plot i will be dealing about this uh, in next few slides then coming to genetic studies which type of mating design whether we will follow line and twist tester or die allele it's all depends upon some objectives then comes the most important uh, topic is what should be the optimum sample size for conducting any research experiment then the sampling method and most importantly what the hypothesis we put across to test in the stage in the research then in the experimental stage that is execution stage we may be interested to know how often we need to record the data based on some initial indication so some initial indication would have thrown uh, if we record the data weekly then it may not be sufficient for us to uh, give some proper information so we may be interested to take it okay twice in a week we will record the data then comes second one do we need to segment the data prior to analysis Uh, suppose someone is uh, interested to study the effect of particular treatment across different growth stages of the crop do we need to do the analysis separately for vegetative phase flowering phase fruiting phase or uh, simply putting across everything we can do on analysis so certainly we may be interested to know which particular type of treatment has performed better in one particular stage so that we can recommend to farmer okay during the flowering stage you please make use of this uh, treatment so that it will have uh, a positive effect for you then so based on that we can modify the existing statistical analysis method so the uh, existing methods may not be sufficient for us to capture uh, what is required so we can uh, modify the method by discussing with the concerned statistician then during the analysis stage this is the most crucial stage so there will be several analytical tool which are useful for analyzing the data whatever generated by the researchers so we need to see which type of statistical procedure best fit in the data behavior 
So based on that only we should select. So in nutshell, what I uh, want to say is uh, because of the analysis procedure, whatever we have selected and whatever the hidden information in the research, whatever we have conducted should not go wrong. So for this purpose only, we need to minimize the error by capturing the reality and increasing the level of reproducibility of the inference stand. So with this background, I will be starting my lecture. So first one is, uh, we will discuss about application of some of the basic statistical methods in research data analysis. Then after that, I will go for some advanced tools. So coming to the first one, the assessed genetic diversity. So all, all of you is very much useful for breeders. As all of you know that in the initial population, huge variability may be there. So a breeder may be interested to know or uh, show the genetic wealth, whatever we are having with respect to any of the particular uh, trait. So very highly heterozygous in nature. Uh, so for that, the first measure which comes into our uh, mind is we can use a simple average or variance, standard error or coefficient of variation. So higher the CV, higher the variability, then the uh, researcher or the breeder will be very much happy that yes, I am having very high genetic base so that I can exploit it very well during the future hybridization work. Now coming to the next one, uh, the, this slide I have especially put it because there are so many students are also attending this. Uh, so there will be a lot of uh, <clears throat> confusion we will be having when we do an experimental design analysis. So which type of design we need to use for which particular type. So rather uh, people will end up in uh, using uh, two, three design analysis and wherever they are getting a promising result, then they will say this is the design they have used. But nevertheless, uh, that is not a correct approach. So we need to see based on what is the uh, objectives we are doing it. So if that object under comparison is only one factor, then we will say that uh, we will go, that is without uh, any interaction, we will go for either uh, CRD analysis that is called as one-way analysis of variance in case of uh, lab-based trite or two-way analysis of variance if it is a field-based trite. Suppose when we want to study the interaction among the uh, two factors, say different genotypes at different uh, irrigation methods, we want to test it. So here we want to go for a factorial uh, arbitrary type of uh, design. So when we go for a factorial uh, design, there are three options available. When we want to estimate the efficacy of both the factors with equal importance. So I said uh, evaluation of genotypes over different fertigation schedules. So if you want to give equal importance, then we need to use our factorial RCBD setup. But if uh, as a agronomist, if you want to evaluate the uh, fertigation schedule, then your importance is uh, giving more importance to the fatigation schedule than the genotypes, whatever are varieties, whatever they have studied as the um, other factor. So you want to make use of this uh, split plot design wherein the preferred factor, you will be putting it in subplot and the main plot, you will be taking the other less preferred factor. So it uh, changes uh, vice versa if a breeder is uh, evaluating. Suppose a uh, uh, soil scientist, he wants to know the what is the microbial load at the end of the experiment. So he may be interested, he may not be interested either the genotypes or whatever this uh, fertigation schedule, whatever they have used. His aim is only to know about the interaction, these two factors, how they interact with respect to the traits he wants to study. Then in that case, one needs to go for uh, strip plot design. And there is one uh, very typical method instead of ANOVA, there is one analysis of covariance, we call it as ANACOVA. So this is very much useful in perennial crops where uh, you know that age also uh, matters, age of the tree also matters. So we will take age as a factor and instead of doing ANOVA, we need to do for analysis of covariance. If we want to study <coughs> comparative performance of uh, say different treatments on different genotypes. <coughs> okay, now let me say uh, something about looking beyond ANOVA. So we have done the analysis of variance and uh, we have come out this, uh, all the treatments are significantly different with respect to the uh, common practice, whatever it is for, whatever it is followed. Now we want to know uh, post hoc test, we will call it as. So among the significant treatments, which one is the best as compared to that uh, local check or control? So for that, there are two options are available. We will go for least significant difference or with respect to Duncan multiple range, that is DMRT. So here there is a confusion which one to use it. 
So my suggestion is whenever we are having a predefined check or control in the experiment with which you want to improve upon your new recommendation, then better to go for least significant difference method. If you don't have any predefined control, that is if you want to compare all the treatments uh, with respect to each other, then you better you go for Duncan multiple range test. Both are going to give the same type of uh, results, but it depends upon the situation upon which you have to select this. Then one more uh, additional I would like to say. So when we uh, write a scientific articles, especially article series. So in addition to this uh, ANOVA table or anything CV, SCM, it is better to give the P value also. So any statistical software, if you do for analysis, it will give the, it will print the P value also. So what is it? P value is a probability value. So lesser the value, higher is the reproducibility of the conclusion drawn. So P less than 0 0.05 is sufficient. Okay. So that means that uh, 5 out of 100 times only, whatever the inference I am taking with respect to the uh, results uh, experiment, whatever I have conducted, it goes wrong. So that is sufficient. But if uh, two researchers are conducting the same experiment, one with uh, higher uh, replication, another with uh, lesser replication, then this p-value matters. So it may come as 0 0.00007. So that means uh, five zeros followed by seven means so one out of uh, one lakh time only, whatever the results he is uh, coming out at the end of the experiment may go wrong. So this P value uh, strengthen the reliability of the results drawn. So uh, I suggest that this P value should invariably given in addition to uh, the ANOVA table, whatever we are writing in the research article. Now there is a cautionary note about this uh, analysis of variance. So when we deal with uh, percentage data or count data, uh, this analysis of variance uh, demands that whatever the data, uh, here the data I means, suppose if you are having five treatments and four replication, there will be 20 observation. So this 20 observation, it should follow the assumption of normality. So that is the prerequisite for any analysis of variance, the method, methodology which is uh, developed. Okay, suppose if this is not followed, especially in, term, uh, in, in percentage data. So where, uh, what will happen is, for one particular treatment, the mortality percentage may be 100%. For another treatment in another replication, it may be 5%. So there is a huge range. So before doing this analysis of variance, we need to transform this data and we need to uh, keep the data ready for ANOVA. So there are three different transformations which are available in literature. So uh, if your data, that is a 20 observation, for example, in this, if it follows a wide range, we need to go for oxygen transformation if it follows in any one of the tile of the normal distribution, that is less than 30% or uh, above 70%, that is uh, both are uh, considered to be rare cases. So rare cases are determined by square root transformation, that is Poisson distribution, we need to go for square root transformation. Uh, but in case of, suppose if you observe the uh, pest count, say number of trips in the first week, second week, third week, it will exponentially increase. Then in that case, you need to go for log transformation. So these three transformations are very much essential when you feel that your data, it doesn't follow the normality assumption, which is a prerequisite for carrying out any analysis of variance. Now, let me talk about for next 20 minutes about the application of some of the advanced statistical methods in research data analysis, which may be in at present in use, or uh, we can make use it for future. So this first one is uh, experimental design in case of outliers. So the, what is happening is when we carefully see any experimental data analysis, whether be it RBD or factorial RBD, we used to see uh, there will be some sort of extreme observation with respect to one out, uh, with respect to one replication in one treatment or with respect to many replication across several treatments. So if we keep that uh, outlier value, and we analyze the data, we are going to get a non-significant results. Let me put using an example. Suppose uh, someone is observing the uh, TRIPS count uh, as uh, dictated by some five treatment combination, that is chemical treatment combination. So it may happen that in one uh, treatment combination, the number of uh, TRIPS up, uh, count recorded, it may vary from 5% to 80% or per se in some other treatment combination, it may vary uh, in wider range. Suppose if we keep that wider range across the replication, if you do the analysis, then this uh, analysis is going to result in a non-significant. That means all the treatments are on par. Similarly, if a breeder or a production specialist is uh, uh, 
doing that experiment say in one particular uh, genotype in one replication he might have got very high yield but in other two replication this would have not happen this is also true uh, in case of uh, some <clears throat> long term experiment data so wherein uh, over the years they will be analyzing what is the yield potential of various treatments in order to suggest the best treatment at the end of the experimentation maybe after 10 years so the initial years the yield uh, potential of the best uh, genotype or best treatment may be very less but as it progress it would have been better okay suppose if they make use of a simple analysis of variance what will happen because of this huge variability you are going to get a non significant results so what is the way out so we need to adopt one robust anova approach so this approach it takes care of this abnormality or our outliers which are present across the replication so what it does is it is going to give desired weightage to a particular treatment which is consistent in performance across the replication so when we take the long term experiment then the replication will be over years also so consistency over years with respect to identifying the superiority a variety or a genotype or a treatment per se is the um, uh, goal in this robust anova so we did in uh, ihr also some study wherein totarapuri several several rootstocks uh, uh, methods were tried rootstock trials were tried over several years so uh, the, finally we found out that volur was found to be the best rootstock treatment over years which was not uh, visible when we did the individual year pooled analysis of variance which normally everyone does then coming to the second this also very practically all uh, scientists researcher would have experience so when they uh, try to evaluate several treatments or several varieties simultaneously based on several trials and compare the superiority of the treatments it may happens that for one particular set of trials a particular treatment or a variety would have happened to be the best one for some other group of trials something would have been happen best say for quality yield then crop protection trials different different treatments would have come out to be the best but finally at the end of the experiment we need to recommend to the farmers which is the best treatment or a best uh, variety which we want to recommend so in that case individually doing the analysis of variance and saying and saying uh, this treatment you make use for uh, this particular trait and this genotypes this variety i am recommending for this particular trait which is which, which may not go very well with the farmer who is the actual person who is going to use so for that purpose what we need to do is we need to apply one method called multivariate analysis of variance that is banova so this method what it uh, does is it will capture the uh, correlation or that association among all the traits and finally it is going to give the best treatments which is uh, best across all the traits so this method uh, multivariate analysis of variance method uh, is very much useful in this condition then i will come to the breeding that is crop improvement studies so normally uh, what we do is when we try the initial germ plasm evaluation when we try to evaluate some hundred germ plasm uh, with a objective that we will come out with one or two promising uh, so that which we can use as one of the potential parent and cross with the existing uh, the varieties which is lacking in a particular trait so this uh, normally what breeders they will do is they will go for randomized block design suppose if you are having 100 jump plasm you have collected uh, from sources and there are four existing varieties and there will be another four entries if you use the rbd so minimum three replication is required like that statistician will say so another four uh, treatment treatments evaluating in such huge space it may be very very difficult in terms of uh, other inputs also which is required and another uh, thing is that this 100 uh, whatever the new lines whatever you have got it its true potential may not be known to you either it may be gold mine or it may, may not be useful so the best thing is that <coughs> use some incomplete block design like uh, augmented design or uden square design which all falls under the family of balanced incomplete block design so that what this design does is that uh, for the entire layout the new lines what we have jump plasm accession what we have got it will be repeated only once but the checks whatever we are having uh, seeds in uh, plenty it will be 
repeated in every block. So at the end of the day, what you are going to get is some four or five best uh, accessions, uh, which are very good in the trade which you are aiming for, so that you can put it, uh, you can take it forward in the next generation by uh, doing the hybridization in the RBD setup. So uh, application, this paper, uh, I can request you all to go through. <coughs> so we, we, we did the same thing. So it was done with our ex vegetable division head, Dr. K. R. M. Swami. So he demonstrated that about 60.2% of the land area can be saved if we make use of this particular uh, methodology, that is incomplete block designs. Then comes to the application of advanced design in uh, genetic studies. So we use for mating designs normally either line into tester or dialyl depends upon whether we want to use both the uh, parents as a male and female or we want to use uh, only ones. Okay. So in that, uh, suppose if the number of lines num uh, to be evaluated increases, what will happen? Number of crosses also to rapidly increases. For example, suppose if you want to uh, have a dialyl with uh, 15 parents, then we need to evaluate precisely 120 crosses. Suppose if we take only parents and F1 hybrids in half dialyl and it will be 220. So it will increase uh, uh, in half dialyl also number of crosses. So what is the consequence? Again, as I said in the previous slide, in order to accommodate uh, huge entries, people will go for RBD. So finally, what will happen? High coefficient of variation will come. Then net result is, you know, this uh, uh, mating designs uh, end product is uh, combining ability analysis. So we need to work out the GCA and uh, SCA effect so that we can identify a, a best line which can combine with uh, everything or a best hybrid. So because of use of this RBD, what will happen? We may not be in a position to get a true value uh, regarding the GCA and the SCA effect. So what is the remedy? We can make use of partial dialyl design or LNT design or lattice design, which uh, takes care of this particular aspect. Now coming to these uh, nonlinear uh, uh, growth models, because I understand that entomologists and pathologists also present in this audience. So I will be taking uh, three um, um, particular aspect. And the third one is very much pertaining to this horticulture genetic resource management. So first one is, uh, what is the necessity of a nonlinear statistical model as compared to the linear regression model? So you know the factors responsible for crop growth. Okay, it may be crop specific traits or weather factors. It vary from stages to stage. <clears throat> Any aberration which we, which we uh, uh, come across in one particular stage is carry forward to subsequent stage. So if we make use of a regular regression model, then what will happen? Uh, we cannot be in a position to predict this change, whatever it is occurring very, very accurately. Even if you see uh, the disease incidence, whatever we are taking, or a pest count we are taking in first week, second week, third week, these are all not linearly related. So linearly related means every week, subsequent week, whatever it is, the increase in pest count or uh, PDA value is a constant over all the weeks, which will never occur in any population dynamic studies. So what is the reality? After a certain period of time, it will take a stagnation. That is, it will take a nonlinear pattern. So for this, we need to follow the pattern of the data and we need to employ some suitable nonlinear model. So this uh, Malthus model in population biology is uh, well known to everyone. So as a subcase of this uh, Malthus model only, a lot of nonlinear statistical models are developed in the literature. So the addition, this uh, what is the advantage of this uh, nonlinear growth models are the parameters, whatever we are going to estimate, will have a biological interpretation. Say, for example, uh, a pathologist is evaluating the disease uh, incidence for a particular disease for five six uh, genotypes or from five six uh, chemical or for, for treatments. Okay, so at the end of the day, if we will work out the uh, area under disease progressive curve using this nonlinear approach, then he may be in a position to say which period of the crop, which phenological stages, which particular treatment AWPC was least. So that he can recommend to the users stage wise also the treatment as the best using the AUDPC, which is the end product of this nonlinear statistical model. And moreover, uh, on all this model, if you observe a parameter, which is uh, A, here it is constant, it will give what is the 
intrinsic growth rate that is rate of growth of disease uh, progression over the time period so which otherwise in linear model we may not be in a position to get so there is a reference paper we did it from ihr you can refer this paper it is uh, published in uh, iasr journal so what that precisely uh, did was uh, in uh, grapes downy mildew incident we have used for backward and uh, for pruning different different models and another beauty of this non linear model is the last column if you observe it will give what is the optimum time of uh, prophylactic intervention so 5.6 means so you can give the prophylactic intervention between fifth and sixth week after pruning so this type of practical uh, intervention it may not be possible if we make use of a linear model so uh, let me come to the another application of this non linear model so it's a classical work done by our ex head of uh, soil science here dr ganesh murthy so he wanted to estimate what is the total carbon sequestered in mango orchards in our uh, ihr field also it can be generalized for the entire country so what we did was we have we have developed a non linear model which can relate the above ground biomass as a factor of number of primary branches and the primary branch kit that is a non linear model power model which is given in the second line so using this he has estimated what is the above above ground biomass then subsequently what is the sorry so what is the total carbon sequestered so if you refer to this current science paper so he has estimated this much tons of uh, million tons of carbon in mango orchard is uh, sequestered which is very much helpful uh, as we are dealing with climate change studies nowadays then coming to the very important application of non linear statistical model uh, precisely to this particular training program that is horticultural genetic resource management so you, all of you know that in creo banks conserving genetic diversity seeds are stored in different temperature with different moisture content okay so for the breeders uh, convenient can we pick up a particular uh, sample if we know uh, the longevity of the seed by predicting using some non linear model so this was precisely done, uh, work done by uh, sapra et al at iri in 2003 which is published in uh, current science so what they did was they have simulated uh, different uh, seed moisture content uh, ranging from 2 to 30 30 percentage at a different uh, temperature parameter ranging from minus 20 to 50 degrees celsius so that they have predicted uh, for each of the sample analyzed what is the longevity in terms of number of years so that if it is useful for the breeders then in, uh, in, in longer sense the heritability uh, heritability it won't break down and all the uh, parameters will be viable so interested uh, scientists may please refer this paper current science paper then come to the then coming to the another uh, method which is a stability analysis approach which normally breeders uh, used to do when they uh, either in one particular location or in different location so and the, at the end of the hybridization trial they may be interested to uh, release a particular top performing lion as a uh, variety at institute level or in all india coordinated trials across location so here if you carefully see Uh, we, he would have he or she would have evaluated some uh, 10 promising uh, lines so for every character uh, different lines would have come out to be the best one so at the end he has to release uh, only top one or two combined over all traits as the best so here the problem comes if we make use of the regular stability analysis whatever it is uh, used so that's why at ihr we have suggested a non parametric stability analysis approach which will give desired info, desired uh, prefer, importance to the different traits that is weightage will be worked out based on the uh, minimum of 3 years uh, data generated by the breeders then across all traits a yeah, which particular lion happens to be the best in terms of a yeah, combined indices so this uh, we have published this paper and we have tested in okra so those who are interested may please uh, uh, see that paper published in again in iasr journal then coming to the next topic of big data analysis which uh, will be used for those who are dealing with bioinformatics and diversity analysis so big data we refer in terms of volume or variety or velocity or veracity okay the data may be available in cloud 
or as a database also so what is the what are the list of statistical methods which we can with the it uh, interface which can we can make use so here in ihr also we did uh, uh, some work so these are all some of the practical situations uh, before going to the application these are all some practical situation where in the big data analysis can be so your breeder may be evaluating some hundreds of uh, jump plus some lines for 50 60 characters so is a huge data okay so a yeah, yeah, uh, crop protection scientist uh, may be interested to know a yeah, management strategy for a yeah, newly arriving pest or disease based on the existing pattern say for biodiversity researchers they may be interested to know uh, for a different location what are the different uh, lines varieties they can recommend in the order of preference 1 2 3 or uh, in bioinformatics several sequence data genomic sequence data protein sequence data dna data so many data will be accumulated so these are all uh, falling under the category of big data analysis so what are the methods we can use so this i five more minutes 10 minutes 2 minutes okay Uh, so these are all we can uh, comprehend under four uh, that is classification or resampling method or dimension rejection or neural network methods so we have done one practical application so leaf area estimation in uh, fig ddd so what uh, the articulture is they wanted to know is instead of uh, following the normal approach of uh, leaf area estimation can we develop a model using that model with uh, very few traits can we predict the leaf area uh, in the lab so that, that, that this this was the model whatever we have developed so with only one factor that is middle lobe measurement we can create uh, we can predict up to 78 percentage then what should be the optimum sample size which is required that also we have worked out using the bootstrap method so uh, one can refer this paper which is going to come uh, in future then coming to the data reduction technique which is very much useful to this course so there are different data reduction technique discriminant analysis factor analysis cluster analysis pca approach so it all depends upon which type of uh, data we are having based on that you need to uh, select uh, i have given some uh, one or two example suppose a breeder he wants to group the uh, genotypes evaluated based on several traits in homogeneous group one can go for cluster analysis suppose if you want to go for indirect selection based on the Uh, uh, biochemical or uh, uh, physiological traits one can go for pca so the last one which i am going to touch is best linear unbiased prediction in breeding uh, studies for estimating the progress from breeding so this is very much uh, useful uh, one example i will tell you in mango where uh, the pollen parent is very difficult for us to identify so based on the progeny information suppose if breeder is interested to know in order to get a uh, final product wherein uh, the uh, fruit size is of this much gram which type of uh, pollen parent i uh, i would like to make use in the early generation so using that uh, uh, blub value one can identify the uh, male parent very much useful so that uh, the pollen can can be identified at the early generation it can be cross with the seed parent so this we call it as targeted hybridization so this is a bluff approach which is very much useful for the breeders the, the final last one is there are so many statistical packages available in uh, open space which are free or which is charged so which one is best the common question it will, it will come so nothing is uh, inferior or nothing is superior it all depends upon what type of analysis we need to use so uh, we are using it here r or sas or even a simple sps is also a very good package but only thing is the choice of package is not important but the selection of appropriate method and interpretation of results are paramount so that uh, we i request you so whatever the uh, unanticipated or on significant results whatever you have got it it is not because of the wrong selection of method or package because your time is very much valuable so in conclusion what i want what i want to say is that uh is this data analysis or data science is a scientific procedure so if the association between the biologist and statistician is very strong then certainly whatever the uh, objectives we have envisaged in the research may come out by using a proper technique the final aim is we need to minimize the error and increase the level of reproducibility of the inference drawn across time and space by using a for appropriate method and selection of most best available tool so with this i 
uh, end my lecture so for any future reference you can mail me or whatsapp me i will be glad to help you so you can see the details about the application of several uh, statistical aspects done with uh, my colleagues at ihr either in my ihr website or in the google scholar thank you very much i thank the organizers any question you can ask now or later on you can mail me thank you uh, thank you venugopalan sir uh, in your lecture you have covered need for the statistical analysis for management of horticulture genetic resources basic uh, basic measures to assess genetic diversity need for the statistical design in research experiment and selection of best design based on the aim of the experiment advanced experimental design in case of outliers and for the multiple traits and uh, manova also you have suggested to do that balance in complete block design uh, using this augmented block design dial analysis partial uh, dial dial identity and lattice design you have suggested you have uh, given the comparison between the linear and non linear statistical design and uh, stability analysis for the non parametric uh, uh, approaches and big data analysis and uh, blup analysis you have uh, dealt with uh, thank you so much sir for uh, sparing your valuable time for that so there is and, a question uh, there are some uh, questions sir so kindly sir yeah i will read can you suggest easy software to do the augment analysis okay uh, there is one software for statistical package for agriculture research which is coming out from iisri that is the easiest one you can do it or we can do it in spss also sas also or also if you are strong with the programming codes so it doesn't matter spar if you are having the accessibility you can very easily do it and that is the only one question i believe uh, participant uh, kindly see that uh, mcqs uh, uh, in the form of link has been pasted uh, by dr gutam sridhar kindly open it and uh, fill it uh, one minute time has been given so thanks for sir i have one question sir yeah please sir for germplasm um, screening method for any pest or disease uh, which statistical tool is uh, good for the ec for the especially endomology and pathology for which statistical tool is good for the screening of germplasm yeah that is the initial screening of germplasm you mean to say yes 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 uh, sir. suppose if you want to uh, yes, say sir. one uh, new pest to tab absolute it has come so you want ah, to uh, identify a management strategy at the early stage so what you can yes, do sir, is sir. that you can make use yes, of the cluster analysis approach wherein ah, based on the ah, initial sir. evaluation of four or five parameters of tuta absoluta you can identify ah, in which group ah, this four parameters are falling so the defined groups for which management strategies are very strong with the entomologist so that at the early stage itself it can be arrested so this is one uh, i want to suggest cluster analysis you please make use so that initial uh, evaluation itself you can come out with a solution with a few parameters this normally in medical science they are doing it when we, when they get a new disease to human beings okay so that with the existing control measure of the well known disease they can control it i hope i am clear Uh, all the participants are requested to post their question to save the time all the questions will be answered by the respected uh, resource person venugopal so, sir dr sridhar dr sridhar kindly stop it now so any doubt anything you can whatsapp me after this lecture i will be in a position to answer so thank you very much because time is running out Uh, i thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity thank you very much welcome dr anugratha agarwal thank you dr rajshekran four votes are sitting here for you sorry four votes are sitting for you here Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, it's my immense pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Anuradha Agrawal. Ma'am uh, is principal scientist and officer in charge, tissue culture and crop preservation unit at ICR and BPJ in New Delhi. 
Madam, having a more than 32 years of experience in plant tissue culture, cryopreservation research, mapping, managing the in vitro gene bank and cryobank. Ma'am has developed a cost effective in vitro conservation and cryopreservation protocol for medium and long term conservation and vegetatively propagated plant species. Though 18 uh, national and international research project. Ma'am is pioneer in research of cryobanking of Musa germplasm in India. Currently, ma'am is focused on the collection and conservation of crop wild relatives of Musa from biodiversity hotspot in India. Ma'am is also a recipient of Punjab Rao Deshmukh Outstanding, Outstanding Women Scientist Award and Boy Cost Fellowship. Ma'am is a fellow of Indian Society of Plant Genetic Resources and Association of Improvement of Banana and Plantain uh, at, uh, the, from the Tiruchirappalli. Ma'am having a more than 200 papers in her credit. Ma'am has organized several national and international training programs, seminars, symposia as convener, coordinator, and uh, organizing secretary as um, office bearer of the society. Uh, with the, this uh, brief introduction, uh, ma'am, uh, I invite you to deliver a talk on principles, methods, and prospects of in vitro and cryopreservation in horticulture crops. Ma'am, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sharing my slides. Are they visible? Yes, ma'am. But put it on presentation more, ma'am. Yeah, I'm just trying to do that. So good morning to everybody. We are running off, I think, about 40 minutes late. And I hope I don't add to that uh, lateness. Uh, so I'm going to briefly uh, talk about the principal methods and prospects of in vitro conservation and crop preservation of horticultural crops. Uh, respected Dr. Rajshekran, uh, conveners, uh, Rohini, Anushma, Linta, Sridhar, and others who are involved, thank you for giving me this opportunity. And I will just very quickly run through how we are using the in vitro techniques and crab preservation techniques for conservation of germplasm. My predecessors and colleagues from NBPGR have already given a brief introduction of the activities being carried out in our institute. And this lecture, I will particularly focus on use of biotechnology for conservation. And by now, you people are well versed with the importance of conservation, why we need to do it, why, how we are losing germplasm. And there is a need to approach conservation in, in every which way, both in situ as well as ex situ. So you, I'm sure you have already been told repeatedly about the various techniques, uh, both in nature and in the laboratory or under field conditions. And I will just show how we are using tissue culture and crab preservation for conservation of germplasm. In fact, these days, one does not talk of in situ and ex situ exclusively. In, uh, we talk more about uh, in terms of conservation continuum. That means right from the field to the field gene banks, to the laboratory, germplasm, uh, particularly when we are talking about uh, horticultural genetic resources or even plant genetic resources, not the bio, entire biodiversity, which is a very huge and difficult task, but definitely genetic resources, which are of use to humankind for uh, survival, it needs to go in a conservation continuum. So a complementary conservation strategy is what is being perpetuated these days. Coming specifically to the topic uh, assigned to me, uh, we are using both tissue culture and crab preservation as a routine technique for conservation of large number of germplasm, primarily belonging to the horticultural genetic resources. Because as um, my colleague, Dr. Veena might have told you about how wonderfully we are doing seed conservation in most of the field crops, conserving horticultural genetic resources requires that extra effort of applying uh, these techniques in complementation to the field gene bank. Now, I'm sure most of you are familiar with what is plant tissue culture. It's a classical biotechnological technique based on the concept of cellular totipotency. That means every cell of a plant has the potential to convert into a, a plant given the right environment and nutrient conditions. So we can culture different parts of the plant even down to the cells or protoplast on a defined nutrient medium and regenerate a whole plant out of it. All operations of tissue culture, of course, are conducted under aseptic 
and controlled conditions of temperature, light and humidity. And commonly we use the word in vitro techniques because traditionally tissue culture started in uh, these glass test tubes and in vitro denotes those glass test tubes. Now, where are we applying in vitro and cryotechniques is basically, like I said, uh, in horticulture crops, a large number of plants which produce non-orthodox seeds. That means seeds which cannot be dried down to low moisture content and cannot tolerate low temperature. Those are broadly classified as non-orthodox seeds. And in rich literature, you may see it also being uh, defined as recalcitrant seeds or intermediate seeds. So all uh, various groups as seen in the slide, whether we talk of fruit species, tree species, tropical and subtropical species, and a large number of them are economically important. All the root tuber and bulbous crops, which are mostly propagated vegetatively, a few aquatic species, which produce recalcitrant seeds and typical being water chestnut, and perennial grasses require this approach for a uh, for its long-term conservation. Now, medicinal species, some of which produce orthodox seeds but are not conserved in seed gene bank because many a times we do not get the adequate quantity of seeds. Here again, we put them in tissue culture for its conservation. Now, it's, uh, this particular slide gives us the various gamut of activities that are involved in operating an in vitro gene bank or a cryogene bank. Starting from germplasm collection or procurement to its health testing, then whenever we have, wherever which species require in vitro conservation, we need to standardize or optimize the in vitro multiplication protocol. And for crop preservation, we need to understand the seed biology and basic studies before it, a material can be crop preserved. Uh, develop in vitro conservation protocols. Uh, also do uh, genetic stability assessment through various techniques. And once a, a, a gene bank has been created, a routine activity just like seed gene bank is rejuvenation. And I'll just briefly talk about it later while also doing evaluation and utilization of the material. And in our uh, particular organization, we lay a lot of emphasis on human resource development because the entire uh, operations of in vitro gene bank and cryogene bank are skill driven. So human resource development is a regular uh, requirement and activity. Now coming to the actual flow of germplasm for establishment of uh, in vitro gene bank or cryogene bank, as might have been explained earlier, we uh, need to get material from authentic sources, which are well defined in terms of passport data and characterization data, preferably. And also, if we are importing it from outside, it needs to undergo the routine health quarantine uh, procedures. And we always, of course, look for disease-free material to start any uh, material for in vitro or cryogene bank. So there are two broad categories of material we handle. We handle seeds or vegetative propagules. And in most of the horticultural economically important species, it's the vegetative propagule, which is more important. Uh, whereas seeds is done for gene pool conservation. And uh, of course, in case of large number of tree species, uh, where tissue culture is still not optimized. Then uh, once cultures are initiated, information has to be shared, as Dr. Sunil Lachak said. The informatics part is simultaneously taken care. And uh, wherever uh, seeds are handled, we have to process it sim similar to seed gene bank, bring down the moisture, see how it can be frozen and put it uh, in the cryogene bank. And the tissue culture material, that means the vegetative material, goes into the in vitro gene bank. And both the gene banks are uh, also tested, the material conserved for genetic stability and uh, sometimes rejuvenation. And both the gene banks are often used for distribution of material. Now, there are two terms which you should be familiar with, in vitro active gene bank and in vitro base gene bank. So this is as per the gene bank standards of the FAO uh, that was initially defined in 1994 and revised in 2010 or something. And uh, in vitro active gene bank comprises collections of accessions, 
which are immediately available for multiplication, distribution, and use. And these are normally in the form of live tissue cultures and uh, which are kept in culture room conditions, either at normal temperature or at low temperature. And the in vitro based gene bank means the material which has been started from tissue culture and then shifted to a cryogene bank. So that is for long-term con uh, conservation under liquid nitrogen. So this is a term just to make you familiar. Coming back to the in vitro gene bank, uh, again, uh, I have already mentioned how we start to it. So this is just outlining the basic principles. I'm not going into the details of individual techniques because of uh, shortage of time. So we need to get material from a uh, well-identified source with correct taxonomy and essentially passport information. Otherwise, conservation has no meaning. And explants, starting a tissue culture can happen from whole plants, from part of the shoot, root, leaf, vegetative propagule, even uh, fruits and seeds in the rare cases of floral buds. And uh, this will depend on the species, the objective of the conservation, and what is the ultimate aim of our conservation program. And I've already mentioned about the health requirement, whether in terms of quarantine or uh, seed health testing. Uh, prior to introduction of material in the in vitro gene bank or cryogene bank, we would like to ensure that it is a disease-free material. And culture establishment starts typically with surface sterilization techniques, also for checking for endophytic bacterial contamination, which are a big problem in in vitro gene banks. Uh, techniques, of course, employed as per changing techniques. So now we use PCR-based techniques for, to look for some of these, even electron microscopy. And uh, once we show, especially in tissue culture, we need to make sure that material remains virus free because bacteria and fungus normally take, get taken care of by surface sterilization, but viruses can escape that. So once we have a tissue culture in place, then we move on to developing actual in vitro conservation protocol. Now, you might be knowing historically, tissue culture was developed as a technique for rapid multiplication of plant material. So the entire micropropagation industry, commercial tissue culture is based on the uh, usefulness of the technique for rapid multiplication. But when we are using tissue culture for in vitro conservation, we do the reverse. We like to slow down the growth of the cultures. And this can be done by many techniques as has been listed in the slide. So we can adopt physical methods, chemical methods to change the growth of the plant in tissue culture. So simply by placing tissue cultures under low temperature or low light, or reducing the nutrient content, or even the oxygen level that is available to the plants in tissue culture, changes in the osmotica of the medium, or modification of the gaseous environment, physically we can reduce the growth of the plants, and then the tissue culture stays in the culture for a longer period of time. So normally, uh, when we are doing uh, normal tissue culture, uh, culture will stay up to two, th to three months after which the material gets exhausted and needs to be subcultured. By introducing these factors, the subculture duration increases up to say six months or 12 months, and in some techniques, even up to three years. So our uh, research is basically oriented in combining these methods so that we can optimally increase the shelf life of the cultures without affecting the uh, stability of the plant as well as the uh, genetic constitution of the plant. So how do we strategize which uh, method to adopt? We look at whether the technique that we have standardized is easy. That means we can pass it on to the routine technicians who are doing the job to, uh, to maintain the cultures. Then all the cultures after storage show high viability. The technique is uh, 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 applicable to a large number of genotypes because when we are doing in vitro conservation, we need to handle different genotypes. And that uh, sometimes tissue culture techniques are very species specific or genotype specific. So we look for methods which are broadly applicable. There is no soma clonal variation because tissue culture uh, has one of the biggest hazards as soma clonal variation, technically less demanding, and most importantly, it is cost-effective. 
because uh, see uh, uh, for instance uh, in india we have been maintaining in vitro gene ba gene bank both at nbpgr and ihr for almost 35 years now so the long term running cost is very high and there, therefore the techniques that we develop need to be cost effective having done the in vitro conservation uh, there are also it is prudent to say that there are limitations so while we have applied a lot a large number of techniques as shown over here you know we use mineral oil overlay to reduce culture growth or store them at low temperature as in case of mentha or we add osmotica like mannitol as in the case of camphoria or sometimes even adding a, a different plant growth regulators like aba uh, it helps in the shelf life of the cultures having done this we have also realized that there are certain limitations uh the biggest being contamination and loss of cultures lo uh, loss of regeneration capacity over a long period of time and sometimes uh, if we keep the cultures for very long in tissue culture they start showing abnormal growth and this particular method is only available for short to medium term conservation that means maximum up to one year normally in very rare cases it will go up to two years and again i have already mentioned it is skill driven so therefore it has been realized that most of this material we need to put under long term conservation and cryo preservation comes as the best option for long term conservation of horticultural genetic resources specifically what we are doing here is storing germplasm under the suspended uh, uh, growth using liquid nitrogen liquid nitrogen has a boiling temperature of minus 196 degrees celsius and by carefully manipulating the material we can easily store the material under low temperature and uh, once it goes into low, low temperature theoretically we believe we can store it for a long period of time uh, practically we have data up to 50 years no, there is no loss in viability but theoretically it is projected to go up to even 1000 years so we overcome all the difficulties of tissue culture conservation and the only limitation right now is the technique is not applied to a large number of crops we are still in the stages of development so we are in crop preservation what we were in tissue culture say uh, 20 to 30 years ago when it was still under development today routine tissue culture is uh, i mean tissue culture is routinely used in large number of species so in crop preservation we are in the stages of development and hopefully within a decade or so it will become a routine exercise for most of the plant species that need to be conserved now basic principle of crop preservation is very simple whenever we expose a biological material to low temperature as in the case of liquid nitrogen it results in freezing of water in the cells which results in concentration of the solutes that are dissolved in the re remaining liquid phase further the water converts into ice and ice crystals cause freezing injury by mechanical action and also due to the phase change of the cells so both these put together cause cell death now how to overcome this in crop preservation what we target is to dehydrate the highly hydrated cells while also avoiding the ice crystal formation and how this can be done is by two principles freeze dehydration or vitrification now vitrification is a physical phenomena as well as the name of a technique so please don't get confused vitrification enables hydrated living cells to be cooled to cryogenic temperatures in the absence of ice through the phenomena of amorphous glass formation so this is a physics so if you remember school physics uh, the amorphous state where the ice crystal structure is not formed but a glassy state is formed is what we aim at all crop preservation protocols and how we do this is by uh, uh in in large number of cases by use of what are known as cryoprotectants cryoprotectants are chemicals that increase the total concentration of the solute reduce the ice formation and they also lower the freezing point increase the viscosity of the cells and thus prevent damage to the cells but to be biologically acceptable they need to have low toxicity and uh, over the years a large number of cryoprotectants have been uh, identified commonly used ones are listed here like glycerol 
dimethyl sulfoxide, ethylene glycol, uh, sucrose, etc. And normally we use, use, use them as a cocktail. Some of them are penetrating and some of them are non-penetrating. So uh, coming to the techniques per se, there are two broad categories, I all, as I already mentioned, classical and new techniques. The classical techniques are freeze-induced dehydration. That means we process the material in such a way that ice crystals are formed outside the cell and the cell per se undergoes uh, uh, osmotic uh, changes and gets dehydrated. And then it, when we cool it to minus 196, there is no ice crystal formation within the cell. So there is no injury. And uh, this requires controlled freezing unit uh, to carry out the crab preservation. Whereas the new techniques um, based on crab, use of crab protection. And this particular slide shows the large number of techniques now that are available. The most commonly used ones now are the droplet vitrification technique and the V plate and D cryo uh, plate method, which I will just show you very quickly. But these are the uh, different techniques that are available since the last three decades. And I'll just briefly show you how it works. Before that, what are the explants we can crab preserve? So today we can crab preserve a large number of explants, whole seeds, dormant buds, shoot tips from, uh, from in vitro material, embryos or embryonic axis, cell suspension, somatic embryos, and pollen. So depending on what material is available with you and what is your requirement after conservation, you can use any of these for crab preservation. Now this, uh, the next few slides will show diagrammatically or photographically how exactly the cycle for conservation, crab preservation occurs. We start with in vitro cultures, remove shoot tips, uh, and this is the most critical step in any crab preservation protocol. How you take out the explant, especially from the in vitro material. Then after identifying the suitable explant, it is made to undergo dehydration using chemicals and then it is subjected to a pre-culture medium. Uh, okay, this slide shows only shoot tip isolation. <sighs> Similarly, we can do shoot tip isolation from field material also. And uh, garlic is a best example in that. So in garlic, there is no requirement of tissue culture. Directly from the bulbs, we can remove the shoot tips sub and use them directly for crab preservation. And like I mentioned, uh, the latest technique that is widely used for cryobanking is droplet vitrification. It was initially developed in potato, but now it is applicable to most of the horticultural species that are being cryobanked. So after isolation, typically uh, they are subjected to loading solution that is sucrose and glycerol for a, a few minutes. And this is the cryoprotectant mixture. The most widely used crab protectant mixture, mixture is the plant vitrification solution 2. And what it does is dehydrate the tissue, after which they are placed on uh, cryo vials and the explants are placed on this. This is a very thick and viscous solution. So they can hold the explants and then they are put in the liquid nitrogen held in a cryo box, transferred to a cryo bank. And for recovery, we take out the cryo vial with the uh, aluminum sheet holding the explant, put them in a recovery solution and then transfer it to a recovery growth medium and we get back the whole plants. So now this is practically possible and feasible in a large number of uh, horticultural crops. And now my slide is not moving. So similarly, we have applied uh, this kind of technique in crops like banana, uh, dahlia, gladiolus, all the garlics and other alien species. And uh, the slide is stuck somehow. Anyway, right. So this is another technique where we use sodium alginate to make these synthetic beads. And this can also be helping in crab preservation. The beads act as an artificial seed. This can be desiccated down to a low moisture content without killing the shoot tips. And these can be easily cryopreserved. 
the encapsulation vitrification is a combination of encapsulation dehydration and simple vitrification where the encapsulated beads are subjected to the cryoprotectants and then cryopreserved. The latest method being used, uh, especially in the Japan group, is uh, V-cryoplate. And here, instead of the aluminum foil, these are uh, designed, uh, specially designed cryoplates with grooves in them where the explant and the vitrification solution is placed. And you can use it either directly as vitrification, uh, which is the V-cryoplate, vitrification cryoplate method, or you can encapsulate it with sodium alginate which is the uh, decryoplate method from encapsulation dehydration. So uh, this is basically to give you an idea how we do the preservation. Mm -hmm. Now we uh, also use uh, seeds for conservation of material. Of course, most horticulturists challenge us why we are using seeds, but it is done in species where we are, need to do gene pool conservation, not necessarily genotype conservation. And uh, this can be this for this to be done, we need to uh, do seed storage studies before its crab preservation. So we need to understand the seed biology and how it can be desiccated, just like in the seed gene bank. And here we are dealing with non orthodox seeds. So mostly they are desiccation sensitive. So if their moisture content is reduced below, say, 12% moisture content they will tend to die and uh, you know not remain viable in under conservation so depending on the biology of the seed the nature of the seed the species we will determine whether the whole seed or its isolated embryo or embryonic axis uh, needs to be preserved now wherever we are unsuccessful in uh, seed we also do dormant bud crab preservation and of course shoot tips from in vitro raised plants that I've already explained. So this particular slide shows exactly how we do uh, determination of the seed storage behavior, whether it's orthodox, intermediate or recalcitrant. And I'm not going into the detail because of time. And uh, just to show you a slide that, you know, uh, whenever we are dealing with non-orthodox seeds, we need to check at each step how the seed germinates after desiccation, what is its viability after liquid nitrogen treatment and determine various factors of how much desiccation and moisture content of a particular seed is required before it can be cryo, uh, cryo banked. So unlike seed gene bank, where there is a standard that, okay, you dehydrate the seed between five to seven moisture content and store it. Here, it has to be individually determined for each species before it can go into cryo banking. Not only the moisture content, whether whole seed or embryo or embryonic axis needs to be cryo preserved. So that is the research required. And over the years, we have determined, you know, which species require embryonic axis, which need to be conserved as embryos, and in uh, which cases we have to go for dormant bud cryo preservation. Polar cryo preservation, Dr. Raj Shekran has explained in detail, so I will not go into detail. And this is just a slide to show how we do dormant bud cryo preservation. Basically, bud, wood, bud sticks are used and uh, which have been exposed to low, low temperature in nature. And these can be desiccated and preserved and used for regeneration using either tissue culture or through direct grafting in the field. Now, any gene bank operation has to keep in mind the aspect of genetic integrity. Wherever we are conserving gene or gene complexes, uh, like we do in in vitro gene bank, sorry, in the seed gene bank, we need to show there is no genetic drift. And whenever we are doing genotype conservation, as we do in in vitro gene bank, again, there should be no somaclonal variation. So this is an important aspect for any in vitro gene bank. And international be best practices also recommend that all gene bank curators make sure that the original genetic identity of the material is maintain. A large number of you must be also working off uh, with collections in the field gene bank. This applies to field gene bank also. You know, the conservation, the method you adopt for collecting your material and conserving it should ensure that there is no genetic drift or rift. So uh, there are a large number of factors which cause uh, genetic changes, uh, you know, unintentional selection, genetic drift, 
contamination. I, in field gene bank, uh, often you will get contamination, cross contamination, sometimes seed contamination while handling. And practically, we find that mislabeling is also another problem, which causes uh, genetic change makeup in gene banks. But particularly when we're talk talking of horticultural genetic resources, which are clonally propagated, uh, sometimes, you know, chimeras show up in tissue culture, then it becomes a variant. Uh, there are transient variations due to the stress of tissue culture. And both genetic and epigenetic changes need to be monitored when conserving uh, any material. So using all different methods, morphological, molecular, biochemical, cytological, and or a combination of these, Routinely, we need to assess the genetic stability of the material being conserved. So I would like to summarize uh, my talk by asking you to look into this paper, which beautifully explains uh, by uh, Dr. Bart Panis and his group, the complementarity between the various gene banks. How we need to complement uh, between in vitro gene bank, field gene bank, and cryo bank. What are the advantages and disadvantages? Already many speakers have spoken about it. So for instance, in field gene bank, you can do direct characterization and evaluation, which is not possible in the cryogene bank. But cryogene bank offers safety from you know, floods and insects and diseases, which is not possible in the field gene bank. So every technique has its importance. And we now perpetuate that we should have complementarity which acts as a safety uh, mechanism as well as a safety duplicate. So uh, as horticulturists and people dealing with various horticultural genetic resources, it would be my humble submission to you to always look for complementarity. Even in simple terms, like having two field gene banks in two different locations. So that material does not get lost due to many factors. So, uh, since we have this gene bank in uh, NBPGR, it is my uh, pleasure to inform you the material that we are holding since the last more than three decades. Under in vitro con con uh, conservation, we have more than 1,927 accessions uh, currently held from different crop groups, as can be seen here. Uh, we are holding this material in the form of nearly 40,000 active cultures, I mean, tissue cultures, uh, belonging to 54 genera and 150 species. And uh, you're all welcome to come and visit us uh, as soon as possible. A uh, large number of material has gone from tissue culture into the cryogene bank. Uh, so more than 200 accessions already. And the cryogene bank, where we are storing both non-orthodox seeds and orthodox seeds, uh, this is uh, more than 12,000 accessions of 825 species that is currently under in vitro conservation. And in this, we have very good collections of crops like citrus, banana, black pepper, almond, neem. And we would like to have, do handholding with some of you to help us in expanding this base collection by sharing your material with us and probably going for a joint uh, uh, collection and conservation of important genetic resources that might be in your uh, custody or you're handling them. And uh, as Dr. Sunil has already mentioned, we have a cryo database. You can go to the NBPGR portal and look up the details. And most of the work we do is in a collaborative mode because uh, horticultural genetic resources is the domain that you people are working with. Uh, and we like to go in partnership mode. This particular slides show some of the examples we have been recently collaborating with, but like I said, all of you are welcome to come and join us in uh, providing you uh, training or uh, helping you conserve the material or collecting the material. And for this course, Dr. Rajshikran, I would see, uh, uh, re request you that you please share these two documents to all the participants to read, which gives the basics of management of genetic resources. This is the NBPGR publication and also the International Gene Bank Standards uh, of AO, so that we know how exactly scientifically we need to manage the material and conserve the material. A few of the recent publications from my unit, uh, Tissue Culture and Crab Preservation Unit. Again, you can go to or uh, visit our website and get uh, details for all. 
And finally, to say that uh, we provide uh, training for in vitro conservation and crab preservation. We were routinely doing it in the form of international training, but due to the pandemic, that has taken a break. But any one of you willing to, wanting to come and take specialized training are most welcome. So thank you very much. I hope I have not exceeded the time. Uh, I thank all the organizers for giving the opportunity and I spoke fast so that we can have a more of an interaction rather than a theory. Thank you very much. <sighs>
Uh, thank and you I... for uh, your uh, compliments. Uh, the compliments are taking uh, us to you know new heights, and uh, <laughs> all the uh, you know the resource persons uh, like you have contributed towards the success of this training program. I think yeah. you know. So, do you plan to bring bring out any? Uh, yeah, we. Uh, we uh, one e company may already have it and I will share with you. Okay. Yeah. Sridhar, can you put it on the screen? Yeah, you can see the and other you can see the response from the participants, uh, how well uh, they have taken your lecture. Which color shows the correct answer, Sridhar? Okay, maybe because yeah. I gave the quiz, I forgot to cover it in my lecture. <laughs> it's okay. Because actually the time was too short and the topic was very wide. So, the so I really... is, uh, we want to cover a lot of ground. That's why uh, yes. we would have yes. given one, one hour. It would have been uh, great. Yeah. yeah. Next time we'll do like that. And uh, yeah. uh, thanks once again for coming online and uh, inspiring all of us and uh, My pleasure. Uh, yeah uh, we will be thank you and all the best yeah <laughs> let you win the ispgr election also i want that you should uh, steer us uh, in the coming so years please also. vote and support you, you yeah you, we, you, we are, uh, i have already yeah. communicated uh, to all of us uh, all, all our uh, members here yeah so yeah you, you would have got the ballots by now no, so far I have not got it. I think it will be uh, that's coming. Because you're sitting here. So thank you very much uh, once again. Uh, thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Doctor, I'm not. It's my immense pleasure to introduce uh, Doctor Ramnath Rao, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, sir. Sir, I am sharing the slide. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, while share the slides come on. Uh, good morning, all trainees. Almost good afternoon. Uh, had some issues of projecting it from my laptop, so Dr. Rajshekran is trying to put them on. In the meantime, let me introduce, sir. Sir, uh, yeah, worked please on, go ahead. Sir worked on uh, groundnut genetic resources at ECRISAT Hyderabad. Worked at uh, International Board for uh, Plant Genetic Resources, now Biodiversity International, from uh, 1989 to 2017 in Rome three years, Italy, uh, Singapore, five years, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, 10 years. Uh, sir was honorary research fellow with the Biodiversity International from 2008 to 2014. Sir also worked mainly on uh, genetic diversity, conservation and use of tropical fruits, underutilized crops, forest genetic resources, ex situ and in situ conservation. Sir helped in uh, establishing the national plant genetic resource program in several countries in Asia. He has experience in developing pro proposals, funding generation, and monitoring and evaluation of projects. Sir has authored uh, and uh, co-authored over 350 publications. Thank you, sir. Sir, I request you to have a talk on horticulture, genetic resource conservation, priorities, techniques, challenges, and achievements. Um, Thank you for that in introduction. and. Uh... As that the, as you can see that you know, I have not been an active bench scientist for a long time, but uh, more in terms of project proposal development and fund generation and uh, trying to help people to establish their plant genetic resources programs. Uh, I think you can go you know 
you have to move on with the slides. Somebody there, yeah. <coughs> I, I think you would have heard most of uh, during the week, you must have heard a lot about horticultural, horticulture and its production improvement and why the genetic resources are important and all that. And I think we'll skip this in, in, in initial issues because I was supposed to have talked on the day one, but uh, uh, the, these things would have become a little uh, already superseded by other lectures. So let us move again to the next slide. Uh, you must have heard a lot about you know, collecting, conservation, storage. Just now we heard that Dr. Anuradha giving us the intricacies of uh, in vitro and cryopreservation, etc. Uh, I have given here, hopefully you will get this uh, uh, presentation copies later on, or you may have, have, have it already. I'll try to put in here a few publications which are freely available on the web, or you may have to approach a few people to get them. And uh, quite a lot of the, my, what I'm going to say in next 20 minutes or so is based on uh, what, is, what is found in these publications. As you can see, uh, they are most of them are either 2020 or 2021. So, but look here, I must say that almost all the efforts so far done globally even have been focused on ex situ conservation. I think it is, you know, if you have heard Dr. Parola talking on the day one in his introductory remarks, uh, you would have seen that you mentioned that the little work has been done on ex situ conservation. And uh, I think it is time to move on to see how much in-situ conservation we can actually do. So I will be focusing a little bit more on that in this presentation. So next, please. So the rest of the presentation, I will be focusing mainly on challenges, what can be done, because I think you have heard enough about what, what needs to, what has been done and uh, how well people have I've done everything, etc. But I will focus mainly uh, being you know, on uh, challenges and uh, things that we may be able to do to overcome some of these issues. Uh, if you look around, you know, with the public, the both plant genetic resources, especially the emphasis on uh, wild and underutilized crop species, becoming more important. The taxonomy becomes very important unless you know what the plant is and uh, how it's going to behave in nature and under cultivation, you may not, you may not be able to use it. So we have to improve our uh, efficiency effects, you know, the uh, taxonomic expertise quite a bit. And uh, accepting a few gene banks, probably including our own uh, in Delhi, uh, a lot of them are, uh, you know, the practices in them are not very, uh, congruent to with their objectives. You know, each one is doing their own work and very little coordination goes on and also very little connection with the users. And this needs to be improved upon. Like that, I have given here a list you know, for uh, um, exploration and collecting. But the, one of the most important things that uh, has been lacking in most collections is finding out the gaps. You know, uh, and uh, ability to use uh, the collecting activities to identify sites that can be utilized for in-situ conservation. So these two objectives need to be part of any exploration effect, effort uh, that may be done in the future. Next, please. So, the, that's you know, a little bit about you know, collecting and exploration. And then the conservation, I'm giving again here the priority for in situ and on farm conservation. I don't know how much, uh, because I haven't been following the presentations, I don't know how much people have talked to you about it. Uh, the expertise on in situ and on farm conservation is pretty lacking in most of the conservation programs. This needs to be drastically improved if you want to really make any progress in it. And this requires quite a bit of uh, you know, rethinking and how can we interact effectively 
both with the farmers as well as the indigenous communities who actually use uh, anything that is there in the wild. So these are, I see this as one of the main uh, mental block. Many of us as researchers have it, unless we overcome that particular thing and come up with, uh, you know, work very closely with uh, farmers and involved with them, uh, you know, and the activities should become a part of just the uh, regular farming activities. You know, they, you cannot superimpose really much on what already farmers, uh, for example, India has more than 86,000 million uh, small farmers. Anything that you may add on to their daily activity becomes a, a big headache for them. This needs to be avoided. And that can be done only if we can interact and work with them. And uh, what are their actual concerns? I don't know, uh, unless you provide you know, some solution to their daily uh, questions. And they're not really interested in carrying, doing anything more than what they have already been doing. It becomes their main issue, and uh, it's been demonstrated amply. You know, most of us researchers go in there and try to, yes, my internet connection is a little bit unstable. I get a note here. So if you can't hear, you know, a couple of uh, times, you know, you have to excuse me. <coughs> and uh, we go with a preconceived notion to the field, you know, and we give very little importance to what the farmers themselves think about the diversity. A lot of farmers, you know, the more recent studies are coming up, throwing up the, uh, evidence that a lot of farmers know their, about their material very well, why they cultivate particular variety in a particular field and all that. Uh, this kind of information becomes necessary to be collected and conserved and used in any, in any institute conservation program. Next, please. So, and we also have to demonstrate a little bit how this uh, uh, conservation is going to help not only the farmer, because any institute conservation effort is going to improve the, what you call, uh, ecosystem services, you know, such as water regulation, and the uh, fruit with uh, fruit species, pharmacological resources, and million, we consider medicinal plant species and pollination species, you know, by promoting bees, etc. And you know how important pollination is for crop production. Uh, if you imagine, you know, for a while, uh, the several of the medicinal plants, ornamental plants are not around attracting bees in and around your farm, especially of uh, uh, what you call uh, cross-pollinated species, and of the yield losses will be pretty significant. It's been recently demonstrated very well. So, it, and you need, we need to understand that it's a, a context specific. You, know, you, you can't go, you know, I'm going to conserve the variety on this particular farmer's field and of our eternity. You know, that's not going to have work like that you will have to determine the context where a certain thing is feasible or not, and then only go forward here. And uh, very few people understand, you know, the home gardens are important. That's why some of the urban gardens or urban uh, terrace gardens are also becoming important in terms of uh, larger biodiversity conservation, uh, let alone uh, plant genetic resources of crops. So, but at the end of the day, everything is possible only when there are enough resources. And uh, for, as, I was, as I said earlier, the most of the resources that are given to plant generic resources go to uh, exit to conservation. This needs to be really balanced somehow. And here where the policy makers come, become very important. Next, please. So then exit to conservation, and uh, we have seen, we would have seen a lot of people talking about how you can conserve them in the uh, in seed banks, field gene banks, especially field gene banks for horticulture, many of the horticultural resources, 
clonal repositories, in vitro, gene bank, colon bank, cryo bank, etc. I actually sent a uh, question to Anuradha asking whether in vitro uh, conservation, can, in vitro culture can be treated as a conservation effort at all because it, in my point of view, it is not. So it, one might be dropping that particular concept quite uh, in the near future. So there are, I think I'm sure you have heard about the problems with field gene banks again. I don't want to repeat most of them. They are here on the screen for you to see. Only thing I would like to uh, uh, emphasize is very few of us, at least in my uh, trips and tours to various gene banks, very few gene banks really follow appropriate regeneration protocols. Uh, Anuradha also has emphasized about the need for conserving genotypic uh, as well as uh, uh, genetic diversity and the integrity of the accessional concern. I expect for cross pollination crops with, uh, without appropriate regeneration protocols, there is hardly anything that you can conserve for more than 10 years, uh, I mean, more than five uh, regenerations done during its lifetime. Next, please. Then you have the seed gene banks. I'm sure you would have heard a lot about seed gene banks. And um, quite a lot, I mean, uh, they're probably not very bad because uh, most effective seed conservation protocols and guidelines, both by national gene banks, as well as the FAO, IBPGR, BioSpeed, national, et cetera, guidelines are available. And one can fairly easily manage uh, cold storage. But uh, one of the problems uh, I have seen that's happening in many of the gene banks because they tend to be very large very soon. And many of the gene bank uh, procedures are never really recorded and uh, systematized. There comes your problem, you know, and uh, the monitoring of viability, et cetera, is also not done very systematically, you know. Many people advocate random sampling and all that, but I'm not very sure that it's going to work in the long term, especially if you are thinking of using seed gene banks for 100 years to store your seeds. And in a short term, probably the current way people are dealing with it might help, but for the longer term, you have to develop you know, the, both your information systems as well as the cost effectiveness of the gene bank because uh, costs are going to be enormous as the number of actions increase as your availability testing and monitoring uh, schedules come into picture, the costs are going to go up and policy makers will be just coming in your way. And, and uh, any such increases are only possible if there is enough uh, public to understand and support you. So public awareness becomes very important as well. Next, please. So in vitro storage, we just heard about it. And um, I, I really do not believe that uh, anybody can store in in vitro for more than one year, or maybe a couple of years for some specific uh, materials. But uh, even during that, if there is uh, one or two uh, regeneration, rejuvenation is possible, you know, it will be all muddy, I would say. And it's not strictly a conservation method. It is mainly a stepping stone to cryopreservation or but of regeneration after cryopreservation. Because if you conserve only at a, in a cryogen bank, you have to take it out and again produce a plant out of it. So, it, that's uh, that's where in vitro uh, methods come into play as well. So let's not spend too much of time on it. Move on, please. Next. So cryo banks, we heard a lot just now. And uh, some of the challenges uh, have seen visiting some of the uh, gene banks. 
uh, I'm not referring to here to NPPGR, which is fairly well established and doing a pretty good job. But um, as you might have seen, the number of uh, species and accessions. You know, when you compare to the amount of germplasm that needs to be conserved effectively, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a little more difficult uh, now using the uh, current technologies. Uh, now, several species, you know, if you look at it, uh, you need uh, regeneration protocols of the time, rewarming, et cetera. There are, uh, uh, the moment solutions are not available and research and survival of cells and tissues after cryopreservation become essential because uh, any loss in whatever you are conserving, you know, will lead to genetic drift and genetic inversion later on if all cells are not coming into picture. Special consideration must be given to certain species that cannot be used conserving any other protocols. Now, there are several species, uh, may not be many in India, but in other countries, there are several species where you cannot either use seed or field in bank or other methods and can only go for long term in uh, cold, you know, ultra cold storage. And for this, you, you have to give priority for such species. And uh, uh, there are uh, if you look into the literature, there are hundreds of uh, procedures that are being thrown out uh, from many different labs around the world. But uh, only a few of them actually work across the laboratories. It's, you know, if you remember uh, RFED markers in the beginning, which used to work very well in one lab, but uh, used to fail in another lab, but you know, it's something like this. Huh? A, a, a small change in the protocol, a small bit of contamination somewhere would vitiate any protocol that has been developed and uh, new problems. So the standardization and uh, moving of protocols from one lab to other is, has not yet become very routine and uh, this needs to be redressed. And many critical factors such as quality, type of plant materials, etc., you know, they require uh, attention. I'm sure many labs, including our own in Delhi, is looking into it. And, and in many countries, you know, the adequate facilities and trained personnel are not needed. We are always told that liquid nitrogen is very easy to get. You dump tissue in it and you have preservation. Yes, you have preserved it, but how the hell you are going to take them out and making them into plants, that's going to be a big question for many smaller and uh, less active countries and laboratories. So this needs to be addressed. Next, please. Next. So these are you know, some of the constraints that are common to our system. Lack of interaction between gene banks and farmers. Uh, we've already seen that. And uh, here there is a, uh, uh, another one which I have forgotten to write it down is uh, most of our uh, horticultural uh, researchers think in terms of genotypes, but, but uh, especially for vegetatively propagated and clonally propagated species, but however, if you are talking in terms of uh, plant genetic resources, you've got to talk in terms of uh, uh, genetic diversity. There's no way uh, to exclude genetic diversity from the equation. You've got to do that. And that brings in quite a number of uh, uh, challenges. And those challenges need to be met head on if we want to really make a lot of, as much progress as the field crops have made. It's very easy to say that, you know, I'm looking for a, a light material. Um, if I get a clone, I can develop a variety, but that's not the end of the day. You know, if you're talking in terms of contributing to the larger biodiversity, you've got to go for genetic diversity. And uh, that, that's, I forgot to mention it here. And, uh, and it starts not just at the level of conservation, but from the exploration collecting onwards too conservation. So I just wanted to highlight that. 
and the difficulties in using modern tools and managing using conserved germ plasma. Uh, Nurada is lucky that she has a lab where everyone is very well trained and uh, routinely many jobs are uh, done, but uh, many other laboratories around the globe are not as well equipped as this one. And uh, they are not, the protocols are not very streamlined. And, uh, they don't really work as, as uh, nicely as they should. Uh, the, the regeneration protocols, I just want to emphasize again, and uh, this applies to all systems, not just to one. No, and this again, as mentioned earlier by the earlier speaker, no single method can help us to conserve all the genetic diversity present in any particular, any crop species. We have to use species. Okay. Uh, people, I mean, she did talk about continuum of conservation, but uh, there is always a need to make definitive uh, uh, lines between the systems so that you know exactly where one particular material does well rather than the other, so that you can use the appropriate protocol then thinking continuously on a continuum basis. So the complementarity needs to be appreciated and make sure uh, that duplication of the collections are maintained at least minimum two different locations. Uh, this particular um, picture on the right side of the slide, you have already seen in a larger picture, which uh, Anuradha explained very nicely. It uh, helps us to think in terms of uh, the not only complementarity, uh, but also about definitive protocols for particular species. So we need to and I'll bridge the gap between the two and uh, make a conservation decision. Now, any decision we make depends on several in, on the context and the availability of the resources, not just financial, but also human. Next, please. <coughs> so why do we conserve? We conserve mainly, we can, keep the genetic diversity and species diversity going forward into the future, as well as we can use it uh, you know, for improving uh, our uh, yields and other quality and so many other aspects. And utilization is the main driver. You know? uh, the, there are some problems because uh, quite often, especially when we are working at the top of the uh, pyramid, uh, we hardly consider about the what the poor farmers want. We we develop something, we try to pass it on. We even the government comes up with several uh, subsidies and efforts to promote high yielding variety, high productive variety, and all that in all conditions and etc. But uh, many poor farmers will not be able to implement that because of the lack of resources. The lack of resources needs to taking on all the kinds of subsidies, loans, and etc., and that vicious circle continues. So this is where actually we need to change our outlook, and we will have to develop the kind of material that any farmer can grow under his or her conditions and get a, a, a get a good uh, livelihood out of it. It is not that I want you to grow this particular uh, variety and help the uh, nation to survive, but first you survive and then think about the nation. That's my contention. Maybe I am wrong. And uh, most conserved accessions are yet to be characterized and developed. We, we, most often we come across gene bank curators talking about hundreds and thousands of uh, accessions they are conserving, but uh, hardly any of them are used. And people talk about poor collections and all that, but at the end of the day, yes, genetic diversity can be represented in a particular uh, limited number of uh, accessions, but at, at the same time, how that will express in a definitive genomic background, then no, no one really knows unless one tests it out. Of course, in the future with the gene editing and all that, we may not need uh, as much germplasm as we have, that's what some people think, but uh, 
uh, being a little bit uh, backward looking, I think I, 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 we should take you know, careful steps here. Uh, next, you no know, improved you know, support for the long term we are absolutely essential. And cost effectiveness, you know, at the end of the day, a policymaker is not going to give all the money that you want to ask. And you know, you've got to show them that you are doing a better good job with uh, uh, fewer funds, and but you need a little more to improve upon on that as well. So please keep that in mind. Next, please. Uh, forget about it, we'll just move on to the next. There are uh, quite a lot of here, which uh, I'm sure you would have heard. So just I want to, you know, in the, on the uh, inaugural day, I just mentioned the three major uh, meetings that uh, happened in last couple of months. Uh, that's the environmental um, on the uh, climate change, on the biodiversity and on agrobiodiversity. Three meetings, global meetings were held. In the context of climate change is going to be all pervading and overarching. And it's going to change the way we talk. We need to change the way we look at things as uh, climate changes. So, so yeah, I have lifted a few points here, how uh, this kind of climate change can affect uh, our future agriculture. Uh, when I say agriculture, it includes horticulture and horticulture is more so because uh, uh, it has got definitive vegetative reproductive presence uh, compared to many other field crops which are important. And uh, this is going to change quite a bit and uh, the horticultural research, the researchers need to change you know, the way they think, uh, how they characterize, evaluate their term problem for uh, uh, these purposes. And uh, just uh, uh, no, saying that, for example, if you are working on drought tolerant species, just saying that I'm focusing on future is not going to help because uh, the drought tolerance at this point of time, and uh, the definition of it is going to be very different from the 10 to 15 years hence. So you have to look at two different perspectives and uh, have thrown out here, I, if these are not definitive, but these are only things that may happen. And you'll have to look into these carefully to your own situation and see how you can focus. But whatever it is, at the end of the day, diverse genetic resources, including those of horticulture, can, uh, can play an important role in uh, combating uh, climate change and biodiversity loss as well. Next, please. So again, a few more examples uh, on uh, climate change. I suggest you know you try to get hold of these two uh, papers I listed here: Snyder, uh, 2017, and also the uh, very simple but uh, very effective review of in Indian agricultural sciences as well, which uh, which is very relevant to, from Indian perspective. You know, I think it is by Dr. Malhotra or somebody you know. For, uh, uh, commissioner of Agriculture, or somebody very, very clearly given uh, what might happen in the future. Next, please. Yeah, this is uh, now what I was trying to say earlier: the human dimension. You know, at the end, you may have systems, you may have uh, technologies, whatever it is. Uh, unless we are uh, right people to implement with the right background and uh, expertise and training. Uh, those uh, things have a very little value. And as I said, the conservation, uh, into the conservation is going to be very important in the future. And we have to think more in terms of uh, people who grow these crops. And so what do you expect in terms of human dimension if you want to improve upon what we are doing already? What we are doing already is probably good, but uh, Anything can be improved and it can be better and only the best will be useful in the future. So we need a general understanding that farming community and consumers of agricultural produce need to benefit from all our efforts. You know, if what we are doing is not going to help either farmers or consumers, but only for businessmen, then we are in trouble. 
need refers to the sustainable the you know, sustainable has been mis very well misused the uh, word in the world sustainable is if you take out something in the environment try to see and that you take out minimum uh, and if possible put it back as much as you can that's a simple definition for me and if i can do that uh, using the present technologies or future technologies i will be very happy to continue what i am doing next please and then the scientific and technical personnel, uh, we have to be competent, uh, not just as scientists, but managers as well, because anything that we do has to be managed properly in systematic sense. Uh, we are uh, not true scientists, we are basically uh, applied uh, scientists, so uh, applications come in a process and procedural manner, and uh, we need to have a good manager. And need to be in tune with the basic philosophy of conservation. Why the hell are we conserving? Uh, why should we conserve at all? Because, you know, if, uh, so we, we need to understand that very well. Not ours to field work. Sorry, uh, not the field work, but field work. Uh, quite a few of them are blamed. You now we are uh, uh, addicted to air conditioned rooms and all that. So we had to get out of that. Uh, and close mentality and do be able to do something more. And coming to policymakers, awareness, am I exceeding my time? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I'm coming. Uh, yeah, one minute exceeded. No problem, sir. Yeah, you I'm just you know, closing. This is the, yes, collaboration among all parts. We have to have collaboration. Uh, without collaborating with each other and with other uh, countries, we will not be anywhere in the future in uh, land resources, uh, let alone horticulture, which, uh, especially when we are looking for horticultural species that are not of native, uh, native to India. Next, please. So, uh, next, I think, is just a closing one. Uh, not much to say here, except that uh, the um, five points, please uh, focus on that. Uh, collecting conservation in situ on farm, ex situ, effective, sustainable utilization, and uh, fundamental to all human dimension. Because uh, agricultural genetic resources, most of them being perennial species, are going to play an important role uh, in combating primary climatic uh, changes that are happening. And uh, let us keep that in mind. And uh, thank you all. I think that's the end of my little uh, presentation. Thank you, sir, for uh, yes. focusing on the challenges of uh, horticulture genetic resources conservation. And I think uh, uh, you added value from uh, your experience, uh, which uh, you know really made us to think uh, what are the gaps in the conservation, how the complementary conservation strategies help to conserve the maximum genetic diversity. And uh, hey, hey, Raj, you never mentioned that I was not visible at all, <laughs> sir. Uh, you know, we the, so the light, the light, we were, light we were, that was there on the top had covered everything. We I just were, noticed, yeah, yeah. We, we were showing the slides, yeah. Now you are uh, visible, sir. Uh, any queries, yeah, and then we will have a a quiz to understand, uh, you know, what the participants uh, understood from your lecture. Uh, Sridhar? Most, most, prob most probably those questions have very little uh, to do with what <laughs> I said today. <laughs> exactly. Sir. Yeah, it's already posted and uh, we'll have uh, two minutes. We'll see the responses on the screen. Sir, one thing I like is uh, from uh, 2016 to 2021, uh, your perspectives uh, changed. And now you added uh, uh, some more. And uh, I think uh, the conservation is a dynamic process. And uh, uh, we should uh, look for uh, 
uh, new ways how to conserve the maximum genetic diversity and uh, another thing is uh, the use part which you are emphasizing and the uh, most of the genetic resources conserved in different gene banks are not characterized so that is adding a new dimension to the use and uh, now i think npjr has taken some uh, you know mass uh, <coughs> uh, way to do the uh, the characterization and uh, they have now 16 projects from uh, dbt to do the total characterization of uh, different uh, uh, crops and uh, that will uh, i think when uh, the results of uh, that project comes uh, we will have a better conserved uh, gem blossom in our uh, gene banks uh, sridhar can you show the results on the screen it's just the link is not opening that is uh, always there sir for some of the people there uh, the <laughs> yeah there uh, the uh, bandwidth may be low yeah you can see on the screen the results Yeah, you can see here, I think. Uh, shall we close the, yeah, we'll close. So thank you very much for uh, coming online. In spite of all the problems, you could uh, make it. And uh, it was a wonderful uh, talk. If, if it would have been on the first day, it would have, uh, you know, have more impact. But uh, uh, no damage done. Uh, still, uh, you could make it, and uh, I think the uh, participant will uh, take these uh, uh, things into their uh, uh, research. And uh, I once again thank you for uh, coming online and uh, inspiring us uh, with a wonderful lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you, the organizers and the trainees. Hope you benefited a little bit. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Bye. Bye, sir. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. K. Shiv Shankara, sir. Uh, sir is uh, presently principal scientist and head in the division of basic sciences at uh, ICR IHR Bangalore. Sir is presently working on physiology of uh, spongy tissue and flowering in mango, aroma biogenesis of uh, fruits, vegetable and mushrooms, antioxidant value in fruits and vegetable, Chili injuries of uh, mangoes, metabolite variation in pollen and stigma of low and high fruit set mango varieties. Sir is involved uh, in the development of six technology, including shrink wrapping of uh, pomegranates, minimal processed products of vegetables, two cauliflower varieties, two selections in pomelo, and two hybrids in mango. Sir was awarded with the UN. UNU Kirin Postdoctoral Fellowship for the advanced yeah, training of food technology at National Food Research Institute, uh, Tsukuba, Japan, trained in the area of aroma quantification and antioxidant analysis of mango. Sir is a fellow of International College of Nutrition, Alberta, Canada. He has guided uh, four PhD students and three MSc students and published uh, more than 100 papers in national and international journals and edited four books. Sir organized 22 ICR sponsored short courses. With a short introduction, sir, uh, I request you have a talk on uh, bioperspecting in horticulture crops. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. And I would like to thank Dr. Rajshekran, organizer of this uh, training program, for uh, giving me the opportunity to present uh, something before the trainees. Uh, the, uh, the main uh, topic for uh, given to me is bioprospecting of horticulture germplasm so as you all know bioprospecting is uh, nothing but the uh, you know recording or the you know prospecting most of the beneficial things which are present in our uh, you know biodiversity or germplasm it's a systematic search for whole organisms genes or natural compounds for the benefit of human beings so we should keep in mind that most of these things which we record it should be benefiting the human beings so it started uh, way back uh, when uh, the 
human being started uh, the orderly organized way of uh, living that time itself uh, they stated different taste, tasted different things uh, which are around uh, them and identified which one is beneficial to them and try to cultivate that so try to protect those germplasm so that bioprospecting started uh, the moment uh, uh, human beings became organized and uh, fao uh, uh, report uh, clearly says that around 35000 to 70000 plant species have been used in some way or the other for medicinal purposes and uh, if you divide the bioprospecting here you can see genes bioprospecting chemicals bioprospecting as well as designs so that means the plant biodiversity we can use the plant species we can use for three different purposes so all these three uh, have uh, have been considered as a bioprospecting one is the chemicals chemicals when it comes to chemicals which can be for agrochemist agrochemicals or drugs or even cosmetics when it comes to genes it may be for beneficial enzymes commodities biologicals and designs aesthetics mechanical engineering and sensor technology all these things plants can be used <clears throat> the enhanced effect of adverse you know adverse effect of synthetic drugs this led to the uh, search of uh, natural products which are available in the plant, from the plants uh, since uh, it is known that they will have very less uh, adverse effects because synthetic drugs it is known uh, to have adverse effects and uh, many plant synthesized substances that are useful for health but most of these are the secondary metabolites which are synthesized in the plants and secondary metabolites are only a small part of the total metabolites but still around 12000 of secondary metabolites have been used that is up, up, approximately around 10% of the total metabolites which are present in the plants and uh, when this, when we go for search for useful genes uh, we may search uh, of course we have even utilized also certain genes like early flowering disease resistance better root characters even quality uh, uh, genes responsible for maintaining different quality parameters like taste nutritive value and physical attributes even dwarfing genes so all these things uh, have been utilized it, it is uh, you know uh, available in our biodiversity germplasm in, in our germplasm collections so people have used these uh, genes uh, for uh, benefit of human beings when we talk about these genes for example if you take tomato what are the things which we can look for actually lycopene is one of the major important pigment which is uh, you know giving the red color to tomatoes even high beta carotene virus resistance even this is other this is fungal disease resistance so these are the different genes we can look for uh, in tomato and it is available in tomato germplasm very high lycopene uh, rich lines are also available high beta carotene rich lines are also available so these genes people can make use of even in chilies uh, the high color and uh, high pungency and for uh, abiotic stress tolerance the previous speaker dr ramnath rao was telling about the climate change and uh, Uh, shifting in cultivation delayed in flowering uh, lower fruit set and also fruit uh, growth uh, reduced taste so all these things can be overcome if we have some traits which can overcome these climate change effects like good root systems and virus resistance so virus resistance uh, is available in chilling germplasm so these are the genes which can be prospects uh, you know prospected and in brinjal nematode and wilt resistance flooding tolerance drought tolerance these genes are available so this also uh, one of the very good uh, uh, sources of uh, uh, resistance so these traits can be exploited by the breeders and banana when it comes to banana we know that high carotene is present in neandran but there are other genotypes in banana which have got very high uh, you know beta carotene so these germplasm in addition to neandran can be exploited uh, exploited for developing high nutritive value bananas so nowadays the nutritional security is very very important we have achieved the food security but nutritional security uh, we have to biofortify certain uh, uh, fruit crops or vegetable crops so here uh, if you see here banana you can see completely orange color pulp so this orange color pulp is due to the very rich uh, uh, beta carotene so these uh, type of germplasm which is available in our uh, you know germplasm collection can be used by the breeders when it comes to jack fruit we have identified in our institute itself identified some uh, jack fruit like siddu and shankara uh, it is from the farmers field only uh, they have been uh, uh, you know considered as a custodian farmers and benefit sharing is there with our institute so these you know two genotypes have got very high lycopene content so this also can be exploited for further breeding programs and when it comes to the 
uh, dietary fibers, which are rich in uh, vegetable type of jackfruits. So that also we have identified few genotypes which have got very high dietary fiber content. So these are the different genes which we can use in uh, jackfruit. In mango, of course, mango is known to be a very good source of vitamin C and carotenoids, but still we can exploit the diversity which is present in car carotenoid uh, content as well as certain highly aroma profile rich uh, mangoes which are used as uh, appendages or the whole mango, tender mango pickling. Their monoterpenoids are the important characters. So we have got genotypes with uh, very good uh, you know, content of philandrin, which is known to give that uh, typical aroma to uh, you know, appendage mangoes. And uh, Garcinia is another genotype uh, where it is commercially exploited for hydroxycitric acid content. So we have variations in our germplasm. Uh, with the say, hydroxy citric, uh, citric acid content, these things can be exploited. And uh, when it comes to the industrial users, so here a uh, lot of uh, compounds have been uh, industrially exploited, which are basically, uh, in, you know, in the beginning, initially it was identified or ex extracted from the plant species. For example, campothecin, anti cancerous properties. So it is, um, you know, extracted from campothica and acuminata. Uh, species, it is an alkaloid. So here in this table, you can see different uh, chemicals which are of plant origin, uh, which have been used in uh, drug industry and it's a million uh, dollar uh, industries. And a uh, lot of uh, these drugs are available in the market. It is being commercially exploited and it's being used. And nowadays, uh, some uh, companies have started synthesizing also uh, in, the, in the laboratory. So those things are also there, but basically it have, it, they have been identified or extracted from the plant sources. This is uh, another uh, you know, group of, these are the different germplasm where these uh, different chemical compounds are uh, available and which has been, which is being used commercially exploited for treating even AIDS, antiviral uh, drugs, uh, even uh, herbicide also, certain uh, terpenoids or essential oil components are, are being used as herbicide which is from the plant origin. And so certain digestive disorders also, alkaloids are being exploited uh, from uh, different species. Uh, Datura stramonium is one of them that is uh, widely available like a weed. And uh, this everybody knows from the dioscoria, the a steroidal compound like diosgenin. Uh, this is also being used uh, for treatment of so many uh, diseases. And Tamiflu, Tamiflu is one of the compound, one of the drug which is being used for treating even, I think, uh, corona nowadays, Tamiflu is very, very important. Uh, this is uh, originally identified in plant species. So this is from the shikimic acid. So this is uh, from the phenolic acid groups. So in, in the same way, Mamordica charantia, which is known to have anti-diabetic property, it has got a protein which is antiviral protein. So this, it's, it's called MAP30. So this, this is also being commercially exploited. And when it comes to papaya, and fig and also anana. In papaya, the pepain and chymopepain, these are the proteolytic enzyme activities and it is uh, present in the latex of these uh, species and which is commercially being exploited. And from the fig, it is physine and from anana, it is bromelain. Uh, and anonacins or anonins are also being exploited. They belong to acetogenin groups uh, for their um, pesticide activity as well as anti-cancerous uh, properties. And uh, in the nerium oleander is one of the ornamental plant. Here you can see this is a nerium uh, species. There is a compound, uh, ter triterpenoid compound called oleandrin. So this oleandrin is an anti-cancerous property it has got, and it, it is also being commercially exploited. These are all commercially exploited, what, uh, which, uh, which I am showing here. And uh, uh, for heart diseases also, two more compounds, uh, which they are being uh, extracted from the plant species. They belong to phenolic and also quinone groups. These are some of the products and the drug, uh, you know, producing uh, industries. You can see here chemical companies around top 30 compounds which are being exploited in uh, USA. These are the different companies starting from uh, Astra, Merck, uh, Glasgow, Pfizer, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, Johnson & Johnson, Bayer, Roche, Zenesia, Novartis. Bristol Mayors. So these are different companies in America. They are using uh, plant species or any other living organisms for producting these products. The first category, first uh, you know column shows the compounds. These are the products, and uh, these are the product category. <clears throat> 
and in anona species so now let us species wise uh, what <clears throat> what bio prospecting uh, you know uh, we can do or we it has been done in anona species especially anona muricata is known to have uh, anti cancerous properties and these are the different compounds which are present in uh, anona muricata and they belong to acetogenin groups so i don't want to read these compounds you please see here and uh, what are the different uh, plant pots which are being used even stem seeds and fruits also can be used for extracting these anonesins anonopentonosins and also trans amino murin uh, compounds so these have got <coughs> anti cancerous properties and these are different uh, families with uh, anti diabetic uh, properties so uh, family these uh, you know families have got certain uh, species and they have got these chemicals these are the group of chemicals starting from tannins flavonoids alkaloids and carbohydrates proteins so and even limonoids so these and phytosterols so these compounds have got a property or uh, anti diabetic property and which is present in these different species and uh, that is the family these are the species even cdm gojava is also having anti diabetic property the leaf is the major organ which can be used for anti diabetic properties so these are the active comp <coughs> components present in these uh, different species <coughs> like flavonoids glycoproteins even gallic acid that's the phenolic acid groups even triterpenoids tannins flavonoids anthocyanins even eucalyptus citridora even triterpenoids even terpenoids have got a wonderful property for, for reducing blood glucose levels and these are uh, sagegium species with uh, anti diabetic properties it is known that uh, sagegium species like jamun what we call com uh, common name is jamun these uh, species have got uh, wonderful uh, bioactive compounds and most of them are being used for anti diabetic properties and they are they have been commercially exploited also and health <coughs> health benefit uh, of uh, moringa species so moringa if you consider it is uh, known as a wonderful vegetable Uh, <clears throat> among the vegetables <clears throat> it is the vegetable which has got uh, wonderful uh, health benefiting properties uh, starting from hypolipidemic that is lowering uh, blood lipids lowering cholesterol effects glucose lowering effect and cardio protection effect anti inflammatory effects and uh, reduction in insulin resistance also this um, uh, species are uh, reported so what are the compounds present in this moringa flavonoids like mainly quercetin chlorogenic acid among the phenolic acid groups and alkaloids tannins isothiocyanates and cytosterol cytosterol is a sterol group so it is um, uh, you know um, similar to cholesterol so if cytosterol is taken cholesterol uh, level can be reduced and in uh, okra the common <coughs> vegetable uh, preferred by many okra has got wonderful uh, medicinal properties fruits seeds as well as leaves all the three parts have got health benefits when it comes to the fruits uh, health benefits uh, i will uh, just in the next slide i will explain you seeds have got very good source of protein this is the only vegetable with uh, actually lot of seeds inside the fruit and these seeds have got wonderful protein and health benefiting oil so uh, actually uh, when you eat this uh, you know okra as a vegetable you are taking lot of protein which is not present in the most of the other vegetables other vegetables are known to have mainly vitamins and minerals and uh, to some extent fiber but uh, okra is known to have a lot of proteins in that because we eat lot of seeds and in leaves also lot of health benefits are there major important uh, medicinal property in okra is okra mucilage okra mucilage is has, has got wonderful health benefits uh, like anti tumor antioxidants anti microbial and hypoglycemic and anti ulcerogenic capacities in uh, okra mucilage so we need to have uh, dendroplasm diversity in uh, mucilage content nowadays people may prefer less mucilage content but health benefit of okra is purely because of its mucilage content so we should be careful while selecting uh, while breeding uh, okra vegetables with less mucilage even though probably consumers may prefer that but we should highlight that the main you know medicinal property or health benefits of uh, okra is because of its mucilage content mucilage from the uh, stems as well as leaves is being exploited as an emulsifying agent in drug industry in pharmaceutical it is used as a thickener emulsifier stabilizer for uh, you know making tablets so it's a source of uh, uh, you know uh, forming uh, films of for the foods 
and these are different species which uh, i will not uh, take much time different species here you can see here and which part and all these species have been uh, screened for anti radiation effect do they have any capability to reduce the radiation damage to human beings so in those studies uh, they have observed that many species i will be showing you uh, they have got uh, free radical scavenging, scavenging capacities antioxidative and free radical scavenging capacities because of these chemicals here which i have highlighted when it comes to the first species it is cytosterol sigma sterols and also certain uh, uh, you know dimethoxy derivative compounds when it comes to allium cepha we know that uh, flavonoids are rich in onion and uh, in addition to its uh, sulfide groups dimethyl sulfide and uh, dipropyl sulfide methyl propyl trisulfide uh, so these compounds uh, uh, help in absorbing radiations and uh, allium uh, allium sativum this is uh, garlic garlic also known to have a lot of uh, uh, sulfur compounds mainly allicin in addition to allicin it also has got essential oils flavonoids and anthocyanins which help in reducing the radiate, radiation effect capsicum anum uh, it's a uh, rich in capsicinoids resins proteins fiber so and uh, these elements will reduce the radiation effect on human beings central asiatica asiot you know asia asia cosides asiatic cosides so these it, there are different uh, components in asiatic cosides so these help it help in uh, actually medicinal property and reduce in the radiation effect on human beings so like this many species are there i am not going to the details coriandrum sativum crocus sativus so these are the different uh, compounds in these species curcuma longa which is known uh, you know turmeric we know that curcumin is a major compound uh, in uh, curcuma longa so we have uh, species variations and also ge ge geographical uh, variations in northeastern uh, uh, part of uh, country uh, it is specific to have uh, certain locations are there there you get very high curcumin content so though i think it is a gi tag is also given to the you know turmeric which is grown in that region and uh, you know cardamom also is having lot of uh, terpenoids like limonene and uh, terpenolin cineol so these have got you know, wonderful health benefiting effect, uh, effects so these are different uh, uh, you know, species with these compounds even when it comes to mentha eugenol caffeic acid rosemary acid tocopherol caffeic acid all these things have got health benefits when it comes to mango Uh, amino butyric acid kainic acid sikimic acid even mangiferin it is present in mango even catechin one of the flavonoids and also protocatechin in very high concentration in mango that is responsible for uh, protecting against radiations miristica fragrans nigella sativa so i will not read all these things and piper longum you know that piperin is one of the major components in uh, uh, piper longum uh, in addition, addition to that terpenes steroids and uh, other esters and alkaloids are also present so these are responsible for their health benefiting properties sejigem so, cumuli which i already have told you uh, vitania somnifera vitanolides which are uh, one of alkaloids present in this species which have been commercially exploited and in uh, ginger ginger all related compounds they are they have been commercially exploited when it comes to the flowers <coughs> flower <coughs> flower industry dry flower industry perfumery and also pigment extraction so look at this beautiful flower this is a saffron flower uh, you can see the uh, you know dark red color stamens which is being used as uh, saffron but the other petals have also got wonderful color so these can be used for pigment extraction even in uh, uh, um, a carnation also a wonderful color variability is present that can be used for pigment extraction even marigolds it is being used already for extraction of uh, certain carotenoids like lutein and also zeaxanthin and dry flower industry uh, these flowers can be used and perfumery when it comes to perfumery rose lavender jasmine tuberose all these things can be used for uh, extracting perfumes and uh, some of the characteristics uh, you know compounds responsible for uh, you know fragrance of these flowers when it comes to tuberose uh, methyl iso eugenol methyl anthanilate and uh, some of the esters like benzyl benzoate and pentacosin these are responsible when it comes to jasmine jasmine also mainly benzyl related uh, esters and benzyl alcohol these are responsible for jasmine flavor so these are being commercially exploited now 
So when it comes to rose phenyl ethyl alcohol is the major component for uh, rose flavor, citronellol and the rose oxides, even in, in addition to certain uh, you know oxygenated uh, terpenoids. And in comes to geranium, where uh, mainly it is uh, used for essential oil extraction, like citronellol is a major component. When in marigold, uh, marigold oil, dihydrotagatone is the major component, but otherwise it is being used for lutein and zeaxanthin extractions. Thank you. I complete my talk. I think I have completed before uh, 20 minutes. Yeah. Ah, yes, still eight minutes are there. Uh -huh. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, you have, sir, uh, highlighted in your talk the important uh, traits uh, available in a different uh, lines of different crops uh, uh, with antioxidant property and genes for uh, important genes for lycopene and carotenoids and for high hydroxy citric acid. Different uh, species uh, with the drug and their uses. Different uh, companies you have highlighted uh, which have uh, used these plant species for uh, making medicine and different plant species uh, with their part and uh, what are the important active ingredients which is commercially being used. And uh, you have highlighted with the health benefits of uh, Moringa species and uh, Okra. And uh, the important, uh, interesting to see that some of the species which reduces the radiation absorption effect and some fragrance producing species like a tuberose, jasmine, rose, and geranium, and marigold, you have highlighted for that. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Any question? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for sparing your time. Sir. Uh, participants, we are uh, now having a break for uh, 40 minutes. Uh, sharp by 2 o'clock, we'll be back and uh, you can log in at that time. And uh, I would like to welcome to Dr. Sharan Angri as the uh, next speaker. Uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Sharan Angri. Sir is uh, uh, R&D advisor for Ankur Seeds India and uh, KWSS 
AAT SCA and Company, Germany. He is a director of uh, Foundation for Advanced Training in Plant Breeding and uh, ATB, ATP BR and Technical Advisor to uh, Arnitha Technologies. Sir is a formerly senior scientist at uh, ICR, Directorate of Oil Research, ICR at, and at uh, IHR Bangalore. Sir has developed a course module for the in-house plant breeding academy and facilitated plant breeding protection and NBA matters. Uh, sir has uh, uh, written popular science articles and uh, humor is his uh, favorite hobbies. He has authored several <coughs> popular science articles for leading dailies and uh, weeklies in Kannada and English. Sir has aired, uh, and national, aired national and private channel in India have aired his uh, science talk and uh, panel debates. Sir, with a brief uh, introduction, uh, I would like to request you to have a talk on uh, horticulture, genetic resource management, private sector perspective. Angdi, sir. Uh, thank you very much for that brief and good introduction. I am very glad to be back in IHR, I, as he mentioned. I have worked in IHR for five long years. I will keep my talk very, very light and interesting because I know it's tough to talk to an audience after lunch. So before we broke for lunch, I was talking to Dr. Rajshekharan on WhatsApp chat. I was asking him, is my talk rescheduled post-lunch? He said, no, you can finish. I said, no, no, I don't want to interfere with the lunch of the participants. Then even after he gave that break, I saw I said, there were 75 people. I thought these are the people who are really interested in the topic and they will stay. They're probably they are skipping their lunch. Then one by one they reduced. Now I see 58 participants. It's okay. Because uh, why we are apprehensive was I, I wrote to Rajshekaran, it is tough to talk, a hungry, talk to a hungry audience. He said it is tougher to talk to a well-fed audience. Post lunch it will be more difficult. I said okay. So then we agreed that, okay, we will break for 40 minutes. So cutting down 20 minutes, he thought people will eat less. Sir, lunch. at uh, your level, you can talk to both. There is no problem. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you have that knack. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I know. And uh, I was afraid to see your time starts now clock. So please don't start it yet. <laughs> I'll just make it a little more easy to participants to come and sit and settle down. So coming to lunch, there are two types of lunch. One is a working lunch, another is the lunch that works. So I thought people will have a lunch that works, so that was my apprehension, but that's okay. They have started already my time. But don't worry, I am not going to tell you many tough things which are difficult to understand. I will try to keep it very, very light. Rajshekaran told me keep it very light. So I said, okay, I'll make my talk weightless so that all can sit and enjoy. I said, talking to an uh, audience post-lunch is tough. I had this experience once I was talking in a conference post-lunch and people came back after a sumptuous lunch. The, I was seeing the lunch working. In the front row, there, were, there was a person who was sitting and dozing off. I asked the person sitting next to him, can you please wake him up? Then he said, no. It is you who made him to sleep, you wake him up. So that is a challenge we face. Coming back to IHR, I have, I have spent five years there and Rajshekar and myself, we have had good times together. When it comes to lunch, we used to have discussions during lunch, post lunch, we used to have fun. And then we are good old friends. He is good and I am old. You can see that. So what I will do is in the next uh, 28, when it's 40 seconds or 38 seconds I am left with, I will give you few aspects of plant breeding capacity building. Let me first start my uh, sharing the screen. Let me try whether it works. Hopefully it does. Can you see it? Hello, Rashekran? Yes. Can make you see my slides? Make it presentation okay. mode, sir. Uh, how do I do it? I think this. Uh, mm, I think this lawyer. What what is that? How do I make it 
present because that is hiding uh, the mute the right stop bottom, video sir. the sir. right bottom yes yes sir, press f5 uh, it will f5 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 sir press f5 to share yes, the sir. screen rather than the ppt yeah i, I f5 i tried it is not working it you is stop, a function and uh, f5 yeah you stop sharing and again do it then it may come okay now share share the screen share the screen i i go to powerpoint open it and share or how do yeah, i yeah, do yeah. Yeah. yes sir okay oh yeah i got it now can you see it not come you are now you are not shared i think okay some problem let me Otherwise, see how it we works we can share from here also no issues no i i i'll just I'll, I'll let me try once more and then you can help me is it working now yeah but again uh, not in the full screen it is uh, still uh, yeah what's happening is that black uh, one at the bottom that is hiding my what do you call uh, yeah Can you please help? Yeah, yeah. Now it has come. Now it has come, sir. Go ahead. Full. It is in full uh, slide. I mean uh, PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, so, uh, it it is in presentation mode. Yeah. Yes. Can you yes, see sir. my full slide? Okay. Yes. That's nice. So my topic is uh, plant breeding, capacity building, horticultural genetic resources, and public-private partnerships, a private sector perspective. Rashi Agar and thought because I spent about 27. I have spent so far 27 years in the private sector. He thought I should speak more about private sector perspective. So I feel as long as it is genetic resources, whether it is breeding in private sector or public sector, the situation is same. We need to have good understanding. We should be free to share the material and use wherever it was uh, very relevant. Next slide. Now I have to do it, right? You are sharing or am I sharing? Hello. Hello. You are sharing. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So I I would briefly touch upon what is plant breeding. I know it's easy for the people who already know it, but I thought I'll just briefly tell. Uh, it is plant breeding has the capability of broadening the genetic and adaptability base of cropping systems. That's why it is important. We try to design varieties which are suitable. and we try to combine conventional selection methods or techniques and modern technologies it requires long term commitment and resources at national regional and international levels essential for the development of improved cultivars what do we improve them for increased yields improved quality and better adaptation to the changing environmental conditions that is becoming more important now with the weather changing we talk a lot about breeding Uh, weather resilient or climate resilient crops because now as as i have been in the plant breeding uh, learning from for the past over 50 years now at least since 1970 so what's happening is things are changing earlier people used to practice it as an art then became science now we talk of gene editing now we talk of so many molecular methods so it's becoming more and more complex and it requires a lot of resources and money which is difficult to do at one level that's why uh, participation of private and public becomes important i'll go to that little later what happened my slide is not yeah so we will come to when it comes to capacity building i think uh, it's important to know there is an organization or initiative by fao it is called gipb or global partnership initiative for plant breeding capacity building what's capacity building just we'll come to that in a moment so this gipb is a global platform dedicated to mobilize education policy technology and information resources to do what to help unlock the value of plant genetic resources for all so that's that's basic thing it's a internationally facilitated platform dedicated to enhancing the capacity of developing countries to improve crops for food security and sustainable development through better plant breeding and seed delivery systems seed delivery systems also in part it is a uh, 
private sector initiative. Why it is not changing? Yeah, yeah. A, a little bit more on global initiative on plant breeding capacity building. What are the objectives? Objectives are to have a policy dialogue and development, education and training, access to technology, and what I have highlighted in green is exchange of PGR. So for those of you who will have to answer a few questions towards the end, I have tried to make your job easy by highlighting the points which could be asked as questions. I didn't send them any questions, but then I requested them to make them from the abstract which I had sent. So make it easy, I am doing it, please pay attention. Yeah, It was launched in a multi-stakeholder meeting in Madrid in June 2006, when during the first governing body meeting of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. I think in short it is known as ITPGRFA. In the discussion, design and launching of the GIPB, who were involved, representatives of the CGIR centers, national agriculture research centers, regional centers of excellence in agricultural research, universities and other academic institutions, professional agriculture societies, please make a note, private sector was also involved and NGOs participated. Essentially, GIPB is a multi-party initiative of knowledge institutions and agencies around the world that have been supporting agricultural research, working in partnership with country programs committed to developing stronger plant breeding capacity. Okay? As a partnership of public, private and civil society sectors, GIPB initiative is aimed at catalyzing and supporting national, regional and global action, among whom, among relevant international organizations, foundations, universities and research institutes, private sector, civil societies and national and regional bodies. Activities agreed upon at the meeting in Madrid were reaffirmed in Mexico at a consultation held in conjunction with the International Symposium in Plant Breeding Summit. I was a part of it and from FAO there was Gumeras and few other people were there. We had a meeting where our inputs were given and then we started working on how to build it. The next year after that, the year 2007 was a startup period after which GIPB is being implemented in five year cycles with a time horizon of 20 years. So it will go on till 2027, add 20 years to 2007, it is 2027. GIPB partners including CGIAR, that is Consultative Group on International Agriculture Research Centers, universities and the private sector in both the developed and developing world possess capabilities for training relevant to utilization of plant genetic resources. All through you see there is a thread running about plant genetic resources. So this is, I just try to put it in a graphic manner, what does GIPB process do? Raise awareness among policy makers and help target adequate policy responses, training and support to build and to consolidate institutional capacity, training and access to technologies to strengthen plant breeding and delivery systems. So you have awareness, you see the circles are interconnected, they are overlapping with each other. Awareness, policy support, institutional strengthening, improved technical capabilities. So ultimately, the idea of output is enhance national plant breeding and seed systems capacity. So what are the factors? In that study, they also tried to look at factors that can be limiting success. The factors that limited success were inadequate experimental fields and con fields conditions, number of breeders per crop, access to the literature and knowledge of the plant breeding strategies. These were all inadequate, please note. And then limited access to genetic resources. I have highlighted it in red because that can be a big limitation. And inadequate investment friendly legislation and lack of public private partnership. So that was very clearly understood in the beginning itself. Then regional consultations. What is happening is there is a decline in plant breeding capacity integrate molecular tools into plant breeding, train plant breeders, facilitate cooperation among institutes, long-term investments, rewarding system, the last one but not the least is motivate participation of the private sector. So then looking at those, uh, next slide, am I doing it? I don't know. Oh, yeah. yeah, strategies to build the national capacity. 
So we need to, when we got talked of capital, capacity building, I showed already, I told already it is national, regional and international. So strategies to build national capacity, national PGR strategy, public awareness about the importance of PGR, harmony among the goals of plant breeding and biotechnology tools, link plant genetic resources, plant breeding and seed delivery systems. Instruments to stimulate private investments and public-private partnership. You can see it all through the public-private partnership is running. I just wanted you to please make a note of it. So with that, we come to public-private partnership. Why it is required, what does it mean, how it's help, how it is helpful. Partnering for progress is the theme. The three types of public-private partnerships are research partnerships, knowledge sharing and resource access. Research partnership, research combine the research activities of both public and private. Knowledge sharing is easy, I don't need to explain. Resource access. Resources are very, very important these days. So there is a resource constraint everywhere we are. There is no money, there is no fund, there are no resources. That's where these partnerships can help. What is public-private partnership? In short, it is known as P3. It's any joint effort between public and private entities. What do they do? Each contributes to planning, commit resources, share risks and benefits and conduct PGR activities to accomplish mutually beneficial objective of increased food and ecological security. The partnerships offer means of tapping the strengths of diverse actors, participants by that I mean, and channeling knowledge and resources to address complex development problems, exploiting the potential for research synergies, complementariness, scale economies and knowledge sharing among stakeholders. So with participation, there are greater chances of success with less of resources. Key issues that promote P3 mode in PGR activities, cataloging land races with fingerprints, enlisting all valuable national germplasm collections with identity, facilitating designation of proprietary lines developed by the private sector. Developing mechanisms across the sectors for exchange of scientists for short term, one year and long term, three years. Joint evaluation identified areas and crops. Sharing mechanisms include including sale of germplasm, elite lines, inbred lines, discarded lines prior to release of varieties. Long term collaborative projects for allele mining, functional genomics, climate change that is heat, drought, flood and salinity, chronic unsolved problems of biotic stresses, search for alternatives to BT, etc. Developing mechanisms for dual lock system in conservation at the developer's location with provisions for use in national emergencies. Mutually beneficial P3s are integral part of crop improvement. They are critically important for pre-beeding, enhance the adaptive capacities of cropping systems to climate change and respond to the need for increasing productivity. Partnerships are valuable because each partner contributes to planning, commits resources and shares risks and benefits. They offer means of tapping the strengths of diverse actors and channeling knowledge and resources to address complex developmental problems and help in exploiting the potential for research synergies among stakeholders. The synergies are very, very important. Synergy simply means 2 plus 2 is 5, not 2 plus 2 is 4, this you know. Then we come to most importantly, P3s are valuable because they bring private sector resources and expertise to bear on public research priorities. The emergence of plant breeding programs in the 20th century created a demand for germplasm exchange among breeders. This initiated collecting missions and explorations to satisfy the growing needs. Plant characters such as pest disease resistance, earliness, stiff stalks and grain quality. All over the globe, I think that Shishankar mentioned about use of dwarfing genes and uh, stiff stocks. All over the globe, the balance between public and private industry roles in varietal research and development has shifted in the past three decades. That is a change. The private sector expanded considerably and is focused on commodities with major markets, enhancing their share for development of agriculture. Public institutions are involved in the various germplasm related activities, collection, characterization and conservation and preservation, you can add to that. Conservation and pro-poor crop improvement still playing major role in development of agricultural research. Please make a note of pro-poor. Crop improvement has to be focused towards the needs of the poor. P3 is involving, now we will come to few examples I would like to quote. Is it just a talk or the things are happening? P3 is involving CGIR institutes, I already mentioned, consultative group on international agriculture research which takes care of international centers. 
So these are the examples I have listed. Apom excess in maize, cement, PHI, syngenta and lima grain, BT genes for rice transformation, IRI, Novartis and Plantec, golden rice, IRI and syngenta, potato, sweet potato transformation, SEP, that is Central Institute for Pot Tropical Agriculture, I think, or potato, plant genetic systems, Axis Genetics and Monsanto, and cassava transformation, CI80 and Novartis. Collaborations are being successfully implemented in terms of Harvest Plus, CIAT and IFPRI, International Food Policy Research Institute, Syngenta, and Unlocking Crop Genetic Diversity for Poor People, CIMIT and PI, IRI, MAHICO, Bayer Crop Science and PHI. So, these are the participating institutions. Partnerships in PGR activities including AG Biotech R&D, the technical requirements are access to cutting edge research tools intellectual property, advanced scientific expertise, expensive and sophisticated equipment and solid infrastructure. Just a quick look at that. Agriculture Biotechnology Support Project, when you talk of biotechnology, private public partnership, I want to quote this good example. Mahiko, IIVR, Varanasi and UAS Dharwad and TNA Coimbatore. Development of transgenic brinjal varieties resistant to fruit and shoot borer. ABSP provided funding, TBT the regulatory support, Mahiko provided the cry gene and IIVR or Indian Institute of Vegetable Research took the responsibility to develop the resistant varieties. So, this kind of partnerships always are beneficial. Then there is also another model consortium model where there are more partnership, partnerships, more participants. Consortium model was developed and successfully implemented by ICRISAT. It formed a consortium with private seed companies and others to collaborative research, local regional programs for sorghum and millet research. Also, ICRISAT has established biotech incubator involving private sector biotechnology companies. National scenario, successful models of P3 in India, hybrid rice, IRI has developed an effective P3 model for promotion of hybrid rice in India. IRI. Indian Foundation Seeds and Services Association, it is IFSSA and Barwale Foundation signed a memorandum of agreement for seed multiplication of parental ends of POSA RH10, the first superfine grain aromatic rice hybrid developed by IRI. In addition to IFSSA, IRI also signed a MO with 18 other seed companies to produce hybrid seed of POSA RH10. The partnership with IFSSA helped the area under POSA RH10 to reach nearly 0.5 million hectares. Look at the benefit. Then, are we looking at only successes? There are failed examples. So, I would like to quote my own personal failed examples when I was working with Nunems. We had a tie up with Bogor Agriculture University, Indonesia to develop chilies resistant to few of the viral diseases because there was one eminent virologist there trained in USA. We had it going good. Then at some stage it did not work out because they said they will tell us when to sell our seeds. So, we said that is not going to work it fell through. Then with also World Vegetable Center Taiwan, we had a program of uh, working with them for TLCV resistance in tomato leaf curl virus. So, they had a latest gene, we wanted to collaborate with them when we wanted to sign the MOU, they said some, some terms were not clear, they said those terms will be decided later. Our legal department said that is not fair because once we have made a progress, and if they put some conditions which are not acceptable to us, that does not work. So, that also fell through. Then, this is interesting. I have put the rest in peace Simba. How a good collaborative program that can succeed with the equal participation and support of each of the partners can be killed? This is the example. This was Simba in short. I have put there collaboration and insect management for brassicas in Asia and Africa. By brassicas, we mean cauliflower and cabbage. You have heard of diamond back moth. Our idea was to develop a diamond back moth resistant cauliflower and cabbage hybrids with two dual gene construct of cry gene, which was in house. We had it from Ghent. Those are the participating organizations. The joint investment and collaborative research has spearheaded by Nunams India involving ICR India, AVRDC, World Vegetable Centre, Taiwan, University of Melbourne, Australia, Natural Research Institute, University of Greenwich, UK, University of Cornell, USA. These were the partners. We relied on the public sector for socio-economic and ethical evaluation of the project. 
facilitating regulatory approval within the established norms and infrastructure facilities and management of stewardship training in taking the product to the public. But as I mentioned in the beginning, unfortunately the project got killed because in the last moment the public sector partners had to decided to walk out saying what is in it for us, we are not going to be part of it. So why I am quoting these failures is this is an example how not to do things. So there should be a mutual participation, each has to accept responsibility, each has to work together and they have to contribute to the success together. As they say working together works better, but here that did not happen. Why this trade is not changed? Yeah. So with that we have taken example, we know what is plant building, capacity building, we know why partnerships are important, we know how exchange of PGRs can be valuable, then what can be the future thrusts? What we need to do? Enhance public, private and civil society partnerships, investment in research and plant genetic resources, handling and use of confidence building, increase share of private sector in R&D, exchange and collaborative use of genetic resources for food and agriculture, but there what we need to have as a participation is civil society organizations, national bureaus and public plus private partnership. Capacity building with appropriate institutional arrangements and policy framework for handling IPR related issues. That is another important point, intellectual property rights. Okay? Conclusions, capacities in plant breeding in most developing countries are inadequate. Long term support for national breeding strategies is lacking. Lack of trained personnel and institutional weaknesses within the plant breeding sector and in its links with seed systems are key elements that prevent the potential contribution of plant breeding. Dearth of mechanisms to promote public and private partnerships. This leads to underdeveloped seed systems and to poor transfer of improved germplasm. By that I mean better varieties. Improved germplasm is better varieties to farmers. I think uh, that's what I wanted to say. I think I've saved uh, the organizers five minutes, 33 seconds. So I would like to thank Rajeshekaran for that uh, invite and I think I shared my thoughts. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank, thank you very you much. very much for your uh, thought provoking lecture. And uh, I, I just thought that uh, when we will have a win-win situation, I think uh, now always we have, uh, you know, I win and you lose uh, or you win or uh, I lose. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, as they say, heads you win, heads uh, I win, tails you lose. Yes. That is the situation. So both the times, I, that's what I said. In, in the public private partnership, who wins is not important. So the together we can win is important. Yeah, the trust deficit is still uh, there. That is yeah, the main yeah. yeah. But I, I see a lot of change, Rashakaran, as we yeah, have yeah, discussed I, on several I, I, occasions. Some of the things which yeah. you shared. Uh, yeah. really th uh, you know good one and i think we will yeah. uh, have uh, mo much more and now the yeah. attitude is in in the uh, public sector is uh, really going to change and finally it has changed it has changed over years yeah, yeah. for the and good finally we but have only private sector not the public sector i don't want to say that because uh, i have been part of public sector for 15 long years and now private sector for 27 years both have their own strengths, both have to prosper, both have to work well. Because we, we are all products of public sector. Today I, I should not speak against public sector. Because we were made by public sector. And still education, training of plant breeders still has to happen in public sector only. Private sectors of course are investing in different areas of training. They are developing their own plant breeding academies, send their people for trainings elsewhere. But then still public sector I feel has a very important and major role to play. That we can never Yeah, discuss. you cannot deny that fact, but uh, yeah. the trend shows that, uh, you know, the public sector is, uh, uh, the role is squeezing and uh, the government is not uh, giving adequate uh, funding for the uh, uh, <coughs> public sector uh, organizations. So that is... A, I understand. Yeah. I understand. Then we can join hands. Look to us yeah. for funds. Let us work together. We want to make you profitable. But IHR is now opening up. It has licensed right, many right, technologies, right. earning yeah. big money. Yeah. That's the right way to go. Yeah. Because funds are not going to come forever. This this you see in US it has already happened. Yeah. Many universities are being asked to develop 
are uh, earn their own money make well, their own funds most of the us universities have become uh, business centers they do business yes yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah but then i think what is important is to have a right mix of business and academics exactly, exactly. For, for promoting academics and research, money is required. For many businesses, but you can have strategic business units and keep them separate. Keep people for responsible for that. Ask them to earn the money. Give it to the university. I, I suggested this in Texas A M uh, Texas A M U. I spoke to the dean there and vice chancellor. They were happy with that idea. But then all these discussions that end there in a nice, nice, nice it is, and then nothing happens later. I don't know what they have done. Anyway. Sir, you started with 50 participants. Now uh, you have 102 participants. 102. Yes. But still not happy because morning as <laughs> a 130, 132. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because as okay. you said, uh, it'd be effect of the lunch. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> hope, hope uh, you allowed them enough time to have a lunch that works. Exactly. So thank you very yeah. much uh, for your thought-provoking you. lecture. We'll have a co continue our di dialogue in some other platform. And now thank we, you, Rajesh. We will move forward. Yeah, Doctor. Thank you, Rajesh Chakran and your team for yes, inviting yes. me and facilitating. Yes, yes. Uh, from and the see day. you tomorrow also again. Tomorrow, yeah, plenary yes. session. What time is that, Rajesh Chakran? Four, four. Sir. We will be sharing the details uh, yes. in. A, Please do. Yeah, Please in a yeah. few minutes we will be sharing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, back to Rajesh. Thanks all. Thanks all for listening and not sleeping through my lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, let me introduce the uh, next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Matthew Don. Uh, he is a principal scientist and head in the division of uh, plant genetic resource at uh, JNT BGRI, Tiruvananpuram. Uh, his area of uh, research is conservation and characterization of medicinal and uh, aromatic plants. He is having uh, 35 years of experience. Uh, he has reported uh, seven new species of flowering plants and published uh, 86 research papers and seven books. He has guided uh, seven PhD students uh, and uh, three are uh, under process. Uh, he has handled 15 projects and uh, four projects are uh, ongoing. He has received his uh, sponsorship from British Council for his uh, internship at Royal Botanic Garden, Q UK in 1995. He was awarded with the Professor T. R. Sahu Award 2002 for the best paper on medicinal plant systematics. Dr. B. P. Sethi Award 2010 for the best research paper. He served as an executive council member of Indian Association of Angiosperm Taxonomy for three years, served as a member of State Medicinal Plant Board for three years, member of the Board of Studies for Fatima Matha Autonomous College Kolam and SH College Thevara, uh, Mar Ivanois College, Sirvanandpuram. Uh, sir, with the brief introduction, sir, I request you to have a lecture on uh, JNT BGRI, a case study of horticulture, genetic resource management, and conservation. Matthew Dunn, sir. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. And first of all, I must congratulate the organizers for such a, an elaborate program, a five-day national online training program on conservation management and utilization of articles and genetic resources and its various aspects. Uh, so it's a privilege to be here and I'm, I'm thankful to the organizers to be to make me a part of this program. So Coming to JNT BGRI, my institute, it is the Halan Haru Property Botanic Garden and Research Institute, which is situated in the extreme uh, southern part of the uh, country. And luckily, we are in the foothills of uh, the Western Ghats and, uh, and the, bad, the biodiversity hotspots, one of the hotspots in this. And uh, we are blessed with uh, uh, an array of uh, wild vegetation as well as. Uh, microclimatic conditions in which we can conserve several tropical genetic resources. So we are mainly concentrated on uh, wild uh, tropical plants. Uh, you, you are listening uh, probably mostly on uh, crops, 
but uh, our institute is chiefly concentrated on uh, various uh, wide plants and uh, conserving a range of uh, uh, plant groups, including uh, medicine and aromatic plants, bamboos, bromeliads, gymnosperms, insectivorous plants, wild fruits, <coughs> orchids, farms, turdophytes, etc. So, uh, uh, spreading over uh, 300 acres uh, or 121 hectare uh, in the uh, forest patch. Uh, most of our uh, plants are very much adapted to this condition and uh, uh, I am thankful and uh, uh, saying homage to our uh, founder director, Professor A. A. Brahm, who is a very great visionary. So coming to the Germplasm collection of uh, uh, and then to professors like Jain D. Bijarai, uh, it has uh, clear-cut aims, approaches and applications. Uh, such as, of course, mainly dealing with the uh, ex situ conservation and, of course, systematics, assessment of uh, variability in various uh, plant groups, discovery of untapped potentials, and detection of uh, bioactive molecules and its value addition. So, ex situ, as well as we are concentrating on uh, in situ conservation through green reduction program, etc. Propagation, standardization of propagation methods, popularization uh, activities, and also various education and awareness programs, trainings, etc. And uh, coming to the systematics and uh, uh, assessment of variability, mainly using different tools of biosystematics and also floristics, ecology, reproductive biology, and so on. So it's a uh, heaven for uh, botany students, not only for botany students, uh, students of life science of uh, various disciplines are regularly utilizing these facilities. Coming to the case studies on uh, conservation, I will give an example. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And Fusilium uh, fenestratum, uh, the Dioferbra or the tree termonic. Uh, and actually, it is. Uh, Critically endangered species, uh, uh, and uh, for conservation, it is various uh, threats are there, including uh, the habitat specificity. It requires typical um, evergreen condition, and uh, the plant is very slow growing. From the seedling, uh, it will remain with the two leaved seed seedling for about two years, uh, and um, late reproductive maturity is another problem. It uh, requires. 12 to 15 years for producing flowers and poor seed germination, less than 20% of uh, seed germination, and of course, over exploitation to uh, get the stem of this plant. Uh, you can see the uh, yellow colored Berber rich stem. Uh, so, due to all these uh, reasons and man made reasons, uh, it is coming under the critically uh, endangered category. Next slide, please. Yes. A survey conducted by Kerala Forest Research Institute in 2014, uh, they reported that they could record on, only 33 mature plants in the state, uh, though they could find around 600 uh, individuals in different uh, patches. Uh, mature plants, which are in the capacity of reproductive capacity, uh, is very limited and only 33. Uh, individuals. So this indicates uh, the, the threat to the plant and the unisexuality of the plant is also a problem. Uh, next slide, please. So the individual has undertaken uh, various measures on this and uh, the, the plant is first introduced to the garden in 1985. By 87, uh, we started uh, various research and studies on it. And by 1990, we have an exclusive project on it uh, called Echo Rehabilitation of the Proscenium Fenestratum, the Garden Hadra. And um, by 2009 11, over 2000 seedlings uh, were uh, produced from uh, our plants uh, and distributed to various forest ranges in Kolkata and Marichal, uh, in Kollam and Trishul district of Kerala Forest Department. 
for reintroduction. Actually, those regions the typical natural habitat for these uh, plants. So, uh, forest department themselves suggested these two localities, and uh, we were able to uh, reintroduce it there uh, uh, successfully. And by 2010, the seed bank uh, people uh, were able to uh, develop a method to increase the germination capacity up to 90 percent, uh, mainly simply by reducing the moisture content of the uh, the seeds up to uh, 23 percent of uh, moisture content. Uh, so uh, seed germination is very well enhanced and uh, it opened a, an opportunity to prepare enormous num enormous number of uh, uh, seedlings. And in 2015, we opened a sanctuary uh, for Maramana in the campus, which holds over 50 mature uh, plants in that sanctuary itself. And so far, uh, 8,000 seedlings have already distributed to different parts of the uh, country. Next slide, please. So uh, for uh, such activities, we, were, uh, we included students, uh, especially from different universities, so that uh, to convey the uh, message on uh, the relevance of uh, conservation of this particular plant. Next slide, please. And uh, now I am moving to uh, some other examples on uh, case studies with respect to the PGR management and characterization, especially giving priority to the wild relatives of uh, some crop plants and also medicinal and aromatic plants. So wild bananas uh, are uh, important gemblasm with respect to the rest and nuts. Mainly we have uh, three, three uh, species. Uh, one belongs to NCK, this one, NCK uh, of uh, the same uh, allied species of uh, Nusa. And another, uh, two Nusa species are Nusa Akimek and Nusa Balbisiana. Uh, we were able to uh, maintain the germplasm of these uh, varieties here. And um, as you are aware, not only the fruits, even the importance is considered as a, a very important uh, vegetable throughout um, several tropical countries. And so we just compared uh, the importance of uh, four different uh, Mesa uh, with uh, the popularly cultivated uh, Mesa called Mesa Palayam Kodai. Next one. And the results were so interesting. Uh, and then, uh, and uh, with respect to the nutritive value, uh, it is very well compared uh, to the cultivated varieties and sometimes uh, much more than that. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, we are tested for uh, uh, protein, carbohydrate, fat, etc., and also beta carotene, like that. And uh, you can see. Uh, uh, the, the content of beta carotene is very well in almost all the wild uh, plants. So even micronutrients. So so, so uh, it clearly indicates that the relevance of uh, the conservation and characterization of uh, such uh, wild uh, genetic resources. Next one, please. Next, okay. Uh, this is another study which we conducted. Uh, actually, it was a phase two program on. Uh, uh, by wild the curcuma species, and uh, the aim of the, that study was to isolate and characterize the starch uh, from the rhizomes and to analyze it uh, uh, the edible value of that particular starch. Actually, this is Maranda arundinacea family Marandaceae, uh, which is popularly known as arrowroot and a chief uh, source of uh, edible starch. Uh, in the starch itself is known as uh, the arrowroot powder, but actually uh, being an exotic uh, plant hardly introduced uh, within a century. Um, in earlier uh, texts of uh, Ayurvedic texts as well as in Corpus Malabaricus written in 18th century, very well uh, Kuva or arrowroot is mentioned. So it clearly indicates that uh, this is not the Kuva uh, mentioned in the earlier test, and uh, that definitely they are different curcuma species. That's why we 
came into all this uh, uh, topic and we analyzed almost all the rhizomatous uh, uh, curcuma species from South India. We have around 21 uh, species of curcuma in uh, South India, but uh, hardly 10 are with uh, good, good amount of uh, fresh rhizomes. So we collected all those and uh, made uh, isolated stars from this and analyzed the stars and compared it with that of the uh, arrow root around uh, Next slide. So these are the uh, starch powder analyzed from the different Burkama uh, species. Only, only two species have uh, that presence of the uh, uh, curcumin, uh, the curcumin longa and cedaria. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, you can see the bar diagram indicating the calorific value of uh, this uh, and the extreme right one is uh, the, the standard of Maranda uh, Aranasia and you can see Kutma Harida is very well uh, much better than the exotic Maranda uh, uh, Aranasia and several other Kutma species also showed a very good uh, result and we analyzed the physical chemical properties also uh, like a swelling uh, property, tasting property, uh, or boiling point, like that. All those features uh, very well expressed that the, the starch powder from most of our wild curcuma species are very potential, uh, not only as food and also for uh, various uh, industrial uh, aspects, including uh, tablet making, uh, like that. So, um, this are another uh, area in which we have to go much more uh, to um, tap potential of uh, this uh, untouched group. Next one, please. This is another group of plants which we have taken for our study. This was, this was also a PhD program. Uh, this actually uh, uh, the diversity within the genus. Uh, uh, Mysticia of family Mysticia, so Mysticia, you may be known that uh, Mysticia fragrance uh, shown in the extreme left uh, is the typical Mysticia fragrance of a Jadi or uh, nutmeg. And um, uh, during the study, we could uh, see a yellow berry variety of the nutmeg also. So uh, the nutmeg, two varieties, along with uh, these wild uh, varieties. And uh, due to, uh, uh, during the study, we could uh, report uh, one new species of Mysticia from Western Guards, and we named it after our institute, uh, Trobogari. So Mysticia Trobogari is this. Uh, uh, so uh, most of them are uh, not used for any purpose. And the major uh, use of uh, some of the wild Mysticia is uh, to adulterate with the original nutmeg, especially the maize. When the maize is dry, it looks almost uh, similar to the maize of the uh, nutmeg. So many people used to, uh, so reports are there, and it is uh, used as an adulterant with the uh, maize of the uh, original nutmeg. So in this case, we analyzed uh, and found that None of the wild species is good for food purpose or for food flavoring. Moreover, many contains uh, uh, toxic or uh, unhealthy phytochemicals in that. So, uh, uh, using wild uh, nutmeg for adaptation is, of course, an offensive uh, method and uh, uh, it should be banned by all means. As I case. Another uh, result we observed is uh, regarding the fatty acid uh, profile of uh, these wild mysticia uh, uh, species. And uh, interestingly, uh, the, in the typical mysticia fragrance, uh, the, uh, the commercially important landmark, mystic acid is uh, uh, the major common. Uh, but in uh, most of our wild, uh, several other compounds are also there. Uh, and uh, of course, mystic acid is present in all this, but uh, the ratio is uh, much different as you, have, you can see here. 
and several other secondary metabolites are also reported from the uh, fatty acid profile. And this indicates uh, the diversity of uh, uh, chemical commerce in, in this group. And uh, most of them are uh, not analyzed for any pharmacological or other properties. So such studies are going in uh, here in collaboration with the uh, NIST, uh, National Institute of Interdisciplinary Science and Technology, Toronto. So uh, I hope uh, uh, they may uh, arrive into potential biocompounds from these uh, wild uh, resources. Another group is uh, Hedicium, Hedicium coronarium. Everybody knows well, uh, both as an ornamental plant and as well as a medicine plant. And uh, Hedicium flavescens, Hedicium scriptatum, and Hedicium minister are rather uh, wider relatives of uh, this particular plant in, in the Sinjibrasi. And all of them are potentially with the rich content of essential oil and uh, suspiterpenoids. And, uh, and interestingly, this uh, flavescence is uh, unique with the high, very high content of uh, beta pinin. Beta, beta pinin is a very potential uh, a compound with respect to perfumery as well as uh, uh, it has antimicrobial and insecticidal property. And uh, these are also uh, potential uh, for uh, future uh, uh, studies. Next, thank you. <clears throat> this is uh, another intragenetic uh, diversity we studied uh, in uh, Tortia species. Tortia belongs to the family Astrolochiaceae, and uh, actually, uh, the Tortia silicosa is a tribal medicine, and uh, roots of that particular plant contains uh, rich up in alkaloids and the tribals are using it against a snake poison. So uh, that means we could uh, locate many other species in Western Ghats. Most of them are uh, not yet studied and the uh, Vidara itself uh, published uh, uh, three new species in this uh, group. Uh, and with respect to um, uh, biogeographical uh, relation, it is uh, some of the species are very much shows affinity with other Tortia species of uh, Indonesia, Burma, Thailand, Belt. Uh, and so, phytogeographically, also it is significant. And um, uh, personally, we are analyzing uh, the chemical constants of uh, its roots. And I hope uh, more potential commerce will emerge from this uh, particular group. Next one. Victoria termination is another important uh, plant which we study. Uh, we could collect seven different variants of uh, uh, Victoria termination, uh, out of which uh, four are typical uh, with uh, typical flowers, uh, typical papillonaceous corolla with a stand, big standard petal, and three of them. Uh, in three of them, all the five petals are uh, uh, standard petals. So uh, it is very distinct. Uh, and interestingly, for medicinal purposes in Ayurveda, this is known as Abharajida, and uh, generally, Ayurvedic people are uh, uh, using the white, to be, uh, the ordinary white variety for a medicinal purpose. And we compared uh, the roots. Uh, root, root is the official part uh, used for pharmacological uh, uh, purposes. And we compared uh, the contents of the roots of the, all the seven and interestingly, uh, a very similar pattern of a chemical profile is found in this uh, bigger white variety as well as this pink variety, uh, which uh, nobody has uh, studied so far. And, and comparatively, they are uh, much easier for uh, cultivation and uh, um, production of uh, more uh, biomass of the roots. So um, they are, uh, uh, potential for not only as ornamental plants, but also as uh, medicinal plants. Next one, please. This is a tribal medicine, Pelionia hainia of the family Apicaceae. Uh, the the Maramandanans of uh, uh, Kerala uh, are the custodian of this information. They uh, used to prepare a medicated oil from the leaves of uh, this particular plant and uh, apply that uh, particular oil in infants to enhance their immunity system. 
So our pharmacology division has uh, made uh, a deep study on this and found that uh, the claim by the tribes is uh, very much true with respect to its uh, immunoenhancing property. So considering the importance of uh, this uh, lesser known tribal ethanomedicinal plant, um, we collected populations from uh, different locations around 25 different accessions were collected and uh, Astonishingly, uh, the morpho variants are very much, very, much, very much prominent in this particular species rather than any other species, with, especially even with respect to the leaf shape, size, and um, these are the seeds. Uh, seeds are very minute. This is the microscopic photography. And uh, even in flowers, this is another uh, interesting uh, species in which uh, much in diversity has observed the Mikana proteins with uh, respect to the fruit size, shape, and all, uh, and also uh, the component of LDAPA component. And LDAPA is the active principle in, in, in Mikana, in which, uh, which is used for Parkinson's disease and all. So the content is also varying with respect to that. So, an elite uh, uh, variety or a variant uh, has to be. Uh, selected from this for uh, future prospects. So these are uh, some of our various examples which we have done, and uh, then we the rest continuing such activities. Uh, uh, this is the 40, 40th year of the institute, and uh, uh, I hope uh, we could uh, one by one we could uh, uh, unravel uh, the secrets of uh, several wild uh, uh, genetic resources of our potential crops. So once again, thanking you all for the patient listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matthew Dan, for a very lucid presentation. And uh, the kind of work which you are doing is uh, very unique. And uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, it is leading to the uh, <clears throat> unraveling of the mystery with the traditional knowledge and the medicinal plan. It's really... Uh, wonderful and uh, there are some questions uh, you can take up on that. Uh, yes sir, please uh, two questions are there sir one yes. from, uh, dr r chitra which compound is responsible for coloring of uh, mara manjal berberin it's an al alkaloid uh, berberin is the compound which is giving that uh, bright yellow color okay. sir the next one is uh, what are the methods to assess the intraspecific diversity Yes, very good question. Uh, it's actually all the biosystematic tools uh, can be used to assess the diversity, uh, including the morphological variations uh, can be assessed uh, both uh, microscopic and macroscopic characters. And of course, anatomy has a major role in it. Uh, many of our uh, observations are, uh, anatomical observations are wonderful uh, with respect to, uh, especially with respect to the pattern of uh, vascular bundle, even stomata, trichomes, all such characters are very relevant uh, to assess uh, intraspecific variability. Then uh, uh, cytology and uh, chemistry has also its own role uh, to delimit uh, uh, the vari uh, variability within a particular species. Uh, sir, another question from participant is, any attempt on crossing between nutmeg and its wild relatives? Very good question. Uh, uh, Nutmegs are uh, unisexual plants, and uh, even normally they have a very uh, dif uh, uh, difficulty in, in crossing uh, because um, it, it requires very specific uh, conditions. A systematic adaptation is very poor in them, and uh, only and we tried uh, two, three species, but never succeeded. I think uh, normally it has a barrier uh, uh, for a crossing. So detailed reproductive biology studies has not been carried out, but um, the chances are very few. Sir, one more question is, uh, is the different uh, morphotypes hmm. of uh, Pallonia are genetically distinct no, genetically also it is different. We have made uh, RFID uh, characterization also, and uh, they are uh, separated into four different plants.
Sir, details requested for any documentation on Mukuna prurians with high L-dopa content. We have not uh, conducted elaborate chemical characterization of, of uh, all these seven, uh, mainly because uh, of the lack of sufficient uh, material. Hardly two, three uh, plants will not be enough uh, to analyze uh, detailed data content analysis. Bulk amount of uh, seeds are required uh, for the chemical characterization. So that's a drawback. So initially you have to cultivate it and, and also it will take some years uh, to uh, standardize and not for content of all these preliminary studies have revealed that uh, it is a much varying with respect to different uh, accessions. Sir, whether uh, Maristica bedomi is used for ah. crossing with nutmeg? No, no, no way. No, no chance. Because they are entirely different uh, two species. And interspecific uh, crossing is very difficult uh, in, uh, in trees like uh, Maristica. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for sparing your valuable time for uh, delivering the talk. Thank you so much. Uh, All the best on, for uh, the delegates. Uh, and once you. again, congratulations to the organizers. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, it's my immense pleasure to introduce Dr. Anam Ganesh Babu. He is Associate Professor and uh, Head Center of Herbal Garden in Transdisciplinary University, FRLST, Bangalore. Sir is a CEO, Imagine Valley Ecoscoping Private Limited, Bangalore. He has done his doctorate in Forestry Botany, Forest Botany, Forest uh, Research Laboratory, University, Dehradun. He's a domain expert uh, at uh, Indian Council of Forestry Research and Education. He's a member of expert committee constituted by the Honorable High Court of Madras for eliminating invasive species and restoration of native ecosystem in Tamil Nadu. He's a member of uh, expert committee for the development of Nandi Hills. And he has created India's unique uh, ethno-medical garden with over 1,500 species of medicinal plants in Bangalore. A standardized propagation protocol for more than 600 wild species. He has submitted biodiversity documentation report for Toyota Kirloskar Motors. He has published many books and research papers and popular articles. He was uh, awarded with the Shelley's Prize 2005 for the best scientific article in India published in the Journal of Indian Forester. Sir, uh, with uh, this uh, brief uh, introduction, I would request you to, sir, uh, deliver a talk on endemic plant conservation in FRLST, a case study. Dr. Babu, sir. Sir, you are not audible, sir. Unmute, yes, sir. Unmute, uh, Ganesh sir. Babu. You are not audible. Not sir, you are not unmuted. Uh, sir. Yeah, yeah. Now. Yeah, audible now. Now audible. Huh. And, uh, the slides are with you. Yeah. You can go ahead. Ah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Dr. Rashir, sir, also uh, for bringing me and giving me this opportunity. I think this uh, uh, screen is shared, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Huh. So, this is on conservation of. Uh, endemic plants uh, from FRLST DDU Bangalore. So endemic plants, as we know, they are facing higher extinction rate due to the inherited natural threats and also external anthropogenic pressures. And consideration of endemic species, as we know, there are two ways. 
one is in situ conservation and other is ex situ conservation and in situ is a natural surrounding we need to conserve the natural surroundings like conservation of its ecosystems natural habitat in miniature level it's my it's micro habitats and we need to monitor them their population whether they are declining or progressing and frlst as it is, it is a dedicated organization for medicinal plant conservation so they have created more than uh, 200 medicinal plant conservation areas capturing various vegetation types and altitudinal ranges and these mpcs are known for high diversity of plants and with high proportion of endemism but our team so that is a center for herbal gardens which is involved in the ex situ conservation of plants that means outside the natural habitats so traditionally we tell uh, field collections so outside the original habitat also ex situ conservation and it usually requires larger areas of land because in the forest means it is already it is natural and existing when we need to create uh, the these kind of habitats or duplicate emulate these kind of habitats we need a larger land and it is also labor in, labor intensive for maintenance and it also requires high monetary or uh, budgetary requirements so as a single organization it is very difficult to do such process so what actually center for herbal garden does there are two types of ex situ conservation two levels of ex situ conservation one at the frlst campus level the other one is outside it's are uh, with the stakeholders partnering with stakeholders in the first level of conservation we have the largest assemblage of live medicinal plants in india which is unique and we have more than 45 thematic layouts and now uh, 1700 taxa of medicinal plants which we have okay and we have created across india over 2.2 million herbal gardens and and more than 1500 institutional or larger level uh, gardens in various states so what actually we do the in the process so we our team goes to protected areas or mpcs and we conduct botanical surveys and we do collection of propagation materials across various habitat maybe whatever green forest or dry deciduous or moist deciduous forest inland freshwater lakes mangrove forest and even shola and typical riparian vegetations so these propagation materials are propagated in our research nursery and we standardize the propagation protocols for these wild plants so it used to be mentioned that over 700 species of wild medicinal plants so we have standardized the propagation protocols and these saplings are conserved as i told earlier the first level conservation at the ethno medicinal garden and these guard this ethno medicinal garden and the saplings are the plants they act as mother stock and again we collect propagation material from these uh, mother stock and we propagate them in our outreach nursery which is over 2.5 lakh sapling capacity and then we partner with the other institutions corporates in the name of ecoscaping landscaping plantations are creating green belts so if we tell just uh, to any partner if you are going to uh, introduce medicinal plants endemic plants and let us collaborate there are people very hardly people they come forward so what we thought why don't we create aesthetic uh, kind of landscaping or ecoscaping so that so many of such partners they come forward to have it so gardening is as we know it is so known as uh, we feel most of us feel it as aesthetic 
so that is how we started creating ecoscaping so how we give a medicine bitter medicine uh, in the way of honey so to by using uh, mixing in honey so we give this bitter medicine so instead of telling them that we are going to conserve plants so indirectly we make them to conserve plants so this is we call it as ecoscaping this is certain images of what we have done in the ecoscaping and this is in the backdrop you can see this is actually uh, evergreen forest type evergreen forest type created in uh, toyota kirloskar motor at bidzi and another aesthetically created aromatic garden and through this garden so we are promoting around 200 endemic species that are conserved at our ethno medicinal garden so the major reference to arrive this uh, endemic plants the endemic and vascular plants of india by botanical survey of india though we consulted other research articles so we have various kinds of endemic plants uh, local endemic or narrow endemic they are restricted to a small area and provincial endemic restricted to the limits of a state and national endemic restricted to the limits of nation and regional endemic restricted to geographical region so we have avoided the near endemics for example if it is endemic to india pakistan india sri lanka india nepal india bhutan so we have not included those near endemics and also continental endemic so if you include these three two categories these two categories it will go around 400 species of endemic in nature so let us see around 20 nero endemic species which are conserved being conserved and again promoted uh, if by our uh, center of center for herbal garden so the first one is acalypha alnifolia this is endemic to andhra pradesh karnataka kerala and tamil nadu and this male inflorescence which is so attractive and so that so we are using it in our gardening and this is andrographis lineata variety lineata again it is endemic to eastern ghats western ghats that is covering the states of andhra pradesh karnataka and tamil nadu so in case of medicinal plant garden so this andrographis lineata variety lineata is we promoted and it is believed that it is uh, antidote for poisonous bites as uh, andrographis paniculata some people they consider this as a superior and efficacious than andrographis paniculata and then this is andrographis lineata variety lavi this is one population in bellary that is sogi forest and chikmagalur one location and chitradurg again jogimatti one location no where else in the world this is very very narrow endemic which is being conserved now we have not yet uh, uh, promoted for uh, landscaping so now we are creating the stock for uh, this and another one is asparagus levisimus that i have seen i think only one population uh, in karnataka so far so this is also very very near endemic and only one plant which we have and we are trying to uh, propagate this and we may be using it in place of uh, asparagus resimosus in gardening and this is another plant which is bahinia finisia which is endemic to maharashtra karnataka kerala and tamil nadu this is very wonderful uh, uh, ornamental it looks very ornamental and you can see the flowers and even the tender leaves it is very very bright and so beautiful and of course it it is we are using it as a ornamental plant in our landscaping or ukscaping so another very 
aero endemic plant which is uh, which is being conserved in our uh, uh, campuses basvillia ovuli folia tiger this is though they call it as eastern guards i think this is only growing in tirupati hills and this is the bark of it and this is a peak and we are now this is again around uh, uh, a uh, seven year old tree which is actually it was growing very slow and now it has started giving branches maybe through uh, stem cuttings we will start propagating this and we will be promoting this also in our gardening as hagonia trees and keraluma stalagmifera and another beautiful uh, endemic plant which is again uh, endemic to karnataka and few few districts of karnataka and few districts of tamil nadu again because of its beautiful nature and and you can see the spindle shape uh, the hairs this is actually the unique and characteristic of uh, identifying this uh, uh, nero endemic keraluma stalagmifera and as it is a, a cute plant we are promoting it as a potted plants as in containers we can also use it in terrariums so keraluma trangata correta again this is another nero endemic karnataka i think you know, two two or three districts of karnataka maharashtra and tamil nadu and this is also very pretty plant very cute and this fellow also we are using it as a in container uh, garden promotion and then this is curcuma karnatakensis so it represents our state and this is uh, originally it is belgam it is this is spelling mistake belgam and chitradurga tarwad and uttarakannada uttarakannada is actually the type locality this is also very beautiful and wonderful gingerbread for uh, promoting in gardening for its the colorfulness and then this is cycas bedomi again though it is considered as kadapa hills i think it is very very restricted near uh, tirupati and only few populations are uh, have been uh, noticed and this is also we are we have uh, almost uh, through the root tubers so we have uh, uh, propagated around 50 uh, uh, saplings and gifted to various institutions to have the germ plasm collection across india and we have few plants growing in our uh, garden and it is very slow growing and another one is another uh, it is uh, 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 endemic to almost southern western ghats we can tell southern uh, western ghats that is kerala and tamil nadu border and decalapis arayal patra earlier it was known as janakiya arayal patra so this plant also so we almost i think we have uh, uh, propagated around 5000 saplings of this and planted in various rock gardens so the seeds of this it it goes well in uh, rockeries and uh, as a companion for succulent garden succulent plant and another one is decalapis hamiltoni again it is endemic to eastern ghats and part of few part of western ghats that is representing andhra pradesh kerala and tamil nadu states and this is also very extensive climb and with uh, curious uh, fruits and it also beautiful plant a uh, climber to to be used in gardening i think more than 2 uh, uh, lakh saplings so far we have planted across the uh, gardens in india and another one is again this is very very narrow endemic and critically endangered is the decalapis salicifolia earlier it was atleria salicifolia and this is also good plant to be promoted in Uh, rock gardens are rockeries so maybe around uh, 2500 saplings we have introduced in different gardens 
and another is erinocarpus nimori this is another endemic plant to goa maharashtra and karnataka do it do this book uh, endemic plants tells that this is a, a endemic to western ghats this we have collected from chitradurga which is a tekan hill chain it is not neither a part of eastern ghats nor a part of western ghats this is growing so another important thing which is linked with this is uh, the bible which we call for anges from taxonomy or flora in southern india is uh, flora of presidency of madras by uh, gambel and somehow he has missed out this beautiful tree species to be to mention in his flora so this is again endemic nero endemic this is a fruit and in our garden this is setting flowering and fruiting profusely and we use it as a avenue plant ornamental a tree in gardening and ecoscaping and another one is ficus dalosi this was collected from uh, anapadi uh, range near uh, tamil nadu and kerala southern western ghats and it is also found in eastern ghats so andhra pradesh kerala tamil nadu and this is a, around 10 year old tree which is growing in our campus and we have done more than uh, maybe uh, 1000 uh, stem cuttings and propagated this plant planted in various gardens and the unique thing is this bleeds blue actually usually we might have seen exudations in red color yellow color white color but this is very unique and this is the characteristic of this uh, ficus dalosi this is also good ornamental plant for avenues and uh, shade to create shade and parking this is heraclium ringens and this we collected from nandi hills this is also endemic to maharashtra karnataka kerala and tamil nadu and we promote this as a uh, butterfly attracting plant and also as a aromatic medicinal plant and this is another uh, very nero endemic and only one locality that is chitradurga in karnataka though it is uh, no uh, called as impatiens mysurensis that is actually represent mysur represents the earlier uh, chitradurga was in uh, mysur state so that is how intra giving the uh, Uh, a locality they have given the state name mysore is but it is not at all found in mysore or elsewhere in karnataka so there are around six populations were located and we are using this balsam endemic balsam in a regular uh, this is the habitat of this in regular gardening as a ornamental ornamental balsam this is also so beautiful plant and it is self propagating so once you introduce in any place in the, maybe in next year so you will see in again in the monsoon they will be propagating themselves through the shed seeds and this is justicia gingiana again only one locality in the world that is vilupuram district of tamil nadu and this is you can see this is known for its uh, a uh, beautiful uh, evergreen uh, foliage and hence we use it in a, in gardening as a hedge plant this is also so uh, more than uh, maybe 10000 to 20000 saplings have been promoted in the name of uh, gardening hedges and this is obrania brachyphylla this is recently it be uh, uh,
hello hello yeah sir sir yeah. kindly and sir are you hearing me yeah yeah uh where where where, where i should start where i should begin again i think you finished uh, ficus uh, uh, dalosi yeah yeah and uh, even after that i think two three obronia sir obronia ah, yeah. obronia yeah. okay dr matthew dan is uh, listening to you ah thank you so much one of my best friend he is yes and this is after obronia no, but uh, now the slides are not visible really yeah share share screen sir share a screen one minute sir Sir, visible, sir. Yes. so this is uh, the another uh, neuro endemic justicia gingiana uh, this is from gingi hills of uh, tamil nadu are you hearing sir now the slides are visible and uh, you are audible ah i am audible okay so justicia gingiana again it is only one population uh, near gingi hills uh, vilupram district of Tamil Nadu, and this is uh, besides it attracts so many butterflies. It is known for its uh, foliage, so beautiful foliage it is has, and hence we use it as a hedge in the gardening. So it forms beautiful wavy edges. Even this is used. Uh, for making, creating uh, topiaries, and this is Oberonia. Oberonia. This is the cutest, uh, I think, and the smallest little known uh, uh, Oberonia amongst its species. And this is Brachyphylla. We collected this uh, from uh, uh, near Sirsi, uh, from uh, Shimoga. When we travel Shimoga to Sirsi, we collected this, and now we are we are conserving it. and we have not yet started a propagating it or multiply it and once we start multiplying this will be the plant uh, for beautiful uh, terrariums so we can even we will try for indoor garden whether it is possible and another one is the final one is trobelanthus barbata again this is endemic to western ghats and this is the relative of the kurunji neela kurunji and the, again it flowers once in Six or eight years, and and this is also known for its foliage, and we use it as as a clipped hedge in gardening, and even it forms a huge uh, uh, view barriers. If anybody wants to use view barriers, that is also possible. No one can see across, so that kind of uh, close uh, uh, and dense foliage, this 
uh, Rebelanthus barbatus has. And that is end of the presentation. Thank you, user. Thank. You. Finished? Huh? Oh yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I and I think uh, this is first time. Yeah, there are some uh, questions in the chat chat box. Sir. sir yeah. Some questions from the participants, sir. Ah, uh, please, please ask them. Yes, sir. Uh, if any chemotypes of particular species should conserved in FRLHT? Chemotypes? Yes, sir. Ah, chemotypes, especially they are in Asimum. In Asimum, there are uh, chemotypes. So otherwise, uh, uh, no other. Okay, sir. Next question is whether andrographis lineate containing andrographolite Ah, uh, that kind of thing. Well, I am not. See, I am a gardener, okay? So I am a gardener, and we promote as a uh, uh, this gardening as a conservation tool. So that is what we do. So we do. I do not. Uh, 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 we don't go into the biotechnology level. I think there will be so many people okay. to answer this. I think. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you so much for organizing such beautiful workshop. And uh, thank you, Rajshikar sir, and uh, thank you, Matthew Dan sir, for listening to my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Ganesh Babu, for coming online and uh, sharing your uh, experience. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anil Kumar, who is the next. Uh, speaker. Uh, sir is a senior director at uh, MS Swaminathan Research Foundation. He is a scientist come practitioner in uh, community biodiversity management currently based at uh, MSSRF Community Agrobiodiversity Center in Kerala. He led the community biodiversity management program of uh, MSSRF for last 23 years. He focused on synergized action in conservation, cultivation, consumption and the commerce elements in sustainable plant genetic resource management in the biodiversity hotspot of southern India. Uh, sir, with the brief uh, introduction, I would like to request you to have a talk on biodiversity and livelihood, Vinod experience. Uh, Dr. Anit Kumar, sir. Uh, yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, I could see Dr. Rajasegaran and a uh, few colleagues sir, there. Afternoon, sir. <laughs> yeah, very good, very good afternoon, very good afternoon. And, uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to be with you. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. I also can see uh, Dr. Dan Matthew, yeah, uh, yeah. Sridhar, Taran, Adak, and so on. Yeah. So let me start by uh, sharing my screen because you had uh, given me some instruction to share the screen. Uh, yeah, yeah, the screen will be better, yes. Can you see the slide now? You can go ahead, sir. You can see the slide. Now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, see the title uh, uh, which had uh, given to me uh, by the organizers is this title: Biodiversity and Livelihood. Why not experience? So I am talking this uh, topic in the context of uh, not only with the reference to your uh, training program on. Uh, uh, horticultural genetic resources, but the larger context uh, when you see, apart from this, uh, is the year of fruits and vegetables. If you see this decade, this is a decade of ecosystem restoration, 2021 to 2030, and also it's a decade of action on uh, sustainable development goals, which has an accelerated action, and also it is a decade of uh, post 2020. Uh, biodiversity agenda. So very, very important. So what I'm uh, trying to say, the next 10 years, so the 2021 is over. 
so this decade is very very important so in this backdrop i am presenting so when you see the biodiversity and livelihood you can see the uh, healthy food production and nutrition so we have to see not just the food production but healthy food production so the quality of the food production is important especially with reference to the nutrition so the green revolution era actually gave us uh, the quantity what you know the what we compromised to us on the quality in the initial stages so uh, when we talk about the quality production the these letters a b c d so the agriculture uh, should be uh, regenerative and sustainable and uh, it should when we say regenerative and sustainable agriculture uh, the important dimension comes in biodiversity especially the agro ecosystems so how diverse our agro ecosystems so that biodiversity dimension and the cultural dimension especially with the reference to our culture in the food system if you take india our cultural diversity we have uh, so immensely uh, impressive Uh, cultural diversity and each culture has got its own uh, food system or uh, for the, the cuisines so we should be able to see that cultural dimension is also taken into consideration while we talk about the food production and the dietary diversity so the dietary diversity as i indicated in the culture every culture has got its own their own diets so this uh, a b c d aspects uh, which uh, msr of uh, <coughs> is actually taking into consideration in all our interventions so the uh, this aspect which we have to see uh, is taken care of uh, transforming our agriculture so uh, the uh, the next 20 25 minutes which i am going to give how msr of is uh, integrating biodiversity culture and this dietary diversity in promoting uh, sustainable agriculture in the wayanad district of kerala so the uh, this is our uh, center uh, it is in the backdrop of uh, this hill called manikunnu mala it is an isolated hill very uh, diversity rich hill and in the lap of uh, this hill uh, we have this uh, center and this center is called community agro biodiversity center as the name implies it is actually a co uh, creative center and i say co creative center we are co creating the uh, future of uh, agriculture and rural development with the local community mainly the resource poor uh, farmers the small holder farmers and also the tribe community so why not uh, is uh, the only district in kerala with the largest percentage of tribe community nearly 17.5 percentage of uh, the population of this district is actually tribe and swaminathan there is no need of introduction uh, swaminathan gave uh, his own personal land in 1997 around uh, uh, 2 hectares i mean 3 uh, hectares of land uh, donated to mssr and later on we added uh, some more land and now we have uh, uh, completed 25 we have completed the 24 years we are in the 25th year now so almost a uh, quarter century and swaminathan uh, uh, named the center as a community center for the agro biodiversity uh, utilization for agriculture and uh, when we talk about the biodiversity uh, i need not to tell to this audience uh, because now you you have uh, listened uh, many uh, talks but the edible plants we have a total number of uh, the food crop uh, species uh, fao has listed some 7000 species Uh, utilized in food and agriculture and but at, uh, at the national scale for any any country uh, it's just uh, 120 or you know around 100 species 
Uh, and if you take uh, the calorie intake, 90% of the world's calorie comes from uh, just the 30 species. So this uh, shows uh, the utilization of diversity is very, very narrow. So we cannot talk about the sustainability when we depend uh, only on a negligible fraction of the diversity. So this is where, you know, the kind of uh, framework, if you see how we use this uh, uh, genetic resources in its full spectrum. So you can see on the left side, the first level users, and we have a three level users, the second level users and third level users. So the, all these uh, users actually influence very much on the management of the diversity. So, but quite often what happened, we talk about or we deal with only this first level users, the farming community or the forest dwelling community and the traditional healers and so on. But the second level users, the seed companies, the research institutions like yours and the research individuals and the multinational corporates and the third level users in our policy makers, our legislators or even our panchayat members and our resource managers and administrators. So uh, when we talk about the community uh, uh, management or community partnership, we have to see all these three levels of users are uh, involved in the management. Uh, so then only the plant genetic resource governance will happen in, a, in an enabling environment. So the enabling environment, we need all these three levels of users. So we try to build up this enabling environment and the our uh, rich biodiversity. So why not, uh, uh, as you, uh, you know, as part of uh, the uh, Western Guards and the Western Guards is uh, a global biodiversity hotspot. And uh, why not, I would say it's a hottest hotspot in the Western Guards. And also it is a cultural uh, hotspots. So we deal with the, uh, the diversity with reference to the uh, national uh, legislations, especially two legislations, the uh, Protection of Plant Varieties and Farmers' Rights Act and the Biodiversity Act and rules, and also the post-2021, the uh, ABS integration, the access and benefit sharing uh, integration that dimension. So this is where uh, uh, our, uh, the how, we are making this into the livelihood development, you know, the kind of plant genetic resources, the production management, the aggregation, the processing, distribution, and the national level and the international level market. This is the framework uh, with which we are working. And this is the uh, district map. And uh, if uh, you want to know why not, uh, why not uh, is actually uh, in, the, in terms of uh, the political terms, it is the constituency, this parliament constituencies, uh, Rahul's, uh, Rahul Gandhi's uh, constituency. And uh, biologically or, you know, the uh, biophysically, this part is the tri-junction in the Nilgiri region. It uh, borders uh, Karnataka and uh, Tamil Nadu. And so the, uh, in terms of uh, socioeconomics, as I said, it's a tribal uh, district. And in terms of biodiversity, it is a rich uh, part. And in terms of uh, the larger political scenario, it is actually the constituency of uh, uh, Rahul Gandhi. So this is a tri-junction and is one of the important area and one of the best two tiger reserves in the country. And it is uh, the richest wild orchid uh, uh, region. Uh, if you see our own studies shows, we have collected some uh, 175 orchid species from this region. So the point is, this is an important, important uh, uh, place. MSS are of, uh, working uh, uh, in uh, uh, different uh, uh, tribal locations. Uh, so when I, uh, when I come to why not, I should uh, talk about not only why not, uh, see the Koryaputu district uh, of uh, India, where you know we have a, a presence of, uh, like our why not a center we have a center in the Parapatu region and we also have a center in Kolli Hills region Kolli Hills of Tamil Nadu where you know the tribe is uh, uh, Malayali tribe uh, and we have a, 
this uh, Wynard region where you know we are uh, working with the uh, tribe community, both the agricultural tribe community and also the forest dwelling tribe community. And why not? Uh, uh, the name implies the name uh, came from wild Nadu. Uh, so wild is actually uh, paddy feet. So Nadu means you know it is the village. So it's actually a village of uh, paddy feet. So though it is a land of uh, forest, it is also a land of uh, uh, paddy fields. And it's a land of uh, tribe community, as I said. If you see the tribe women, uh, they are the custodians of uh, uh, most of the agro biodiversity and the wild biodiversity. So these uh, six communities with whom, with whom we are closely working, the Paniya tribe, the Paniya uh, tribe is a dominant tribe community here. And they are actually in abject poverty. If you take uh, their uh, situation, uh, though they have this uh, employment opportunities, but uh, the alcoholism and you know, many kind of an exploitation uh, happens with this community. They are very, very vulnerable community. And same uh, is the case of Adia, Adia community. And the Katanaika community is a purely a forest dwelling community. And we have Kuruma and Purchia. They are the agricultural, settled agricultural communities. And this Urali Kuruma, they are actually an admixture of, they, they, they kind of, you know, characteristic between Paniya, uh, Kuruma and Kottanaika. They are largely potters, potter making community. So these are the six communities with the, uh, we are working. And we are working with this uh, frame. If you see the uh, biodiversity, uh, we can see uh, the food production system at uh, three levels. So when we say the biodiversity of uh, food system, we are seeing at the three levels. One is the wild food system or the wild food production, the, the left uh, box, which includes the forest ecosystem, the forest genetic resources, the aquatic ecosystems, and the associated biodiversity, plus the crop wild relatives. So we uh, have uh, the kind of you know uh, uh, interventions there in this uh, food system. We have documented uh, uh, the food system in a quite impressive manner. We published uh, uh, the details. So this uh, Kartanaika and uh, Adia community primarily, uh, and also to some extent, the Urali Kurma are the uh, custodian or the dwellers of the uh, wild uh, food production system. And the second level, the middle level, is the subsistent food production system, where you know the smallholder farmers, like uh, the Purchia and uh, Kuruma tribe community, they are in this uh, system. It is a transformative system from the wild food production. So here, you know, the agricultural ecosystem, uh, mostly family-based farming, and also the livestock in small herds. And here, you know, the crop genetic resources, uh, you can see the genetic diversity there, uh, especially in case of uh, staples like uh, rice and also uh, pulses, and also the fruits, banana. If you take uh, banana in Wayanad, we have some 20 varieties of banana in uh, uh, not district alone. And they also depend on the forest genetic resources, not uh, as uh, good as this, uh, the wild uh, uh, food uh, system dependent community. And the third level, this is the evolved level of the uh, food production system, is the market based food production system, where you know the coffee farms and the uh, livestock in large herds. Uh, and also the crop diversity there, but not that much uh, of the subsistence food system here. It is more, this is an evolved system, poly house farming, vertical farming, and all it is coming in. But this is a major system, it is going to be the major system. But what we are trying to say, we cannot have all, uh, only this system is promoted. We need all these three systems to be promoted. They are, then only that sustainability dimension will be there. So MSSR of work uh, with that approach. And if you see the, uh, the drivers, the biodiversity uh, loss uh, very much uh, there, uh, the environmental drivers like pollution, uh, freshwater loss, invasive species, 
and also the socio economic uh, drivers like you know nutrition insecurity land use changes intensive agriculture and so on so this uh, scenario the food security and the nutrition uh, largely depends upon the availability of the food the accessibility uh, uh, to this food and also their absorption capacity particularly the tribe community if you look at their uh, sanitations are very poor and even their water is highly polluted they are not e even if the food is available they have a poor absorption uh, uh, capacity because of poor health and finally the affordability dimension so msr uh, when we talk about the biodiversity management especially the pro biodiversity management we look into all these aspects so this is where uh, uh, this the, this is the frame again uh, which uh, we are uh, into and uh, let me say uh, show you the uh, the profile the uh, the uh, this integrated farming system this tree farming system profile what we have uh, uh, collected uh, from wynad if you take in case of rice there are 26 varieties of rice uh, genetically diverse traditional rice varieties and uh, we are now uh, linking some of the speciality varieties of rice like uh, uh, the sanded rice we have sanded rice here and also we have uh, the speciality rice like medicinal rice and also we have the red rice so we are trying to promote uh, this uh, speciality rice and also we are trying to have a seed village there where you know to see the village where we are trying to uh, engage the cultivation of uh, traditional rice varieties and you can see in case of uh, pulses some four to uh, five uh, varieties and uh, in case of pulse uh, cotton ica tribe they are using some eight to 10 and purichia some four to five varieties and roots and tubers some 20 to 25 roots and tubers mainly yams uh, especially dioscorea including the wild dioscorea they have, they are they depend the uh, uh, cotton ica tribe they are depending on wild uh, uh, dioscorea and you can see the diversity for example if you see leafy vegetables some 50 uh, varieties of leafy vegetables so the diversity is impressive there the genetic diversity or the biodiversity and this is the odisha case i am not uh, going to the details there and if you see the uh, the kind of innovations so we uh, implemented there i think i should spend some time um, on this uh, table how are we uh, intervening Uh, here in Wynad, with reference to the livelihood development. Sorry, as I told you, uh, the innovations or the interventions we work with the species and varieties, and we try to see they are conserved on farm. And uh, this is the diversity we have uh, conserved here: rice around. Uh, uh, 20 uh, though the 26 varieties are there but our age the rice varieties which we are conserving around 20 tubers 36 medicinal plants some 70 pepper some 26 varieties of pepper pulses some 20 pulses citrus some 10 citrus and the wild leafy vegetables some 30 medicinal now turmeric m3 banana some 27 uh, varieties of banana so this uh, genetic diversity be concerned uh, in uh, different uh, uh, hamlets and also in our own garden we have a, a garden a botanic garden so many, many of these species we consider here and we also have a network of the custodian farmers and in case of seed banks uh, we have uh, some uh, seed villages some 20 seed villages we are uh, promoting where you know the traditional varieties are being promoted and we also promote the improved agronomic practices and technologies uh, which we demonstrate for example the system rice intensification for rice and also the modified system uh, of rice intensification and raised bed method and so on 
So this kind of uh, uh, eco-friendly technologies, and in case of yield enhancement uh, uh, trial, we, uh, in fact, with our intervention, some 25 percentage in uh, yield uh, uh, enhancement in case of rice varieties. And also we promote the integrated agroforestry, uh, particularly the homestead farming and mixed crop farming. And you can see the, uh, the details uh, there, uh, some 800 acres of agroforestry we have developed and some 500 acres of homestead farming and 200 acres of mixed cropping farming. And farmers groups uh, and uh, SNGs, uh, self-help groups, women, and we have promoted uh, the um, farmers, farmer producer organization and this producer organization is actually with, uh, uh, very active now, uh, some 300 uh, members. And the agrobiodiversity based products, we have established some uh, processing units uh, for medicinal plants and also processing units for uh, uh, jack uh, fruit and also wild mangoes, uh, bamboo products and uh, bamboo rice. And finally, the knowledge generation uh, the, we maintain, uh, we document the best uh, practices and also we, uh, in fact, uh, we helped uh, the uh, district to prepare the people's biodiversity registers and we train the biodiversity management committees and so on. So the, the kind of interventions in this, uh, this uh, seven areas, uh, uh, with which uh, we are uh, working, and these are some of the results uh, in Wayanad. And this is the uh, framework. Uh, uh, if you see the sustainable value chain development, that which uh, we have to be very attentive, and uh, both the push factors. Normally, people develop the. Uh, market only with these push factors, you know, the kind of uh, just the customers as a target. But the pull factors where, you know, the, the customers, uh, their demands, especially with the reference to the sustainable uh, food, the demand for sustainable food, and also demand for uh, nutrition, nutrient rich food. So this is where, you know, the pull factors dimension, the nutrition literacy and the sustainable food system development. And in case of push factors, the training, and also the technology support. So this framework uh, where you can see uh, on the left side, the community seed farms to the farmer producer distributors to the local markets and how it is helping the SDG. SDG one, uh, the poverty, no poverty. SDG two, uh, no hunger, you know, the zero hunger. And SDG three uh, health. So this uh, these uh, benefits indirectly we are uh, contributing. And if you look at the agrobiodiversity benefits, the as as I have uh, described, the diversity with which we are working, the so diversity be conserved. From there only we are building up the uh, the livelihood of and the societal benefits. So this best resilience mechanism, the SDG thirteen and uh, SDG 12, the uh, sustainable consumption, and SDG 15, the, uh, the life on land, the biodiversity thing. And we are thinking of a community supermarket now, the, the next stage where, you know, the local community are coming together and, you know, uh, uh, marketing their uh, products in a supermarket uh, fashion. And what have we learned in the bioresources management? So the, based on the FAO's uh, five principles of a sustainable food system. So we should, unless we should uh, provide the livelihood uh, provision, we cannot have conservation. So livelihood provision and also the equity provision and the social well-being provision. So this is very critical. And the resource use efficiency, how are they using, including the land use and the conservation aspects, the third aspect and the the governance where this this is where you know the all the three levels of actors coming in you cannot uh, you should not work with the community alone and the resilience of the system the final system there resilience of people resilience of the ecosystem and resilience of the communities 
So this is, I think, uh, my last slide. Uh, we work with the uh, four uh, uh, 5C approach, where the community is at the center, the the, the major force, and then the conservation of biodiversity. That is the next level, and then the cultivation dimension, where you know you should be able to uh, link it with the agriculture. Then only there is livelihood dimension through the cultivation, and the pull dimension. I said the consumption. This dimension, unless there is a demand for the diversity and the sustainability, you cannot have the kind of you know cultivation in, the, in a uh, genetically uh, diverse manner. And the commerce dimension, where you know the responsible commerce. So this is where this approach, the commerce is done in a very responsible manner, in partnership with the local community. So this is where uh, the uh, MSSRF uh, case, uh, as I uh, started uh, telling, the community center where, you know, I would say this could be a model for the uh, 21st century uh, where, you know, uh, particularly when we are struggling with this pandemic uh, uh, disruption, the post-pandemic world, how we build better back if you want to build a better back, you have to have a, a diversity as the major trust. So the nature-based solution, when we say nature-based solution and community-based intervention, so this will be definitely be a model to be replicated for our country. So with this, I stop here and I once again thank uh, the organizers for having me to deliver this talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, for uh, enlightening us regarding the link between the biodiversity and livelihood. And it was an excellent lecture. In fact, uh, all of us, uh, you know, we are in the watertight compartments. Uh, we never uh, link. Uh, we are not able to link with the uh, you know the community and uh, there comes the importance of uh, the organizations like uh, Swaminathan foundation in fact uh, i have been uh, always uh, you know a pleasure to associate with you people and the community biodiversity center and uh, uh, i have uh, two uh, queries to you uh, one is uh, uh, see, among these three models, you know, one is the Koraput, another is the Koli Hills, and uh, your Vainad uh, uh, models. I was just seeing that uh, uh, very exhaustive slide, uh, uh, the table, uh, which will be, uh, you know, the uh, which will be the difficult one and which is the very successful one uh, in your uh, opinion. Because there are, uh, you know, uh, because I, I found when I was uh, visiting the uh, Orissa, uh, <clears throat> Orissa, I found, you know, they are uh, very backward district, this Koraput district and all. And you cannot compare with the Vainad because Vainad, I found that most of the tribals are highly educated and uh, uh, very enterprising. So this, uh, uh, if you can throw some light on this aspect, I um, will be happy. Uh, sir, you are muted. You are not able to hear you. Sir, unmute yourself, sir. Not able to hear you. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I can. I, 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 no, earlier, I, I, I was not able to. So you asked me the difficult uh, difficulty in the uh, yeah. intervention in the, among these three sites. I would say we could have to only. Uh, uh, but yes. it is a paradise of uh, the genetic diversity and yes. whatever yes. diversity we are talking about. Yes. But the problem is, you know, it is uh, they are, you know, in the, in the that 19th century or you know, 20th century kind of uh, living standard and also the political environment, uh, though now the Navin government is good, but uh, we, they, it's difficult. The terrain is no, it's not so easy as uh, why not? Why not is a uh, part of the progressive state like Kerala? where you know the people are uh, particularly the local self-government uh, system our panchayats are so active 
so uh, yeah because of that you know especially in the pbr uh, and uh, the biodiversity related aspect minad is a model as i was uh, telling you when yeah, you were yeah, 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 having yeah, this yeah. Uh, seed festival there is no doubt about yeah. it yeah. Yeah, and yeah. in fact i was involved in the pbr making uh, two districts of uh, karnataka i found here it is very difficult they have no idea about biodiversity but uh, vinad is uh, uh, forefront of it another yeah. Uh, yeah another issue which i thought uh, uh, is this is possible to repeat this uh, uh, replicate this in uh, other uh, states or other uh, places uh, your models i think uh, that will Definitely. that that will be a great boon to the other uh, states uh, you know the <laughs> because most of our problem can be solved if you are able to link biodiversity with the livelihood and yeah, i think yeah, that yeah. there comes the intervention of uh, mssr of <coughs> like yeah, 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 yeah. no i i agree with you because now we i suggest every district uh, we need a community biodiversity center exactly, of yes, this country yes, yes of this country so if we can uh, promote such kind of a community center where you know you are working in partnership with the local communities we cannot uh, see the kind of transdisciplinary science we should respect uh, our age old uh, traditional knowledge and you know the traditional wisdom and their practices innovations and uh, uh, effectively blend with the modern science and technologies yes. this is the only way i would say if you really want to bring the sustainability and the inclusiveness in the development so i suggest uh, i recommend if we can replicate this in uh, all places we would be very happy to associate to wherever possible very good sir Th thank you very much for your enlightening you, lecture sir thank you very much uh, so shall i leave yeah or uh, any any questions or uh, uh, otherwise or so uh, uh, we okay. we get any questions we will share with you sir. so please for... okay thank you thank you thank, thank you very you. much okay Yes, yes. It's an honor to introduce Dr. K. Sarvi. Uh, Ma'am is currently working as associate professor in Department of Entrepreneurship. in geetam university bangalore she was previously holding the position of vice president healthcare uh, febritronics private limited bangalore with the 12 years of experience in r&d ip policy analytic analysis and project management she comes from the multidisciplinary background with doctorate in biotechnology from icr ihr llb from karnataka state law university P pg d d dip r from national law school of india university pdf in ipr from any institute of science she has served as a state consultant with the with karnataka biodiversity board for implementation of biodiversity act 2002 also founder and partner at inca ecological solution and visiting professor with transdisciplinary university with this brief introduction uh ma'am i request you to have a talk on maduka in cygnus a case study of restoration of uh, this uh, threatened species uh, sorry ma'am yes um are you able to hear me yes sir you can go ahead yes so thank you for the introduction and uh, thanking thank you for having me uh, in this platform so feels nice to you know connect with people of the same domain uh, now that i've moved out into a different uh, branching as such so uh, today i would be talking about my research work which i did as a part of my phd it was on a species called as maduka insectus and how did we go down to conserve this species is a story that i would be telling you today and let me just share my screen so that So, so are you able to see the screen go for uh, yeah now it's uh... yes right uh, so today i would be speaking about maduka insectus uh, 
critically endangered tree species. And uh, we would be looking into how exactly we started our work on this particular species and uh, where we have reached and what are yet the other things that can be done in this area. Because I think in audience, we might have some really good researchers. We might have students who would want to take further lines of research ahead. And I'm just hoping that, you know, this is a very interesting study and hoping that there would be some takeaways from the study and, you know, you can take it forward. So uh, basically, before I go into my species, I'm gonna be speaking on something very general. So what you see in the screen is the African gorilla, okay? Now, this is a species that was told to be extinct. That is, it is no more found. And after a very long period of time, uh, in 2007, it was rediscovered. After it was rediscovered in 2007, by 2014, the population number was so low that it was again put under the category of critically endangered in IUCN. Now, the question is, you know, why has this species gone into extension? Is because, um, you know, I've given a couple of reasons. I say that there is no proper breeding. There's a lot of human activity. There is a lot of fragmented population. And, you know, there are lots and lots of research which has been done on these lines. Maybe for the very reason that it is an animal species and, you know, we are uh, in the verge of losing a very good uh, species as such from the surface of Earth. So there's a lot of work which is being done in these lines. And if you just give as the African gorilla, you will see hundreds of articles written on this. But, you know, especially us researchers who come from a plant background, what we realize is that we have numerous such species when it comes to the plant kingdom but hardly there is any emphasis that has been given on those species, except for few of the dedicated researchers, of course, most of you who are attending the program today. So I'm just replacing this African gorilla, you know, with Madhuka insectus, the topic that I'm gonna be speaking about, okay? So everything else remains the same. This was the species that was first reported in 1882. It was classified as extinct in the year 1998, and it was rediscovered in 2003. But as of today, you know, uh, I mean, today, yes, of course, its status has been update, updated, but however, it is still critically endangered. Now, the reasons are as to why this particular species went down in its population number kind of remains same as that with the African gorilla. And we we would also discuss on it in further slides, right? So, but I'm just meaning to the, the contrast that I was trying to bring in here is that when we give so much of emphasis and importance to species in the animal kingdom, why not give it to some of the plant species as well, right? So, uh, as I said initially, this was a species which was rediscovered and uh, until last year, uh, it was still uh, supposed to be put as extinct under IUCN. It was rediscovered by Dr. Butt from Mangalore, of course, and he was our beacon in this particular study. So we are always grateful to him in that manner. And uh, to go ahead, you know, the first thing that started for us was we were supposed to do a research on the species, try to increase its population number, which was a part of the DBT funded project. And it was also my doctoral program at that point of time. And uh, first thing that we started with was what is with the species? There are numerous species. Why is it that this particular species has gone into extinction or its numbers are so low, what is the reason? So we started thinking or uh, you know, uh, analyzing it more in terms of a puzzle. So we started thinking whether is it climate change or is the species not able to adapt or is it that there is a lot of human activity which is anthropogenic activities of course or maybe there's some landscape changes and we are losing the species. So the first question was that, you know, why is the species going into extinction? And in order to answer that question, we had numerous other questions that came into our place. Firstly, what is the current status? So yes, it was rediscovered. So Dr. Butt had uh, mentioned that there are two uh, tree species of this. There are two, two trees existing in a village called as Kapu in Mangalore. 
And uh, other than that, there were few other reports by few other researchers who suggested that, you know, they had seen the species or located the species in this particular location and all that. But none of it was something that we had personally gone or witnessed or seen. So it was very important for us to first take up some field studies. So we took up some exploratory studies and uh, we followed the secondary literature that was available uh, in terms of publications on this particular species. And we were able to locate Madhuka insignis in its natural habitat based on the information that we have got from the literature. And of course, we had great lot of help from people who had already worked on the species. So we were able to identify all these, you know, these are the single type species that we have found, type plants that we have found from different locations. And uh, we documented its um, population status. We documented uh, what is its niche habitat. We documented how many plants are there in a given area. All this passport data, basically, what you collect. So all this was collected by us. And what we also did was we turned to tools. Right. So as researchers, especially people from the taxonomic background and uh, hardcore botany background, one thing that we tend to do is we take up really good field surveys. We do really good field surveys, but we fail to explore newer tools and technologies which is available, right, which could actually help us much better in the kind of work that we are doing. So what we did was we turned over to a tool, a wonderful tool called as ecological niche modeling. So it's basically a software wherein um, we gave the input of data in terms of lat and long, that is wherever we had seen the species, we collected the latitude and longitude from those areas and we gave that as the raw data. So what you see here on the left hand side of the map is a distribution map, which is basically we were able to identify this species in nine locations based on secondary literature and that is the black dots that you are able to see and based on this data the model or uh, the tool was help uh, helped us get a model which would predict that what is the possibility based on this data that the species can be located in other regions as well so what you see on the right hand side is the uh, map it's a predictive map and the red portion is the area which says that it is more suitable for the availability of the species based on the data that we have given, which we have collected by going to the location and verifying that the species is existing there. Okay. So once we got this map, we superimposed this on Google Earth, which helped us, you know, actually find our way and explore these areas and see if the map or the model was actually working well. So, you know, any software is more like a Google. Google means, you know, you just give in information, it will give you a, a, some kind of result. But how sure are you that the result is perfect? If not perfect, is it even reliable, you know? So that is when we took up explorations based on the map that we got. So based on that map, we had it superimposed on Google Earth. We found out certain, uh, you know, landmarks and contacting local people there. We took up explorations in those areas and we were able to identify three new populations, three new individuals in the area which was predicted in the map, the red portion which has been predicted. So in those areas, we were able to identify. We haven't explored all of it. Okay, I'm, uh, only places where we had some kind of uh, help to go and explore is the areas that we looked into. And there we were able to identify three new individuals who were not reported in the previous literature at all. So with this and with the existing data, we were able to come out with a quantitative number of how many individuals actually exist in nature. So we keep speaking that, you know, a species is coming under RNT, RET category, it is rare, it is endangered, it's threatened, but what is its actual number, right? So that is what we were able to come out with. Maybe there are even more and more explorations and more such tools might help us, you know, find them. And uh, once we got to know the number, the question again here was, you know, this was a species which was a little controversial in nature. Okay, so uh, 
uh, I would also say as to why it is controversial in nature, because if you see this, I've put two photographs, the plants look nearly the same, okay? There isn't much of a difference in terms of its morphology. And, but I would say the top one is our species of interest, which is Maduka insignis. And the bottom photo is what is Maduka nerifolia. Now, Dr. Butt gave me some very good pointers of how you actually differentiate both the species. So he said that when Maduka insignis uh, leaves mature, they tend to become rounded in the edges. Whereas nerifolia, it doesn't normally happen. You know, they are always long and pointed. They don't become rounded. He also suggested that, uh, I think Dr. Shinoi from Pilu, Pilikula Nisargadama, he gave me another pointer, wherein he suggested that, you know, the calyx of Maduka insignis is very hairy in comparison to Maduka nidifolia. So these were small distinctive uh, parameters that only taxonomists, you know, can help us uh, identify the species. And I do not come from a taxonomic background. So I really, it was a back on for me, you know, it was of great help. But the question was, you know, what if the plant is young? And in order to see a calyx, you know, it should fruit, it should mature, they should be flowering. It's going to take a lot of time. How do you identify the species? So this is again a photograph wherein we have fruits of Maduka insignis and nerifolia. The fruits looks nearly alike and uh, the seed also kind of look nearly alike. Maybe yes, in the diameter, the size and the shape, there might be slight changes. Even in the fruit TSS content, there were slight changes, okay? But this is only when we have fruiting possible that you're able to differentiate. But if you have young plants, how are you gonna differentiate? And all the places that we took up exploration, we weren't sure that, you know, actually, uh, if the plant is going to fruit or flower, that we can wait and confirm whether it is Madhika insignis or not. The plants, some of the places, the plants were pretty young. So that's when uh, we came up with another tool, another supportive tool uh using biotechnology wherein we were able to uh, develop a scar marker so what we did was we isolated dna from samples of nerifolia and insignis and from this dna we uh, identified or developed a scar marker which was specific only to insignis so when i took the samples and amplified what you see on top the bands that you see on top are all insignis bands and uh, the left hand side after the ladder which is all empty is basically nerifolia so basically the primer amplifies only maduka insignis samples as it's a species specific marker and it doesn't amplify those of nerifolia so this was one tool that we identified in order to differentiate these two species other than the taxonomic differentiation as well Right. So in the process, we also did a phylogenetic study to understand, you know, what is its relationship? Are they actually different? Or as some of the people, uh, you know, discussed, some of the researchers discussed that, no, they are just two same species, but, you know, nerifolia and insignis is the same, but they've just evolved a little bit. You know, there's been some adaptational changes that happen. So when we did a phylogenetic study, what you see on top, is basically insignis, all the samples of insignis that we collected. And you'll see that bottom, there is a clade where uh, nerifolia is in a separate, uh, you know, in a separate step, like it is not along with the insignis samples. So it means that they're closely related. However, they are not same. There is some genetic difference, which is also obvious in terms of the size, shape, TSS content, and so on and so forth. So this was again one uh, step that we did. So first we found out how many species, act, I mean, how many individuals actually exist in nature. Then we came up with a tool to identify, you know, if they are authentically Maduka insignis. Next question was that now knowing the population number and confirming that it is insignis, we wanted to understand as to why the species on the first case went into extinction. Why did its population number go down? So when we speak about conservation, we speak about conservation strategies, we say we're going to do tissue culture to conserve species, or we're going to do X2 conservation measures, unless until we are able to address the issue or answer the question, 
as to why the species first went into ex extinction. I don't think measures that we come up would actually support really well, right? So that's when uh, we started looking into the reasoning as to why the species went into extinction. So this uh, was just a survey wherein we took a survey of the individuals in 2012-13 and we took the same areas were visited again in 2013 and 14 as well and for a couple of years following that time. but in 12 13 and 13 14 we saw that there was a reduction in the number of individuals now why did it reduce was also one of the reasons why i would suggest that the species is facing some kind of threat so these were the numbers that were reduced so in you can see there were three in Mangalore and then it reduced to one. So there was a reduction in number. Now, one of the hot belt areas of the species, that is, the, this is one type location wherein we were able to find some three to four really mature fruiting and flowering trees. Okay. But this area was prone to sand mining. So when there was continuous sand mining happening, the root system was getting weakened. And this species, although it was fruiting and flowering, there were no young plants nearby. There are other reasons for it, which we would discuss as well. And uh, uh, whatever trees are standing, if their root system is weakened and the tree falls, there's no way of getting them back, right? So there was one imminent danger in terms of the demographics of the area and in terms of the anthropogenic activity which was happening there. So we felt that is also one reason why the number is going down. Okay, so this is again, a, a, these are the Maduka trees that you see and that is where the sand mining right next to its root, you know, there's sand mining that is happening. And this is of course illegal sand mining and you can't do much about it, right? And uh, there was another thing that we noticed, though this is not quite a relevant factor in terms of, you know, the population number really going down. But then we also noticed that, you know, when there is fruiting and the fruits are extremely sweet. So the fergivores, that is monkeys and elephants and all, they're very fond of these fruits. And they would just come, they would feed on it. They, the monkeys would play around the plants. They would pull down the fruits. So when the fruits don't ripen, there is no seed set and the seeds don't fall down you don't see any younger saplings. And there was quite a lot of destruction that went around happening with these trees, you know, in these particular areas. So these are small reasons. I wouldn't say they completely contribute to its extinction, but small reasons all, to, all put together, you know, might, you know, contribute to its extinction. And we also did an uh, phylogenetic study, as I told previously. So we wanted to see that Fine, you know, there are other species also which are undergoing changes when it comes to demographics, where there is a lot of anthropogenic activity, even Nerifolia. The sister species is also undergoing the same changes. But why is it that it is not going into extinction? And why is only Maduka going into Maduka insect is going into extinction? So we thought maybe the species inbuilt ability in the genetic level is not that good enough that it's able to adapt to the changing scenario or the climatic changes whatsoever be it, whereas the sister species could adapt. So to do that, we did the phylogenetic study and what we realized that, you know, all Maduka insignus, if you see the samples that we have collected was all grouped together, closely grouped together. So basically there is no, uh, you know, there's a lot of inbreeding which is happening. And it is, what you say loss of genetics that you know when there's a lot of inbreeding happening the plant or any species as a matter of fact undergoes a lot of uh, changes which makes it more susceptible they are not more adaptable right so there is no adaptation which is happening according to the darwinian theory what we speak of or the survival of the fittest and all that so there was a lot of inbreeding that was happening so that was one reason also that we thought can be a reason that the species is going into extinction then there was another thing that we realized was this species was found on the banks of the river Kumaratara. And maybe even if young plants would have come or if the seeds had fallen on ground and um, 
the face of its fruiting and flowering is right with the time that the rains fallen or sometimes when the dam sets are open and there is washing away of these younger plants or seeds without the younger ones actually germinating there. So maybe that is also one. So these are all more of hypotheses. They are more of maybes. So potential researchers can take them up as topics and you know really study on these lines. So these were some of the pointers that we came out thinking that you know uh, this might have caused extinction. Now we identified the number of populations we confirmed that they are insects. We came up with some reasons, hypothesis as to why they went into extinction. But what was more important was in order to conserve them, you need to prove that they are a species worthy of conservation, right? So unless until a species is proved to have some value, although as scientists we say that all species are important, you need to give them due credit and all that, you know. But when you're speaking to a normal lay person, and if you say that there's a use for this particular thing, then they would show more interest to conserve the species. So with that mindset, we wanted to see if this particular species has any potentiality in terms of its usage. So obviously we went in for the chemical profiling. We did a chemical profiling with crude extracts of the plant. And uh, we came up with a lot of compounds out of which based on certain compounds that is showing parallels to anti-cancer activity, we thought, okay, let's see if we can study its potential usage for anti-cancer activity. So we started with a number of cell lines. Uh, we started with breast cancer uh, because being a woman, I thought, let me do something for women. And I started with breast cancer, of course. And then we also did osteoporosis. We did it for liver cancer. And we were fortunate enough to see some really good results in inhibiting cancerous cells in liver cancer. Right, so that was one study that we did until the uh, cell line, and this needs to be taken to the next level, wherein it needs to be taken to animal models, and then you know proved with formulations and all that. So this is again a potential area for young researchers today, right? So this was the cancer cells and uh, what we have treated. So basically, it just means to say that it has a potential anti-cancer activity. Now the question was, we've proved that it has some use, its number is going down, all that done. How are we going to conserve the species? So this is ultimately the talk of the day, frankly telling you, know, of what I'm supposed to be speaking. So for me, conservation or for us, uh, me and Dr. Rajkikran, uh, conservation was not in the lines of, you know, just doing it's 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 uh, Yeah, so we wanted to increase its number. And how would we do it? So we realized that the young ones would fall in the area, but however, they were not germinating. And we collected the seeds, brought it to lab. We did planting, but they, were, they would germinate, but they would not sustain after a given point of time. And we also saw that the sister species, which was Madhuka nirifolia, was able to survive really well. And its population number had not gone down. So what we did was we isolated the endophytic uh, bacteria which was present in the nodules of uh, insignis and nilifolia. We ruled out the common uh, endophytic fungi and bacteria. We only took the ones which was unique to nilifolia and ones which were not toxic to humans. We made a mixture of them, different combinations of them, and uh, we planted the maduka seeds in a mixture of sand and soil, and we gave treatments of these microorganisms that we have isolated from the sister species. And we were amazed with the results because as you see, the one on the left-hand side is the uh, one which was treated and the right-hand side is the untreated one. So basically, although we had germination, we had issues with the sustainability of the plants. And this uh, you know, mixture of uh, endophytic fungi helped us, or endophytic bacteria helped us sustain the plants. And we were able to, so this also showed that they increased the growth levels, the leaf, the general statistic tests that had to be done. We took shoot length, number of leaves. So we didn't take up any destructive methods because we were not in a position to lose any plants, right? So we took up some basic tests to see the difference. And then uh, we were able to successfully multiply the species in lab conditions in our nursery in IHR. And after we did this, what we did was something which I feel is more like a case study, you know. 
So based on the tool that we had, ecological niche modeling tool, and a map that we had got through, the, the, through that tool, we identified certain locations which are hotspot areas for reintroduction of this particular species and uh, for augmentation, frankly, rather than reintroduction, I would say augmentation. And we were also very keen of not just introducing anywhere that, you know, it showed a possibility to survive. The models show the possibility. But we kept in mind that this is a riparian species which, is, which needs to be found near the water body. Plus, we wanted someone to follow up on the species even though we are not there personally. So we took it up in different levels. So in Mangalore itself, where we had found more, most of the indigenous, Based on the software, we identified uh, uh, locations which are closer to a river body and where we had people to follow it up for us. We planted these plants. We took it from our nursery and we planted it in these places. So this was done in the first level. And uh, we did it in a place called as um, Fosmata. Sorry, let me just go back here. Yes. So we did it in a place called as Hosmata, which is also near Kumardara River Bank. We did it in Kidu, which is, uh, we have our own ICR institute there. So we had people to follow up for us. So we did it there. So it was the same environment, same climatic environment, everything same. And it was in wild. The next step level was in protected uh, place. So in Mangalore itself, we went down to Pilikula Nisargadama, wherein we were sure that it can be protected. Um, somebody was there to take care of it and we planted there. So the next level was to bring it out of its um, you know, comfort zone. So we planted a few plants in IHR where it would be taken care of. And we also uh, gave a few plants to uh, FRLHT and a few other, I think even Malabar Botanical Garden, we've given a few plants. These are environments which are much different from the environment that it actually belongs to. So this was also one way of how we try to increase its population number. Time is yet to say, you know, if when it fruits and flowers that how successful we were, but right now there's been a follow-up and we've seen that most of the plants have survived in all these places that we had planted. So this was one way of ours of, you know, trying to bring it back to nature. Now the question was, we didn't stop there, we also, did a, went a little extra a step after this work was done. We did a modeling again to find out that when the climate change happens, you know, we keep speaking about climate change scenario and all that. In 2020, 40, 60, 80, what will be the condition of the species? And accordingly, if there is some kind of policy recommendations that needs to be done in order to conserve species like this, so this can act as a guide, you know, that, okay, see, the number's gonna go down and you need to do this. So that's how we use the model. Further, we also came out with a route map of uh, in XQ, what can be done, in INSTU, what can be done for the species, like developing nurseries, creation of FGBs, and how do you go about creating it? And in order to maintain these FGBs, you need to generate revenue. So value addition, value added products is important. That is more in lines of the usage that we were trying to show. There are many other potential usages that can be explored. So all this also is something that we looked into. And uh, of course, we came up with uh, extended uh, populations, that is new populations that was identified. And um, we are very proud to say that, you know, our work on Madhuka in sickness was the beckon or the guiding for uh, um, Mr. Uh, Gyani from um, uh, Kerala to actually have the status of Madhuka in sickness changed from extinct to critically endangered. So it was shown as extinct, which means that it's no more found but then the status was changed to critically uh, endangered. And 90% of the recommendation was from our research work that we had done that he had presented in order to get the status changed. So this was one contribution that we had done. And further to this, as I was discussing, there are a lot of other untouched things in this work, which can be carried upon. And some of the areas are taxonomic studies or there might be issues in terms of its reproductive biology. We don't know what exactly is happening that you know the species is not able to survive. So reproductive biology is an area that can be studied, habitat uh, restoration, value addition studies, and maintenance of FGBs. There are a lot of scientific tools that can be explored. Even bioinformatics can be explored to a larger extent.
you know, so an awareness and outreach in terms of sand mining or demographic changes to help sustain the population, which is already there. So all this can be basically done is what I've given us future priorities. So yes, with this, I think I would end my talk. And any questions, I would be happy to answer. So yes, how many seedlings of the species were multiplied? We were able to multiply about 550, but we have introduced in wild 300 numbers. So in the forest area, we have introduced 300 number of this seedlings. Anything else? So I assume that there are no questions. How was it multiplied? Yes. yes. So uh, what we did was we collected the seeds from the type locations. Whenever we went in for exploration, we took it twice in a year. And uh, we made sure that we go during its fruiting and the flowering season. And uh, we would pick out the seeds which drop down to the ground and collect the seeds. We would bring it back to the lab. And then we tried to replicate the same scenario because it's a riparian species. We were uh, bringing the same ratio of sand and soil and we would plant the seeds and it would germinate. There was no issue with germination, absolutely no issue. We had close to 98 to 100% germination at times. But the issue that we faced was more in terms of the sustainability of the plants. So the plants would germinate after it comes to a four leaf stage or a five leaf stage, you know, it would start wilting. And that is when we isolated the endophytic uh, fungi or bacteria, which was associated with the sister species. And we came out with a formulation which we applied to this seedlings, which had germinated. And maybe, you know, it was stroke of luck for us that, you know, it worked and uh, the plant started growing. And that is what we reintroduced into wild. So if you are asking me if I've bring, brought in any technology in terms of tissue culture or something, no. We didn't do it. Uh, we went in for a more natural method of multiplying the species. Plus, given that it's a tree species, it's quite hard to do in tissue culture. We did give a try. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Bindu. Uh, Shridhar, stop now. Share the online results online, possible. Yes. So everybody, you can see the results of the questions which you passed to the participants. Okay. Yeah. And you see the comment from uh, Binu Mathi, excellent and enriching presentation. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, now you can uh, stop sharing, Sridhar. Uh, let me introduce uh, next speaker, Dr. Uh, Sridhar Gautam. He is a senior scientist at uh, AICRP Fruits at uh, ICR IHR. He is basically a plant uh, physiologist. His area of interest are plant physiology of agriculture and horticulture crops and plant phenology. Interested for opening up of data and information, open access and uh, open data an application of free and uh, open source software in agriculture research. He has a, in, inducted into the Glasco working group, uh, Venus uh, Communis, uh, Accesso Abertoon, Common and Open Access, member of uh, board of uh, AgriX, an open access uh, preprint repository of agriculture and allied sciences and thesis commons an open access thesis repository. Currently involved in the projects of uh, ICR, All India Quantity Research Projects on Fruits and, and in Institute funded projects. So uh, 
Dr. Sridhar, with this uh, brief introduction, I would request you to have a talk. <coughs> yeah, thank you, Rajiv. Uh, talk on uh, your uh, PGR database with a special reference to horticulture. Uh, hope my slides are visible. Yeah. It's full screen or? Yeah, yeah full screen. Fine. Uh, see, I need to rush quickly and we are running out of time. Uh, the morning lectures, probably uh, you're all well versed with some of the uh, informatics as Zuni Lachek sir was saying. Uh, mine will be of a brief uh, on that aspect, but it is from the global point of view. What are the initiatives happening on PGRs? And if there are any on the uh, HGRs, okay. Uh, to go with this, like the efforts on the globally, uh, the global arena are being happening. Uh, and the second global plan of action, that was the document which was for, put, forth, put forth by the FAO and uh, other uh, partners of those who had come together to safeguard the PGR for the agriculture and food and agriculture. So they have uh, put up some priorities in which the access to the information, data and information was the priority. And even the CBD also talks about the data sharing. Uh, it's only to conserve the things or to have the data uh, benefit sharing or to safeguard some of the things and to exchange the information data or the materials. So that was the point. And globally, uh, efforts are being made. And uh, in India, we have seen from the NPGR point, how the PGR informatics is working on collecting the data, digitizing, getting and putting onto the portal for our benefits. Okay, uh, that was uh, GPA and then with the international plan treaty, the plan treaty, which has put up uh, this kind of a uh, interface, which has all the sources of PGRFA, from the GLIS, Global Information uh, uh, System. So it has uh, uh, getting the data from the national and the international agencies, which I'll be coming in the next slide. See, these are the international multi-crop databases. From these data, this uh, Plantity interface will capture the data and make it available. Apart from this uh, international multi-crop databases, we have the national crop base, based databases, all the uh, like countries are coming up with their own, uh, the portals or the databases, national portals, national databases. And there is a harmony in organizing the data or the data schema, everything is happening. And that is being uh, looking af looked after from the global uh, agencies, which are working on this biodiversity or the uh, the volunteers who are involved in that or the FAO, which is mainly responsible for the plan treaty. Okay, uh, some of these screen graphs, I would like you to look at it. Uh, this is Genesis, which is based, mostly based on the, mostly it is only for the food and ag uh, agriculture crops and it has all the uh, records taken from the, again, multi uh, uh, lateral kind of thing, which the producer was also saying. Uh, it has the crop trust, which is uh, the backbone of this, and uh, all these centers are contributing to this uh, data database. And there is a, another genetic resource gateway, which is which I am which is also uh, about the genetic uh, planting material, but not for the food and agriculture. But it it also has it. It is from the Europe 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 gateway. Similarly, uh, the European cooperative also has the initiative to have their own uh, that whole region for that and also have the national databases. And there, this, uh, the crop trust or the, um, the global forums with the support of the other agencies are also making the software available, which will uh, help any national, uh, any nation to make their database online open and then get connected with the uh, global databases. The green project is on that. And uh, biodiversity is also having its own database collection uh, from the other places where they are working through the CG partners. It is also putting on their website 
we can all search with the different queries and all is now the data is not just data it is now superimposed with the geographical information system so that you can identify such with the maps uh, with all the timeline or whatever like there are visualizations you can make it uh, we have the uh, global seed board is also one uh, database which has the information on the uh, seed port seeds and coming to the india initiative which uh, the i was saying it is through the uh, global information sharing mechanism because we are also part of the fao and then gpa so through that we have started uh, working on this and the the nodal agency to have this to be put on place is npbg here morning we had a, a lengthy discussion on that uh, with the priorities from the gpa and cbd okay so there are so many uh, uh, what is that the web applications or mobile applications they are making and much of the data we can get it accessible and it is available for the downloads in any formats uh, this was the interface was uh, was uh, we can visit if you go to a pgr portal you can search with the crop names or anything which we have seen in the morning and when these databases are being made and you need a standards and the the communities are working to put up a global standards because standards are necessary to have a interoperability the data has to be uh, connected to the global or from the global we should take it and then our data should be in a particular format so so this is the one uh, biodiversity informatics standard working group which is working on that along with there is a research data alliance which is uh, working with the biodiversity data integration uh, interest group they are both working for the global uh, standards and uh, i would like you to look at this uh, the uh, gbif which morning angadi sir or before that uh, vasu sir was saying gbif this has the all the data records publications photographs uh, gis locations whatever like whatever you think about about a biodiversity it has there so it has so many what is it how many crores if somebody can help me uh, you can see so many crores of records are there so data sets are there and all in is available under open access data you anybody can uh, download it and then make a papers and through this data there are 6000 publications have come up and that is uh, they are on our website chase and the, the nice visualization they are putting up see the data this much records have been now visualized as a So what is this graph visualization graph and if you explore you can see from 1600 to till date how the records are being uh, globed on to the uh, uh, globe so this is the beautiful of the visualization having the gis databases and all uh, wherever they i think more of the red means more data or yellow is that needs to be find out and then we have as species Uh, this is uh, this has been put forth by india and there's a group people and uh, it is again the data is licensed under cc by which means that you can use it for even commercial purposes as well okay so uh, that uh, and then that uh, portal has a data about the about india and also from india so that data also again visualized using the points on the gis and we have the india biodiversity uh, portal that is also again uh, free and open access to uh, information this is the indian part and again it is backed by the communities which are working on like philanthropically or putting their efforts to uh, build a big database so this is a community initiatives happening and we also have the government initiatives through uh, pgr portal of npgr so like that everybody is now working towards making the data available uh, so uh, this uh, i don't have the uh, uh, google forms i would like you to look at this grab your mobile phones and type menti.com menti.com and in that you use this code 70856507 or if somebody can scan my uh, this qr code you can do it i'll give you just pass for some time menti.com 70856507 okay because i need to change the slides 
this is here here also it is there please go to menti.com and use this code and answer the questions there great so we have one response agree how many of us will agree that germ plasm should be common are there any no opinions quickly we will go for next time is running so i'm rushing fine uh, shall we go for next somebody is disagreeing great what comes into your mind when you look at this or hear agro biodiversity can you please type one two three words one word seven what does it mean by seven okay seven categories let's see who are this livelihood fine this is we are building a cloud word cloud genetic material hotspot fine okay so i will just leave here uh, this is my shortest presentation which i would like you to hear and then i can leave this screen for you thanks thank you dr shridhar uh, for i opening a lecture for management of horticulture uh, database and uh, you have demonstrated how it can be uh, preserved the information in a digital form so that one can easily access and uh, that can be utilized in their bidding programs thank you so much uh, dr shridhar for sparing your valuable time um, now yeah dear uh, participant we are on the penultimate day of the training program this five days online training program on uh, the management and conservation of plant genetic resources for uh, livelihood and uh, nutrition security and uh, thanks for uh, your interest and tomorrow we'll have the final uh, day uh, and uh, final day also we are uh, arranging uh, very good lectures and uh, kindly log on uh, 9:30 and uh, exactly at 9:30 and uh, uh, <clears throat> the validatory session is arranged at 4 pm honorable uh, Dire uh, deputy director general of uh, horticulture science dr ak singh is joining as a chief guest and uh, dr v a parthasarathy who is the former director of uh, indian institute of spices research will be a guest of honor and uh, i request all of you to uh, participate in the validatory function also and uh, there we will be declaring the result of the competition held for the best po poster two best po posters will be awarded uh, with the cash prize and uh, uh, kindly uh, join tomorrow at 9:30 uh, wishing you all the best and uh, good night